Chapter One of the Ordeal of Elizabeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lonnie Small. The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. Chapter One. The Van Vorst homestead stands close to the roadside. A dark, low-built, gloomy old place. The horseshoe on the door testifies to its age and the devout superstition of the Van Vorst who built it. However effectual against witches, the horseshoe cannot be said to have brought much luck otherwise. The Van Vorsts who lived there, a junior branch of the old colonial house, did not prosper in worldly matters, but sank more and more as time went on in general respect and consideration. There was a break in the deterioration, and apparently a revival of old glories, when Peter Van Borst married his cousin, a brilliant beauty from town, who had refused, as tradition asserts, half the eligible men of her day, and accepted Peter for what seemed a sudden and mysterious caprice. The marriage was a nine days' wonder, but whatever the reasons that prompted her strange choice, whether love, indifference, or some feeling more complicated and subtle, Elizabeth Van Vorst made no effort to avert its consequences, but settled down in silence to a life of monotonous poverty. She did not even try, as less favored women have done under harder circumstances, to keep in touch with the world she had given up. She never wrote to her old friends, never recalled herself by her presence in town to her former admirers. As for the homestead, it wore, under the inert indifference of her rule, the same neglected look which had prevailed for years. The foliage grew in rank profusion about the house till it shut out not only the sunlight, but all view of the river. Perhaps Madame Van Vorst, as people called her, disliked the idea of change, or perhaps she grudged the cost of a day's labor to cut the trees, or it might be that she liked the gloom and the feeling of confinement and had no desire to feast her eyes on the river after the fashion of the neighborhood. It reminded her too much, perhaps, of the outside world. She was a stately, handsome old lady, and made an imposing appearance when she came to church on Sunday, in the black silk gown which rustled with an old-time dignity, and her puffs of snow-white hair standing out against the rim of her widow's bonnet. Her daughters, following timidly behind her, seemed to belong to a different sphere, dull, faded women in shabby gowns which the village girls would have disdained. If you spoke to them after church, when the whole neighborhood exchanged greetings and discussed the news of the week, they would answer you shyly, in embarrassed monosyllables. Still, in some intangible way, you felt the innate breeding which lurked behind all the uncouthness of voice and manner. Their life, under their mother's training, had been one long lesson in self-effacement. They never even drove to the village without consulting her, or bought a spool of cotton without her permission. The stress of poverty, as time went on, grew less stringent at the homestead. But with Madame von Vorst, the penury, which had been first the result of necessity, had grown to be second nature. She let the money accumulate and made no change in their manner of life. Her daughters had no books, no teachers, no occupation but housework, no interest beyond the petty gossip of the countryside. With Peter, the son, the downward process was more evident and had taken deeper root. His voice was more uncouth than that of his sisters and his manner less refined. It was hard to distinguish him if you saw him in church from any farmer ill at ease in his Sunday clothes. He spent his days at work on the farm and his evenings, more often than his mother dreamed of, at the bar in the village. Like his sisters, he bowed beneath her iron rod, and lived in mortal fear of her displeasure. Yet he had his plans, well defined, and frequently boasted, at least at the village bar, of what he should do when he became his own master. With the sisters a certain inborn delicacy of feeling prevented them from formulating, even to themselves, the hopes and aspirations which nevertheless lay dormant, needing only a sudden shock to call them into life. When that shock came, and it was known all over the neighborhood that Madame Van Vorst was dead, the news brought a mild sense of loss 
the feeling of a landmark removed, and people hastened at once to the homestead with sincere condolences and offers of assistance to the daughters. Cornelia and Joanna were stunned, but not entirely with sorrow, rather with the sort of feeling that a prisoner might experience, who finds himself, by a sudden blow, released from a chain, which habit has rendered bearable and almost second nature, yet none the less a chain. It was not till the evening after the funeral that this stifled feeling found expression. The day had been fraught with a ghastly excitement that seemed to give, for the moment, to these poor crushed beings a fictitious importance. All the neighborhood had come to the funeral. Some grand relations even had journeyed up from town to do honor to the woman whom they had ignored in her lifetime. These last lingered for a solemn meal at the homestead. The whole affair seemed to bring the Van Vorst women more in contact with the outside world than any event since their father's death many years before. Sitting that evening, talking it over, it might have been some festivity that they were discussing, were it not for their crepe-laden gowns, and the tears they were still shedding half mechanically, though with no conscious insincerity. "'It was kind of the Schuler Van Vorst to come up,' said Cornelia wistfully. "'I thought they had quite forgotten us. They are such fine people, you know. But they were really very kind, quite as if they took an interest.' "'I'm glad the cake was so good,' said the practical Joanna. "'I took special pains with it, for I thought some of them might stay.' "'It went off very nicely,' said Cornelia tearfully. "'Very nicely, indeed. Mrs. Schuler Van Vorst spoke of the cream being so good.' "'She ate a good deal of it, I noticed.' "'One thing I was sorry for,' said Cornelia reluctantly. "'I saw her looking at the furniture.' You know poor Mamma never would have anything done to it. The sisters looked mechanically about the familiar room, whose deficiencies had never been so glaringly apparent. The homestead drawing-room had been refurnished, with strict regard to economy many years ago, after a fashion too antiquated to be beautiful, and too modern to be interesting. The chairs and sofa were covered with horsehair, and decorated at intervals with crochet antimacassars, in the centre of the room stood a marble-topped table, upon which were ranged at stiff angles The Pilgrim's Progress, Paradise Lost, and several books of sermons. There were no other books and no pretty knick-knacks, but some perennially blooming wax-flowers, religiously preserved beneath a glass case, contrasted with the chill marble of the mantelpiece. Above them hung one of the few relics of the past, a hideous sampler worked by a colonial ancestress. The room was much the worse for wear. The wallpaper was dingy, the carpet faded to an indefinite hue. Some of the chairs were notoriously unsafe, and the sofa had lacked one foot for years. "'I think,' said Cornelia, with sudden energy, as if roused at last to the truth of a self-evident proposition, "'I think it's about time that the room was done over.' Joanna attempted no denial but after a moment she remarked tentatively, as if balancing the claims of beauty against those of economy. "'Some pretty sateen, I suppose, for a covering would not cost much.' Cornelia shook her head with melancholy decision. "'It would be quite useless to do anything with the furniture,' she declared, "'if we didn't first change the carpet and the wallpaper.' Joanna was silent in apparent acquiescence and Cornelia, after a moment's hesitation, brought out a still bolder proposition. "'I've been thinking,' she said, "'that we ought to have a piano. Of course I can't—well, we can't either of us play,' she went on in hurried deprecation of Joanna's astonished looks. "'Poor Mamma would never let us take lessons. But people have them whether they play or not, and it would give such a nice musical look to the room.' Joanna sat lost for a moment in awe over this radical suggestion. "'It would be very expensive,' she said practically, "'and there are a great many things we need more.' But the more imaginative Cornelia refused to be daunted. "'What if it is expensive?' she said boldly. "'And if we don't actually need it, that's all the more reason why it would be nice to have it. We've never spent money on a single thing in all our lives except for just what was necessary. Couldn't we for once have something that isn't necessary? 
that would be only pleasant thus cornelia struck the keynote of resistance to that doctrine of utility which had enslaved their lives and joanna after the first shock of surprise followed willingly in her lead it was decided that the piano should be bought at once and in discussing this and other changes time passed rapidly and they went to bed in a state of duly suppressed but undoubted cheerfulness it was altogether quite the pleasantest evening that they had spent for many years though they would not have admitted this for the world and sincerely believed themselves in great affliction there was another being in the house who rejoiced in his freedom and meant to make the most of it as well the next morning at breakfast the sisters might have perceived had they been less engrossed in their own thoughts that peter was meditating some communication which he found hard to express his words when he spoke at last chimed in oddly with his sister's wishes i never he said speaking very deliberately and looking around him in great disgust i never saw a place that needed doing over so badly as this does there was a moment's pause of astonishment and then cornelia looked up in glad surprise why peter she said i had no idea that you would care care said peter importantly of course i care i've always meant to have the place fixed up when well she couldn't live forever you know he broke off half apologetically as he caught the look of mute protest on his sister's faces it did all very well for her and for you he went on coolly but it's not the sort of place i can bring my wife to the last words came out with an air of indifference that might have befitted the most commonplace announcement upon peter's hearers however they fell like a thunderbolt it was several minutes before cornelia repeated in a very low voice your your wife peter yes my wife peter rose and faced his sister squarely hands in his pockets he thrust out his under lip and his florid dutch face wore an expression of mingled defiance exultation and embarrassment why i've been married for some time he said you didn't suppose i was going to stay single all my life did you but who who cornelia's mind moving with unusual rapidity had already passed in review and rejected as improbable all the eligible young women of the neighborhood with none of whom she had ever seen peter exchange two words who can it be peter she concluded lamely is it any one we know chimed in joanna hopefully peter looked them full in the face he had always held his sisters in some contempt you know her well enough he said deliberately or if you don't you ought to she's a young lady who lives near here and her name is malvina jones there was a dead silence the old dutch clock on the mantelpiece which had kept its place undisturbed through the trials and changes of several generations seemed to beat in the stillness loudly and fiercely almost as if it shared the consternation of peter's sisters who stared at him aghast cornelia was the first to speak malvina jones she repeated slowly you don't mean the the girl whose father keeps the bar peter flushed angrily there's only one malvina jones that i know of he declared and she's my wife and will be mistress of this house and if you don't like it you can leave that's all i have to say with this conclusive remark peter betook himself to his usual avocations and his sisters were left to resign themselves to the situation as best they might malvina jones joanna repeated still lost in astonishment one of the village girls said cornelia bitterly a uh, a barkeeper's daughter joanna seemed to hesitate that isn't the worst of it she said at last there are some very nice girls in the village you know but malvina jones is not i'm afraid a very nice girl cornelia was silent she knew enough of the petty gossip of the village to be aware that Joanna was stating the case mildly. Before her mental vision there rose a picture of Malvina, as she had often seen her on Sunday, 
with her glaring red hair, her smart attire, and her look of bold assurance, undisturbed by the disapproving eyes of the congregation. Then she thought of her mother, the stately old dame whom they had been so proud of, even while they feared her. She looked at the breakfast-table, at the quaint, old-fashioned shapes of the glistening silver and the Dutch willow ware, which had been in the family since time immemorial. She thought with affection, even, of the old horsehair furniture, which must surely be preferable to such improvements as Malvina might suggest. And she pictured the barkeeper's daughter, entertaining her friends, in the room where Madame von Vorst had received, with old-world stateliness, the visits of the neighborhood. To poor Cornelia, the family dignity, what little there was left of it, seemed to be crumbling to ashes. "'I don't think we need to bother now about—about the piano,' she said, as the words died away in a sob. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was a June morning twenty years later, and Elizabeth's hands were full of June roses. Look, she said, holding them out. How beautiful! She placed them in a flat china dish and proceeded to arrange them, humming as she did so a gay little tune from some favorite opera of the day. The Mrs. Van Vorst, her aunts, who had been talking rather seriously before the girl entered, broke off their conversation, and brightened as they watched her. There had been times in Elizabeth's childhood when the heart of each sister had been contracted by a secret fear, which they concealed even from one another, when they had offered up in seclusion fervent prayers that certain hereditary characteristics might not be revealed in this treasure, which fortune had unexpectedly bestowed upon them. These prayers had been to all appearance more than answered. Elizabeth did not look like her mother. It was true that the beautiful wavy hair which grew in soft ripples on her forehead showed in the full glare of the sunshine or the firelight a trace, a suspicion, of the deep red, which in her mother's locks had been unpleasantly vivid. But with Elizabeth it was a warm, Titian shade, which would delight an artist. In other respects it was her grandmother whom she resembled, as very old people in the neighborhood would sometimes inform you, wondering to see the beauty and distinction which had perversely skipped one generation, reproduced in this barmaid's daughter. Certainly it was from Madame Van Vorst that the girl inherited the haughty turn of the head and the instinctive pride of carriage. The older woman's beauty may have been more perfect and Elizabeth's features were admittedly far from classical. Her nose tilted slightly, the chin was too square, the red pouting lips were perhaps a trifle too full, but her skin was dazzlingly fresh and fair, and there was a glow of color and wealth of outline about her which disarmed criticism. The eyes under their long lashes were large and lustrous. Like her hair they varied in different lights, or perhaps it was in different moods. They seemed a clear gray when she was thoughtful, blue when she smiled, and they grew in moments of grief or acute emotion singularly deep and dark. But such moments had, at this period of her life, been rare. To her aunts, as they watched her that morning, she was the visible embodiment of all those stifled aspirations to which Peter's marriage had apparently given a fatal blow. They could think now without bitterness of that great humiliation and if they spoke of their brother's wife, it was with due propriety as poor Malvina. They owed her, after all, a debt of gratitude, since she was Elizabeth's mother, who had died most opportunely when Elizabeth was a baby. The girl had been their sole charge from the first, for Peter concerned himself little about his motherless child. His death, when she was still very young, could hardly be considered an unmitigated affliction. As for Elizabeth, it was chiefly remarkable in being the occasion of her first black frock, on the strength of which she gave herself airs toward her less afflicted playmates. Thus the Misses Van Vorst were free to carry out certain cherished plans in regard to their niece's future, which they had formed when hanging over her cradle they had finally traced a resemblance to the grandmother 
after whom she had been named, through some odd remorseful freak of Peter's. Impelled as she grew older by a wistful consciousness of all that they had missed, they heroically resigned themselves to part with her for a while, while she might enjoy the advantages of a very select and extremely expensive school in town. And after five years she returned to them, not overburdened by much abstruse knowledge, but with a graceful carriage, a charming intonation, a considerable stock of accomplishments, and the prettiest gowns of any girl in the neighborhood. Her return was the signal for the changes at the homestead, which now made the old house a cheerful place to live in. The sunlight, no longer excluded by the overgrown foliage, flooded the drawing-room, and from the long French windows opening out on the well-kept lawn you caught a charming glimpse of the river. The fireplace was decorated in white and gold. The polished floor was strewn with rugs. Amid the profusion of modern chairs and tables and bric-a-brac were old heirlooms which had mouldered in the attic for generations, unthought of and despised, till Elizabeth arouted them, and placed them, rather to her aunt's surprise, in a conspicuous position. The walls were hung with fine engravings. Books and magazines were scattered here and there, and across one corner stood the much-coveted piano. The improvement was not confined to the furniture. The Mrs. Van Vorst, too, seemed to have progressed and assumed a more modern air, in harmony with their present surroundings. They were old women now, and people of the present generation placed carefully the prefix Miss before their Christian names. But in many ways they were younger and certainly far happier than they had been twenty years before. It was Elizabeth who had made the change. It was she who had filled their narrow lives with a wonderful new interest, and yet it was on her account that they felt just then the one anxiety which disturbed their satisfaction in the warmth of her youth and beauty, nay, was rather intensified because of it. We were saying, dear, Miss Cornelia could not help observing after a moment, just as you came in, that it is a pity the neighborhood is so dull. There is so little amusement for a young girl. We used to think it quite gay when we were young, said Miss Joanna, her knitting needles clicking cheerfully as she talked. There was always a lawn party at the Van Antwerps, and Mrs. Courtenay was at home every Saturday, and then the fair for the church. But Mrs. Courtenay doesn't stay at home any longer, said Miss Cornelia dejectedly, and the Van Antwerps haven't given a thing for ever so long, and as for the fair, the church has everything it needs now, steeple, font, everything, so there's no object in having a fair. "'And so few people to buy if there were,' sighed Miss Joanna, becoming despondent in her turn. "'I quite miss it. I used to enjoy making things for it. Really, now, if it were not for knitting socks for Mrs. Anderton's new babies, I should be quite at a loss for something to do.' Elizabeth, who had turned and stared from one to the other, as if in surprise at the introduction of a new subject, here broke in with a soft little laugh. "'Well, Auntie, Mrs. Anderton certainly keeps you busy,' she said consolingly. "'And as for the fair, why, I don't know that it would be such a wild dissipation.' Insensibly at the last words her mouth drooped at the corners. The eyes, which an instant before had sparkled with amusement, grew thoughtful. A slight cloud of discontent seemed to drift over the buoyant freshness of her mood. Miss Cornelia observed it, and continued to lament. "'Well, at least a fair would be something,' she insisted. "'And then in old times there used to be dances. "'If you went out to tea oftener, my dear, even that would be a diversion.' The cloud on Elizabeth's face deepened. She bent down with elaborate care to place the last rose in position. "'Oh, I don't know that it matters much,' she said, and there was a sudden hardness in her tone. "'There are no men for a dance, and as for tea-parties, they don't amuse me very much. There are always the Andertons or Johnstons, or both, and they talk about Mrs. Anderton's babies, of Mrs. Johnston's rheumatism, or the way the village girls dress, and the rector asks me to take a class in Sunday school, and looks shocked when I refuse, and—and and it is all stupid and tiresome. I sometimes—' 
sometimes I hate this place and all the people in it. Elizabeth broke off with a sound not unlike a sob. Her aunts were paralyzed. This outburst of revolt was to them an entirely new phase in the girl's development. They did not attempt any response or rebuke, and Elizabeth, after a moment, went over and kissed them each remorsefully. "'There, don't mind me,' she said. "'I'm a horrid, discontented wretch.' Then, as if to put an end to the subject, she added quickly, "'I'm going to drive to Bassett Mills. Is there anything I can do for you?' Her aunts gladly accepted the change of mood. "'It's a lovely morning for a drive, dear,' said Miss Joanna, "'and will do you good. But I wish, if you go, you would stop at the rectory. The baby is ill, so the butcher tells me, and I have some beef tea I'd like you to take.' Elizabeth's smile again lit up her face into its former brilliance. "'What would you do without the butcher, Aunt Joanna?' she asked. "'He's a perfect mine of information. Did he have any other news this morning?' only that he had just come from the Van Antwerps. They are up at last for the summer. "'Are they?' said Elizabeth carelessly. "'Ah, well, they don't make much difference one way or the other.' She seemed to reflect a moment, while again her face clouded. "'If I go to the rectory,' she said abruptly, "'I suppose I must stop and see Aunt Rebecca. She will see me pass, and she's always complaining that I neglect her.' The Mrs. Van Voorst again looked distressed. The aunt of whom Elizabeth spoke, Malvina's sister-in-law, kept a small dry goods shop, much patronized by the neighborhood, and had risen considerably above the original position of the family. Yet the older ladies of the homestead could never be reminded of her existence without a sharp recollection of a painful chapter in the family history. Had they consulted only their wishes, Elizabeth would never have been informed of the connection. They were just women, however, and admitted the claims of Elizabeth's only relation on her mother's side, and one who had a daughter, too, of about the girl's own age. "'Of course, my dear,' Miss Cornelia said at last, reluctantly. "'We wouldn't have you neglect your aunt.' "'No, poor thing,' said Joanna. "'We wouldn't have you hurt her feelings for the world. So perhaps you would better stop there, my dear. And if you do, will you get me some sewing silk from the store?' This proved by no means the only commission with which Elizabeth was burdened when she started, half an hour later. For Miss Joanna had had time to remember several other things she wanted from the store, to say nothing of the beef tea for the rector's wife, and numerous messages of advice and sympathy, which the girl was earnestly charged not to forget. Miss Cornelia had no commissions. She merely asked Elizabeth to remember when she came home, every one whom she had seen— to inquire of the Johnstons if she met them, how their grandmother was, and to notice, if she saw the Van Antwerps, if they had their new carriage, and what Mrs. Bobby had on. At last Elizabeth drove off, in the old-fashioned pony chaise, behind the fat white pony whose age was wrapped in obscurity, and who trod with the leisurely indifference of a well-bred carriage horse, the road which he knew by heart. It was a pleasant, shady road that ran between stone fences, across which you caught the scent of honeysuckle. Beyond were fine places, once the pride of the neighborhood, now for the most part neglected, or turned into pasturage for cows. The trees interlacing formed an arch overhead, through which the sunlight flickered in long, slanting rays. The air was very still, except for the soft hum of bees and a gentle wind that occasionally rustled the foliage and caressed the petals of the wild roses, which grew in careless profusion along the roadside. Here and there, in sheltered nooks, wild violets still lingered, and the fresh green grass of the fields was thickly strewn with buttercups and daisies. But for all this beauty of the early summer, Elizabeth seemed to have no eyes. Her brows were knit and her face clouded, and now and then she gave a vicious pull to the white pony's reins more as a relief to her own feelings than from any hope of hastening the movements of that dignified animal. Her thoughts matched the day as little as her looks. Her mind still reverted with remorse to the outburst of an hour before. Why had she displayed that childish petulance, and given audible expression to the discontent which had smoldered unsuspected for many months? To speak of it was useless, and only distressed her aunts. It was not their fault if the place was dull. 
and then she could, as a rule, amuse herself well enough. There were always drives and walks, the garden and the flowers, her books and her music, a hundred resources in which she found unceasing pleasure. There was even to her warm vitality a delight just then in the mere physical fact of living. And yet the times were growing more frequent day by day, when all this would fail her, when she would long passionately for novelty, for excitement, for something, she hardly knew what. There were desperate moments when it seemed to her that she would welcome any change whatsoever, when she thought that even storm and stress might be preferable to dull monotony. After all, it was not the dullness of the place which lay at the root of her discontent. There was another trouble which went far deeper, of which she never spoke, yet it affected her whole attitude toward the world, and more especially the neighborhood. She did not feel at home in the small, charmed circle of those who knew each other so well, not even with the girls with whom she had played as a child. There had always been a tacit assumption of superiority on their part, which Elizabeth instinctively felt and resented. The most disagreeable episode in her life was a quarrel with one of her playmates, in which the latter had won the last word by an angry taunt against Elizabeth's mother, who was a horrid, common woman whom no one in the neighborhood would speak to. Her mother had said so. Elizabeth, paralyzed, could think of no retort, but walked home in silence, shedding bitter tears of rage and mortification. She did not repeat the remark to her aunts. It was too painful, and she somehow suspected too true. But that night she cried herself to sleep, and had consoling dreams of a time when she would be a great personage, and able to turn the tables on her tormentors. This was a long time ago, but the old wound still rankled, and she held herself proudly aloof from her former playmates. They, on their part, pronounced her hard to get on with, and their mothers made no effort to encourage the intimacy. In the conservative society of the neighborhood, Peter's marriage was still vividly remembered and could not easily be forgiven. Elizabeth was pretty and to all appearance well-bred, but still people thought of her antecedents and maintained towards her an attitude of doubt. It was the perception of this fact, the consciousness of having begun life at a disadvantage, which embittered Elizabeth's thoughts as she drove through the country lanes that June morning. The sun was high in the heavens when she reached Bassett Mills, a nondescript place neither town nor village, and much overshadowed by the glories of Cranston not ten miles away. The mills is not very prosperous, but it has its factory, and the mill-stream dashing precipitously through its midst lends some picturesqueness to the squalid houses on the banks. There was a certain life and movement this morning about the steep high street, down which the white pony took his leisurely way. A stream of factory people passed by to their noonday dinner. The street was full of wagons and carriages from the neighborhood. Elizabeth saw the Van Antwerp dog-cart standing in front of the hardware shop, and caught a smile and bow from Mrs. Bobby, which surprised her by their graciousness. Later on she met the Courtenays, whom she knew better, but who greeted her more coldly. Elizabeth's own bow was stiff, and the cloud which Mrs. Bobby's cordiality had dispelled again darkened her face. She went on to the rectory but here she found that the baby's illness had developed into measles, and she could deposit her beef tea at the door and take her leave with a clear conscience. Outside she stood in the hot sun, debating if she should or should not stop to see her aunt and cousin. It was a long time since she'd been there, and her aunt would be sure to assail her with reproaches. Amanda, too, would feel injured, and look the spiteful things which she never actually said but then Elizabeth could usually rise superior to any spitefulness that Amanda might display. She felt on the whole very kindly toward her cousin. She liked to show her pretty gowns, and her good nature had even stood the test of several bungling attempts on Amanda's part to imitate them. There were moments when, in the dearth of society, Elizabeth would turn with a certain affection to this uncongenial cousin, who at other times jarred upon her greatly. It was the remembrance of Miss Joanna's commissions that on this occasion turned the scale in favor of the intended visit. Elizabeth left the white pony, who would stand an indefinite time, and entered the small dry goods shop, where her aunt or Amanda generally presided. 
it was empty. Elizabeth hesitated a moment. Then she crossed the hall that led to the living rooms of the family. Here she paused in astonishment. From behind the closed door of the parlor came the sound of a man's voice, a rich baritone voice, singing from Tannhauser the song of the evening star. Elizabeth waited till it was over. Then she opened the door and went in. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The young man who had just sung was still at the piano, softly playing variations on the same air. She gave him one hurried glance. He was tall and fair, with blue eyes and a silky blond moustache. He wore a velveteen coat, much the worse for wear and a turned-down collar that showed to advantage the fine outlines of his throat and the graceful poise of his head. These details Elizabeth grasped at once before her gaze wandered to her aunt and Amanda, who were sitting idle as she had never before seen them in the morning, with eyes intent on the young man at the piano. Elizabeth noticed that Amanda had on her Sunday frock and her hair very much frizzed. The girl had entered so softly that the three people already in the room did not at first notice her presence. When they at last did so, it seemed to cause something of a shock. Her aunt and Amanda stared at her in silence, and Amanda turned a trifle pale. The young man rose from the piano and looked at her intently for a moment with his bright blue eyes. Then he reseated himself and went on playing, but much more softly, and as if hardly conscious of what he did. Elizabeth's aunt was the first to recover herself, and upon second thought it occurred to her that her niece had arrived at an opportune moment, when she and Amanda had on their best clothes, and were entertaining company. This reflection tempered with the usual austerity of her greeting. "'Why, Elizabeth, is that you? You're quite a stranger. It isn't often you honour us with your company.' "'You know,' said Elizabeth, quite used to the formula of reproach and excuse with which these visits invariably opened. The white pony has been lame, and I have driven out very little. And you couldn't come on your wheel, I suppose. Nothing short of a carriage would do for you. I wonder you don't insist on a groom and top boots, but, well, never mind, Aunt Rebecca went on, feeling that she had sufficiently maintained her dignity. You're very welcome now, I'm sure, and you're just in time to hear some music. This is Paul Halleck, who has been kind enough to sing for us. Mr. Halleck, this is Amanda's cousin Elizabeth, of whom you've heard us speak. There was an odd note of grudging satisfaction in her voice as she made the introduction. Mrs. Jones's feelings toward her niece was a complex one, characterized on the one hand by an involuntary sense of resentment at the elevation of Malvina's girl, on the other by an equally involuntary pride in the connection. The latter sensation predominated when she introduced Elizabeth to a stranger whom she wished to impress. Elizabeth's chief feeling was one of annoyance, and it brought an angry flush to her cheek. Then she caught the look in the young man's eyes as he rose and bowed with much deference, and her own eyes fell again, and she blushed, but not with anger. "'I have had the pleasure of seeing Miss Van Borst before,' said Paul Halleck, "'though she has not, of course, noticed me.' "'Why, yes, of course,' said Elizabeth's aunt, still in high good humour. "'You've seen her when you were out sketching. "'You see, Elizabeth, he's a painter as well as a singer. "'He's quite a genius altogether. "'We find him a great acquisition to our parties here at the mills. "'And to think that he was born here, and lived here part of his life. "'You remember the Hallocks that went west when you were a child? "'They settled in Chicago, you know. "'He only came to New York a while ago.' and thought he'd look up his folks in this place. But there, Elizabeth, sit down, and perhaps Mr. Halleck will give us another tune. Elizabeth silently took the chair the young man placed for her, while her aunt still talked on volubly. The girl was bewildered by what she heard. She could not imagine this handsome young singer, with his air of picturesque bohemia, as an acquisition to the parties of Bassett Mills. Nor did he seem at home in her aunt's parlor. She glanced about the commonplace, gaudy little room, every detail of which impressed itself upon her with a new sense of its crudeness, 
the plush-covered furniture, staring wallpaper, the lace antimacassars, the photographs of the family, the men in high hats, the women simpering in their Sunday clothes. It did not seem the fit atmosphere for an artist. And then, with a sudden sharp misgiving, Elizabeth looked at Amanda, and asked herself for a moment if she could be the attraction. The doubt vanished instantly. Poor Amanda was not pretty at the best of times, and there was a sullen look on her face just then that made her appear at her worst. She had a dull, pasty skin and very light eyes. All the color seemed to be concentrated in her hair, which was a deep, dark red, all the more striking for the contrast to her pale face. The gown she wore, of a bright yellow, was peculiarly successful in bringing out the faded tints of her complexion and the jarring vividness of her hair. Amanda, at that moment, felt to the full the unkindness of fate. She had not shared for an instant her mother's gratification at Elizabeth's entrance. It was hard, she thought, that having arrayed herself in her best, and struggled long to look beautiful, she should be completely overshadowed by Elizabeth in the cool white gown and shady hat, which had a provoking air of not being her best, but merely her natural and everyday attire. Amanda had seen, as well as Elizabeth, the look in Paul's eyes. Was it fair, she asked herself, that she should share her good things with Elizabeth, who had so many of her own? And so Amanda sat silent and sullen, while her mother talked on, and Halleck ran his fingers over the keys, as if he would fain be playing. "'What shall I sing?' he asked abruptly in the first pause, and looking at Elizabeth as if her wishes alone were of any consequence. "'Oh, the evening star again,' she responded eagerly. "'I only heard the end of it, and it brought up so many delightful memories.' So Halleck sang the song again. A voice artistically modulated filled the little room, which vanished for Elizabeth. She saw pilgrims filing past in slow procession, Tannhauser struggling against the power of the Venusberg, Elizabeth kneeling in her penitent's dress before the cross. The whole Wagnerian drama unrolled itself before her eyes while the song lasted, and then, as the last note died away, she came back to the present with a start and realized that the young man who had just afforded her this pleasure was handsomer far than any Wolfren she had ever seen before. "'Oh, thank you,' she said, drawing a long breath. "'That is so beautiful. It is so long since I have heard any music.' "'You're fond of it,' said Halleck eagerly. "'Oh, yes,' she responded earnestly. "'Ah, I saw it. I was sure of it,' he declared. You have the artistic temperament. I saw it in your face at once. Elizabeth blushed for the third time that morning, and now with a distinct sense of pleasure. Amanda, too, flushed a dull red. She was not quite certain what the artistic temperament might be, but it was clearly one of those good things of which Elizabeth had an unfair monopoly. You play and sing yourself, of course, Halleck went on. Oh, I play a little. Elizabeth pouted out her full underlip in charming deprecation of her own powers. "'I am ashamed before a real musician to say that I play at all.' "'Oh, I am not a real musician, alas,' said Halleck. "'Only a dabbler in music, as I am in art.' A thoughtful look came into his blue eyes, and he went on absently playing fragments from Tannhauser. "'I'm glad you like that,' he said abruptly. "'You remember the heroine was called Elizabeth?' "'Yes,' said Elizabeth. "'I remember.' It gave her an odd little thrill of pleasure to hear him pronounce her name, and yet she wondered if his remark were not too personal to be in good taste. "'But I don't think I am at all like that, Elizabeth,' she added, after a moment, following out his suggestion in spite of this doubt. "'No, perhaps not,' said Halleck, regarding her with a calm scrutiny, in which he seemed to appraise her no longer as a woman— but purely from an artistic point of view. You're not exactly that type. You have more life and color, less spirituality, perhaps, but you're fair, and your hair would do admirably. You would make a beautiful picture with your hair unbound, kneeling before the cross. I have never had a picture painted, Elizabeth murmured, trying to imagine herself in a penitent's garb. Will you let me try it? 
Elizabeth smiled and assented, deciding that no long acquaintance was necessary when it was a question of having her picture painted, in a costume which she was quite determined should be becoming. She sat mentally reviewing the resources of her wardrobe, while Halleck struck sonorous chords on the piano, and asked if she recognized this or that Wagnerian theme, upon which he proceeded to extemporize. Amanda and her mother were distinctly left out, and the latter began to repent of her first satisfaction in her niece's visit. She broke in at last, brusquely, upon the very midst of the love-music from Tristan and Isolde. "'Well, I don't think much of this Wagner,' she said. "'His music all sounds the same, a lot of queer noises with no tune to them. What I like now is Home Sweet Home or Nancy Lee, something real nice and catchy.' "'I can play those, too,' said Halleck, good-humouredly, and immediately played the first-mentioned air, with variations of his own improvisation. At the end of it he rose from the piano. "'Won't you play for me now?' he said to Elizabeth. "'Oh, no! Not after you!' Elizabeth shook her head and rose to her feet with a sudden recollection of the white pony and her aunt's dinner hour. "'Some other day,' she said. I'll be very glad to play for you, but really now I have not the time, oh, or the courage." She spoke with a pretty, smiling deference, and she held out her hand, which he took in a long, lingering grasp. There was a soft glow of color in her cheeks. Her eyes were cast down till he could see only her long lashes. "'Thank you so much,' she said, for the music. Then she drew her hand away from his and kissed her aunt and Amanda with an unwanted display of affection. She felt an odd sense of excitement, a wish to be friendly with all the world. Neither her aunt nor Amanda seemed to share it. They did not try to detain her, and Halleck, though he looked disappointed, said nothing. They all three escorted her to the door of the shop, where the pony stood patiently and during the heat and the flies. Elizabeth lingered over her farewells. She wished to ask her new acquaintance to come and see her, but disliked doing so before her aunt and cousin. It was he who finally said, leaning over her as he placed the reins in her hand, "'And, uh, how about that picture? May I come to see you about it?' Elizabeth's eyes were still hidden as she answered demurely, "'I am sure I—we shall be very glad to see you at the homestead.' And then she drove off and the others stood for a moment and looked after her in silence. "'She—she's pretty, isn't she?' said Amanda, suddenly speaking for the first time since Elizabeth had appeared. Her voice, even to herself, sounded harsh and grating. Her lips were very dry. Halleck started and looked at her as if reminded of her existence. Then a smile stole over his face and sparkled in his handsome blue eyes. "'Yes, she's rather pretty.' he answered carelessly, but a little disappointing on a close view. However, she'll do very well as a model. She's picturesque, at least. Amanda drew a long breath of sudden and intense relief. End of chapter 3 Note to listeners The next section of this book is listed in the original publication as chapter 5. There is no chapter 4. Chapter Five of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Please note that the original publication titles this section Chapter Five, skipping a Chapter Four. And so you say this young man lives at the mills, my dear? Miss Cornelia paused, the heavy, elaborately chased teapot suspended in her hand. Her gentle, near-sighted eyes looked anxiously across the table at Elizabeth. It was the first time that the girl had spoken of her new acquaintance, though it was now some time since her return from Bassett Mills, and she had told at once of the measles at the rectory. This piece of news, however, had lasted them well through dinner, and in the country it is improvident to use up all one's information at once. Perhaps Elizabeth thought of this or it might be that the other item did not strike her as of any special importance. She only mentioned it very casually at tea-time. But her aunt's anxiety was easily aroused at any suggestion of new acquaintances at Bassett Mills. 
I don't think that he lives at the mills, Elizabeth made answer now reluctantly to Miss Cornelia's question. I think he... he's just staying there. I believe Aunt Rebecca said something about his coming from Chicago. But his family used to live at the mills. You don't mean those Hallocks who went west a long time ago, exclaimed Miss Joanna. Do you remember, sister? The man was in jail most of the time. The children used to play on the road behind the church. Poor little neglected things. I was quite worried about them. It was a relief, I remember, when they all went away. Elizabeth found this piece of ancient history peculiarly inopportune. "'Well, that was a long time ago, Aunt Joanna,' she said. "'It doesn't matter, I suppose, so much what people's parents were like. "'Mr. Halleck is very nice himself. "'He's an artist, and he wants to paint my picture.' She brought out this last information, which she had been longing to tell for some time, with a certain triumph, but it fell unexpectedly flat. "'An artist?' Miss Joanna repeated. "'Dear me!' "'One of those little Hallocks who used to play in the road?' "'To paint your picture, my dear?' repeated Miss Cornelia, still more doubtfully. "'And when he has only met you once? "'I'm afraid he's a rather pushing young man. "'But, of course, dear, you won't encourage him.' Elizabeth's eyes were fixed on her plate. Her cheeks were painfully flushed, and she bit her lips to keep back the scalding tears that rose to her eyes. "'I don't think he's pushing,' she murmured but she said no more. How could she explain to her aunts the vast difference that existed between this young man and any other friend of Amanda's? They were dear, good women, but so hopelessly narrow and antiquated, with their little old-fashioned ideas of propriety, their distinctions founded on the conventional laws of the neighborhood. Elizabeth, too, was not without an involuntary respect for these distinctions. She had her full share of pride of birth, which was instinctive in every Van Vorst, even in the most ignorant country lout that had ever borne the family name and lowered the family credit. With Elizabeth it was only intensified, perhaps, by a doubt of her own position. But then she belonged to the new generation, and there was a side of her nature that recognized the futility of these old traditions. Elizabeth did not analyze her feelings. She was only conscious of a vague sense of revolt a desire to beat her wings, as it were, against the cages of conventional distinctions, test her powers of flight. But she did not put all this into words. Her aunts would not have understood. She did not understand herself. She rose from the tea-table presently with a murmured excuse, leaving the food on her plate untasted, to Miss Joanna's great distress, and wandered into the drawing-room and sat down at the piano. The keys seemed to respond with unusual readiness to her touch. The music expressed in some vague way which she could not put into words. She played on restlessly, feverishly, for more than an hour, passing from one thing to another. Chopin nocturnes, waltzes, Hungarian dances, fragments from Wagner, anything she could remember. The drawing-room remained dim for the sake of coolness. It was unlighted except for a lamp at the corner table beside which Miss Joanna sat with her knitting. As Elizabeth played, she nodded comfortably and presently fell asleep. This was always the effect of Elizabeth's playing. She said she found it very soothing. Miss Cornelia sat upright in an old-fashioned high-backed chair close to the piano. She moved her head in time to the music, and the thin little silvery curls that framed in her warm, delicate face seemed to sway in unison with the melody. She wore a black gown, a trifle antiquated in fashion, but falling about her in graceful folds, and some rich old lace softened the outlines of her throat. There was a gentle, tremulous dignity about her nowadays. Miss Cornelia was very happy in moments like these. It was touching to see the pride she took in Elizabeth's music. But after a while this evening, the girl let her hands drop on the keys, and said impatiently, "'Oh, it's no use. I can't say what I want to say.' The music's in me, but it won't come out. If you could have heard that man to-day at Aunt Rebecca's. Do you mean the young Halleck, my dear? said Miss Cornelia in surprise, and pronouncing his name with evident distaste. I didn't know that he played. He can do anything, Elizabeth declared. He paints. He can improvise by the hour. 
He sings as well as any opera singer, and he... he's very handsome. He would make a superb Lohengrin or Tristan, she added thoughtfully, only, unfortunately, his voice is baritone. I wonder why Wagner showed such partiality to tenors. But he's not going on the stage, is he, my dear? asked Miss Cornelia tentatively. She felt more anxiety than pleasure at hearing of this paragon. I don't know, said Elizabeth, and it doesn't much matter. For I'm not to know him, you see, because his people used to live in the village years ago, and Aunt Joanna saw him playing on the road. She spoke bitterly. But, my dear, I, we, we never meant anything of the kind, protested Miss Cornelia, but Elizabeth went on without heeding her. Of course, I know the rules of the neighborhood. They would no more think of knowing a young man from Bassett Mills than they would a convict. But I don't really belong to the neighborhood. I'm only on the outskirts, as it were, tolerated for your sake and for Grandmamma's. I'm tired of being a sort of nondescript, neither flesh, fowl, nor good red herring. The girl's face was hard, but she spoke quietly, in a matter-of-fact tone, as if stating inevitable truths. Miss Cornelia sat mute, bewildered, her whole soul wrung by a powerless resentment against fate. If by any sacrifice on her part she could have provided for Elizabeth congenial society, the charming young girls and attractive young men of whom she and her sister had often dreamed, she would have made it thankfully. But with all her love there was nothing, or there seemed to her, nothing that she could do. They had given Elizabeth every advantage. She was beautiful and charming, and the result of it all was that she felt herself to be a sort of nondescript, neither flesh fowl nor good red herring. It was a very bitter thought for Miss Cornelia. Elizabeth, seeing this, felt remorseful for the second time that day. "'Don't look so unhappy, Auntie,' she said quickly. "'It's not your fault, no, nor mine either.' and I suppose it's not the fault of the neighborhood. People can't help being narrow and conservative. They were born so. But then, Aunt Cornelia, when, when I don't have so many friends, you can't expect me to draw the line so awfully closely. Something like a sob crept into the girl's voice, but she went on with hardly a pause. You mustn't think that I would want to know any one. This man isn't like the rest of Amanda's friends. Only wait till you hear him sing. You would lose your heart. I'm sure you would, right on the spot. And now confess, Auntie, you would like me to have my picture painted. The girls at school used to say that I would make a glorious picture. Do you think I would make a pretty picture, Auntie? She went over to Miss Cornelia and put her arms around her, looking up into her face with laughing, brilliant eyes, from which all the bitterness had disappeared. My darling! Miss Cornelia, bewildered by the quick change of mood, could not find any more words. She thought that Elizabeth would make the prettiest picture in the world, but to have told her so would have been to run counter to all her ideas of propriety. So she finally said, with due regard for accepted formulas, "'You shouldn't think so much about looks, Elizabeth. If you are good, that's the main thing.' "'Of course it's the main thing,' Elizabeth assented. "'But I'm afraid if it came to a choice—' I'd rather be pretty, Auntie, and so would most people. She ended with a light little laugh, and Miss Cornelia, in spite of her principles, attempted no rebuke. The look of gaiety soon faded from Elizabeth's face. With a quick, impatient little sigh, she walked over to the window and looked out into the night. It was still and sultry. Heavy storm clouds were gathering and obscured the sky. The old elm trees, growing close about the house, cast somber shadows. They seemed to keep out what little air there was. Elizabeth, as she leaned her hot cheeks against the cool glass of the window-pane, felt again a sense of stifling, of being in a cage. It was useless to beat her wings. Life was outside, but she could not reach it. Oh, I would give anything in the world, she thought, just to breathe, to be free, to know what life is. Suddenly she turned around with a start. There was a voice in the hall. Someone spoke her name. A moment later a young man was advancing toward her across the dimly lighted room. Mechanically she went to meet him. She did not think of her aunts. She did not think of anything 
but his presence. "'Have I come too soon?' Paul Halleck asked as he took her hand. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth drove again a few weeks later through shady, fragrant lanes on her way to Bassett Mills. It was early in the morning, but the sun was already hot. Wild roses along the roadside had mostly departed. The grass in the fields had a parched look. It was a long time since any rain had fallen and the roads were thick with dust. All the freshness of the early summer had faded, but for these signs of premature blight and the scorching effect of the sun, Elizabeth seemed to have no eyes. She drove along in a happy dream. There was a brilliant color in her cheeks, a radiant light in her eyes. She bloomed like a rose that had unfolded every petal to the summer sunshine. The fields through which she passed were not the familiar pasture-lands and places that skirted the road to Bassett Mills. They were the flowery meadows of poetic Arcadia on the road that led to Paradise. It was something of a bore under the circumstances that she must first of all go to Bassett Mills, but Miss Joanna had entrusted her with numerous commissions that she could not very well refuse to discharge. That was the reason why she had started so early. There was a brook in a meadow nearby, a brook shaded by weeping willow trees, under which nowadays a young artist sat sketching for many hours at a time. Elizabeth's drives or walks had for the last few weeks led no further, but today she had decided to go first to Bassett Mills and be back in time for the usual engagement, of which her aunts knew nothing. The affair was not really so clandestine. There was no reason why she should have kept it a secret, beyond a vague embarrassment, an unwillingness to speak about the one subject that occupied her thoughts. Miss Cornelia and Miss Joanna had, after the one protest, yielded to the inevitable. They had not even discouraged young Halleck's visits to their niece. They had gone so far as to admit, when he had come to tea at the homestead, and sung and played for them afterward for hours, that he was an extremely talented young man. It had been a most successful evening. Miss Joanna had not even gone to sleep, and yet, with it all, in both sisters there was some innate distrust, some lingering prejudice, perhaps, that prevented them from succumbing entirely to the charm of his handsome face and beautiful voice. They were civil to him, painfully civil, but they did not welcome him as they would have welcomed young Frank Courtenay, who used to stare at Elizabeth in church every Sunday but had never apparently mustered up courage to come and see her. He was much under the influence of his mother, who considered Elizabeth's hair conspicuous, and had remarked that it was bad taste for a young girl to be too well dressed, a fault that could not in justice be alleged against her own daughters. Elizabeth, too, might have welcomed the visits of young Courtenay. There had been times when she had doubted, sadly, if she was really so pretty as the girls at school had seemed to think. But these times were past, and she had not a thought to spare for Frank Courtenay's heavy, commonplace good looks. Paul Halleck had assured her many times that she was beautiful, and had sketched her in every variety of pose, in that impressionistic style which Elizabeth had secretly thought rather ugly, before she learned to regard it as the last word in art. Elizabeth had learned many other things in the last few weeks. Halleck undertook her education in all artistic and literary matters, showing her how little she had hitherto known of this or that great light. He quoted Swinburne and Rossetti. He read her extracts from Maeterlinck and Ibsen. He opened for her the treasures of that school which Nordahl calls degenerate. He had all the intellectual and artistic jargon of the day at his tongue's end. She sat at his feet and devoutly learned it all. She knew his history now. It was very romantic, and it lost nothing in the telling. He had a keen eye for artistic effect, and spared not one sordid detail of his early surroundings, which served to throw into more brilliant relief his subsequent career. He told how the possession of a lovely childish soprano had raised him literally from the gutter, and procured him a position as a boy soloist in a Chicago church, and how later on a patron was found who sent him abroad to study 
He had wandered from one European centre to another, learned to play in Dresden, and to paint in Paris, and developed a fine baritone voice, of which great things were prophesied. In fact, he was a universal genius, and could do anything, except apparently earn a living, which indeed has always been hard for genius. And so at last he drifted back to Chicago, where he sang for a while in the same church where he had begun his career, but finally left for some reason or another, and tried his fortune in New York. He was debating now whether to go abroad again to study in earnest for the stage, and meanwhile he was on a walking tour, sketching about the country. He had come to Bassett Mills for the sake of old associations, and had stayed. Well, he left it to Elizabeth to imagine why he stayed. All this was very interesting and romantic. Far more so, Elizabeth thought, than any ordinary affair could have been with some commonplace youth of the neighborhood. She had only one regret. She could not help wishing in her heart that Paul's early surroundings had been, if not more exalted, less familiar. She would have preferred him to have no associations with, and no friends at, Bassett Mills. The place seemed to her, as she drove through it that morning, so hopelessly common, so unusually prosaic. The ugly, sordid houses, the people with their faces of dull stolidity, jarred upon the ecstatic tone of her mood. She could not imagine that genius could be born in such surroundings. The discordant note was still more striking when, having discharged the greater part of her commissions, she entered the dry-goods shop and found Aunt Rebecca in her most trying humor. "'So that's you, Elizabeth,' she said, looking her niece severely up and down while her thin lips moved at the corners. "'Seems to me you're very dressed up, driving round these dusty roads. The way you wear white is a caution. But I suppose for a millionaire like you it don't matter about the washing.' Elizabeth bit her lip. "'I'm not a millionaire, you know, Aunt Rebecca,' she said. "'But I like to wear white, and it's as cheap as anything in the end. Is Amanda in?' she added quickly, anxious to stave off further criticism. "'I'll go back and see her if she is.' "'She's in the parlor,' said Amanda's mother shortly. "'She's got a headache. I guess she don't feel like seeing company,' she added hastily. But the words came too late. Elizabeth had already left the shop and was crossing the narrow, dark little hall that led to the parlor. Her heart beat rapidly as she did so. She felt an odd, utterly irrational desire to feast her eyes on the spot where she had first experienced such new and delightful sensations. There was no music in the room now no air of festivity. The atmosphere was close and musty. The sun poured in at the window beside which Amanda sat sewing. She bent closely over her work. Her skin was more pasty than ever, and her eyes were red and swollen. Elizabeth remembered her aunt's words about the headache. Otherwise she might have thought that her cousin had been crying. She went over and kissed her with a friendliness born of her own superabundant joy. The lips she touched were dry and hot. Amanda did not respond to the caress. She stared stupidly at Elizabeth, as if dazed by her sudden entrance. "'How are you, Amanda?' Elizabeth said. "'I'm sorry you have a headache. Perhaps it's the heat. It's a terribly hot day, and the roads are so dusty. Aunt Rebecca implied that my dress showed that very plainly. It was clean this morning. Does it really look so badly?' She walked over to the mirror and inspected herself critically setting her hat straight and adjusting the white ribbon about her throat. It was a long, narrow glass, framed in black walnut, and there was a shelf underneath it which supported a large seashell. The whole thing reminded her of a similar arrangement at her dressmaker's in town, and seemed in some way the crowning feature of the prosaic, painfully respectable character of the room. She hated to look at herself there. The glass brought out all one's defects. But to-day, in spite of the trying glare of the sunshine, her own image flashed back at her, so brilliantly fresh, in her white diminity gown, so redolent of health and beauty, that she could not help smiling back at it, as at some delightful apparition. Ah, yes, it was good to be young and pretty, and to have a lover waiting for one nearby. Her eyes brightened unconsciously, and she gave a little caressing touch to the shining masses of wavy hair, which stood out like red molten gold against the broad brim of her shady white hat. The other girl sat and watched her. "'You like to look at yourself, don't you?' The words rang out harshly and suddenly, 
Elizabeth started and turned around. It seemed to her for a moment as if some third person had spoken, someone with a strange, mocking voice that she had never heard before. But there was no one else in the room. "'Yes, you like to look at yourself,' Amanda went on after a pause more quietly. "'You think yourself a beauty, and a good many people perhaps might agree with you. He tells you so, I suppose. I dare say he tells you your hair is picturesque. He used to tell me that about mine. He was going to paint my picture, but it went right out of his head when he saw you. Most things did, I guess. He—he he hasn't been here since." The girl's voice broke off in a quick convulsive sob, and she stopped for a moment, but went on almost immediately. "'If you hadn't come in that day, it would have been all right. We were keeping company. Every one in the mills knew we were. All the girls were jealous of me, as if he'd have looked at them. Some of them work in the factory. There's many of them don't even have a piano, and sit in their kitchens. I know what's genteel, even if I can't talk all that rubbish about music and Wagner that you learned at school. And what good will all that do when you're married? What do you know about mending and sewing and cooking? What sort of wife would you make him? You'd ruin him in a month with your fine clothes, but men are such fools!" She gave a short, mirthless laugh. Her eyes glittered strangely. Elizabeth stared at her, paralyzed, glued to the spot in helpless fascination. She had never heard Amanda talk so much before. Her words came quickly, fiercely, one upon the other, like some overwhelming torrent that had been suddenly let loose. "'Why should you have so much more than me? Why should you have fine clothes and a carriage, and go to school in New York, and have the swells in the neighborhood call on you? Was your mother any better than mine, or even a hundredth part as good? She wasn't even respectable.' No decent people at the mills would speak to her before your father married her. I know that for a fact. And then to give yourself airs!" Amanda stopped short, panting, exhausted by her own vehemence. Elizabeth stood still before her, powerless. When Amanda spoke of her mother the color rushed into her white face, and she made an effort to speak, but the words seemed to die away on her lips. Amanda, after a moment's pause, went on. It isn't that I care so much about that. You might have everything else if you hadn't taken him. Why did you come in that day looking like a dressed-up doll? You hadn't been here for weeks, and I was so glad. I didn't want him to know you. I wasn't afraid of the other girls, but you, who've got so much. Couldn't you have had the decency to leave him alone? Couldn't you see that he was mine? Amanda! Elizabeth gasped out. I, I didn't know. I never thought. Her brain reeled. She stammered painfully, trying in vain for words to vindicate herself from this shameful charge. Amanda brushed her aside contemptuously. You didn't think? No, you never do, of anything but yourself. Your pretty face and pretty clothes. You're selfish and spoiled, and everyone knows it. You've had every wish granted till you want everything, and you won't be satisfied with less. But what's the good of saying all this to you?" She broke off suddenly with a sharp change of tone. I must be crazy. I felt so, I'm sure, these last weeks. It won't make any difference. Nothing I can say will bring him back. And yet he'd have married me if you hadn't come. She went to Elizabeth and gripped her by the wrist. He kissed me once, she said. Has he kissed you yet?" No, said Elizabeth mechanically. No! She shrank away a little and set her teeth. Amanda's grasp was painful, but she would not have cried out for the world. Well, when he does, Amanda said, you remember this. He kissed me first. You can't take that away from me. I have the first claim. She let go of Elizabeth's hands and fell back a step. There were two deep red marks from her grasp. "'Now go,' she said. "'Go to him. I know you were going to him. I saw you thinking of it, and it made me hate you. Go to him and tell him that I hope his love for you will last as long as it did for me.' She laughed again harshly, and then suddenly burst into violent weeping. "'Oh, it's ignominious,' she said. "'It's contemptible.' 
No one can despise me more than I do myself. I haven't any pride. I hate him. I hate him. Yet I'd take him back now if he'd come to me. She sank down on the sofa and hid her face in the red plush cushions, while her whole frame shook with convulsive sobs. Elizabeth stood still in the middle of the floor. Mechanically she glanced at her reflection in the mirror, white, distraught, with startled eyes, a ghastly parody of the brilliant vision which had smiled back at her only a few minutes before. The hot sunlight flooding the commonplace little room seemed to bring out with glaring vividness all the tragic, sordid elements of the scene. A quarrel between two women about a lover? Could anything be more hopelessly vulgar and grotesque? It was the sting of this thought that finally roused Elizabeth to speech. She raised her head with sudden haughtiness, and her words came out clearly and fluently. "'I don't know what you mean by this scene, Amanda,' she said. "'If there is any one whom you—you you think I've taken from you, you can have him back to-morrow, so far as I'm concerned. I don't want any other woman's lover. It—it it would be base. Whatever else you think of me, I'm not that. If it is Paul Halleck whom you mean, you can marry him, if you wish, to-morrow. At least you may be sure of one thing, that I never will." Her low, vehement voice died away, and she waited for an answer. But none came. Amanda only sobbed on hysterically, her face buried in the sofa cushions. Elizabeth stood looking at her for a moment, with a feeling in which pity, anger, and repulsion were strangely mingled. Then she hastily left the room by the door that led directly to the street. She had presence of mind enough to avoid the shop and her aunt's unfriendly eyes. She reached the carriage, and, unheard of thing, touched the white pony with the whip. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. They had left the last house behind. They were out in the open country. Elizabeth dropped the reins and let her tears flow unchecked. Hot, blinding tears, the bitterest she had ever shed. At each familiar tree and landmark she sobbed with redoubled violence. Only an hour before she had driven along the same road in the ecstatic glow of her first romance. Now all the bloom had been rubbed from that romance, all the glory faded from the hero of her dreams. She herself was a woman who had been insulted, humiliated, dragged in the dust. By degrees a few coherent phrases detached themselves from the confused mass of painful recollections, and stung more sharply than the rest my mother better than yours. She wasn't even respectable. No decent people would speak to her. Oh, it was too bad, too bad. She had not thought it was so bad as that. Amanda must have exaggerated. She would ask her aunts. But no, no, she would never speak of that interview to a soul. It was humiliating enough as it was. He kissed me once. Has he kissed you yet? No, thank heaven! That indignity had been spared her. They had hovered as yet on the borderland of love. She had put off the inevitable declaration with instinctive coquetry, a vague unwillingness to be won too easily. She was glad now, glad and thankful. He did not know that she cared. He should never know. She had no love for the man who had kissed Amanda. Selfish and spoiled, thinking only of herself? Yes, she might be all that, but at least she would not take another woman's lover. The words, it would be base, rang in her ears. Had she spoken them, or Amanda? At all events, they were true. It would be base to marry Halleck now. In fact, she did not wish to marry him. It was he who had involved her in this horrible, sordid misery. Her aunts were right. There must be distinctions of classes. Had her father remembered this, people would not have it in their power to insult his daughter now. Through all her complex feelings ran a sharp sense of anger against Amanda, mingled strangely with an involuntary pity 
almost with an understanding of her point of view. It was not based on justice, but on fellow-feeling. Amanda had resented her superiority. She, Elizabeth, knew what that was. She had felt the same herself, when smarting impotently under the patronizing friendliness of the other girls in the neighborhood, and then had turned with unconscious snobbery to play the same part towards Amanda. The incongruous, grotesque humor of the situation struck her suddenly, and she laughed out loud in bitter irony. She had envied the other girls of the neighborhood. Amanda had envied her. The girls at Bassett Mills had envied Amanda. Strange network of classes in a democratic country, of distinctions the more galling for their intangibility. Of one thing Elizabeth was convinced, that she could never herself put on airs, as Amanda had said, again. There was not a girl in the whole countryside, blessed with a good mother, who could not look down on her if she pleased. Her tears were falling now so fast and blinding that she could not see the road. She was not even conscious that they had reached the spot where the white pony stopped now of his own accord. And even as he did so, a young man stepped forward and grasped the reins which had fallen from Elizabeth's nerveless hand. A tall, fair young man, who had been standing for the last half-hour, scanning anxiously with his bright blue eyes the glaring, dusty road. "'Elizabeth,' said Halleck. He had called her that for five happy days. "'Elizabeth, why are you so late? And for heaven's sakes, what's the matter?' Elizabeth looked up and with great effort stopped crying, but otherwise she made no sign of pleasure in his presence, or even of recognition." She put up one hand, indeed, and straightened her hat, but this was a purely mechanical concession to the force of habit. She knew that her face was flushed and tear-stained, her eyes red and swollen. She was sure that she looked an absolute fright, and she did not care. She was past caring, at least for the moment. "'Elizabeth,' Halleck repeated, more and more bewildered, "'what is the matter? I've been waiting for you an hour.' "'You've been crying,' he added, stating unnecessarily an obvious fact. "'Won't you tell me what it is?' "'Nothing, nothing,' Elizabeth answered at last, in a voice that was still thick and choked with sobs. "'I haven't been crying.' Struck by the futility of denial, she added hastily, "'If I have it, it's no matter. Will you please let me pass?' She tried to take the reins from his hands, but he grasped them firmly and laid the other hand on the bar of the wagon. "'Won't you let me pass?' she repeated stubbornly. "'Not till you tell me what's the matter.' He eyed her coolly, determinedly, all the habit of power depicted on the lines of his handsome face. She stared back at him defiantly, with her tear-swollen eyes. Her whole attitude breathed the spirit of rebellion, the spirit knew in their intercourse. Halleck saw it at the same time that he noted the disfiguring marks of tears on her face. Oddly enough, he had never admired her so much. Nevertheless, he was determined to remain master of the situation. He glanced up and down the road. There were never many people passing, but it was not safe to rely on this fact. "'We can't talk here,' he said. "'Come into the field.' "'I don't wish to,' she said stubbornly. "'I'm going home.' He fixed his eyes upon her. "'You shall not go home,' he said quietly, "'till you have told me all about it.' She sat immovable, her pouting under lip thrust out in a way that she had sometimes, in moments of obstinacy and displeasure. She did not meet his eyes. "'Don't be childish,' Paul said pleasantly after a moment. "'You know you must tell me what it is.' She looked up reluctantly and met his steady gaze under which she turned first white, then red, and slowly, as if fascinated, rose from her seat. Yet still her words were unyielding. "'We may as well have it out at once,' she said coldly. Hallett could not repress a thrill of triumph. It was sweet to test his power over this beautiful, high-spirited girl, to feel her will, her intellect like wax in his hands. But he tried not to show this consciousness in his face. She was in a strange mood. He did not understand her. 
Gravely and respectfully he helped her to scale the stone wall which separated the meadow from the road. Her hand barely rested on his, and her eyes were averted carefully. But he paid no heed. He fastened the white pony to a tree, then slowly and thoughtfully followed Elizabeth across the field. The noonday sun beat down upon them in all its scorching brilliancy. It was pleasant to gain the shade of their usual trysting place. Here the little brook, which had rippled and sparkled over stones and moss all the way from the mill stream, formed itself into a quiet pool, over which weeping willows spread out long branches, and seemed to admire their own reflection in the cool green mirror beneath. Elizabeth took her usual seat on a fallen, moss-covered log, drawing as she did so her white skirts about her, with what seemed an involuntary gesture of repulsion, and Halleck, who was about to place himself beside her, flushed and bit his lip. After a moment's hesitation, he threw himself down sullenly on the grass a little way off. "'Tell me,' he said in a tone that was the more determined for this little episode, "'tell me now what the matter is.' Elizabeth's eyes were fixed upon the cool green water at her feet. "'I don't know why you think,' she said slowly, "'that it has anything to do with you.' "'Not when you are a full hour late for our appointment? "'Not when you treat me like an outcast? "'Oh, Elizabeth,' the young man's voice softened suddenly, skillfully, "'how can you trifle with me? "'I love you so.' "'He caught, or thought he did, a quiver in her face, "'although her eyes were still resolutely bent upon the pool. "'Yes, I love you,' he repeated. "'I've loved you, I believe, ever since the day you came into that horrid, stuffy little room, looking like an angel, with that hair and that skin, so different from Amanda.' He stopped as an indignant wave of color flamed in Elizabeth's cheeks. "'How can you speak of Amanda like that?' she broke out passionately. "'When you loved her, too, or told her so, at least.' when you said the same things, no doubt, to her that you are saying now to me?" A light broke in upon Paul. In his relief he laughed out loud. "'Amanda,' he said, "'Amanda! So she's been talking to you. And you believed all the nonsense she told you? And that's why you acted so strangely? Oh, I thought it was something serious!' And he laughed again in sheer light-heartedness. So all this had been only jealous pique, after all. The gloom on Elizabeth's face did not lighten. "'You seem to find the idea amusing,' she said coldly. "'I do not.' "'Because you don't understand how absurd it is. I never made love to Amanda. If she made love to me—' Paul stopped, warned by a curious stiffening in Elizabeth's attitude that he was on dangerous ground. She was not like other girls whom he had known. He had noticed this before. She required special treatment. "'My dear child,' he said in a calm, argumentative tone, "'really, you are a little hard on me. A man can't measure every word he says to a girl. I may have paid Amanda a few compliments, flirted with her a little, if you insist upon it, but that's not a crime, is it? And I never gave her a thought. I hardly remembered her existence after I had once seen you.' There was unmistakable sincerity in his voice. "'Look at me, Elizabeth,' he went on anxiously. "'Look at me, and tell me that you believe me.' Elizabeth raised her troubled eyes to his. "'I—I I don't know,' she said slowly. She did believe him, to some extent at least. But what he told her did not alter the fact that it was she who had taken him away from Amanda, that but for her he might have been her cousin's admirer still and that, after all, had been the substance of Amanda's accusation. "'Tell me the truth,' she said suddenly. "'If I had not come in that day, if you had never seen me, would you—would you have married Amanda?' She fixed her eager eyes upon his face, and waited breathless for his answer. He gave it with a light laugh. "'Marry Amanda?' he declared. "'Well, hardly. Such an idea never entered my head.' Then, said Elizabeth slowly, you deceived her. He shrugged his shoulders. She deceived herself, I think, he said. It's not my fault if she imagined things. 
Why should I marry a girl like that? She's not pretty. She's stupid. Ignorant. Bah! Don't talk to me of Amanda. He disposed of the matter with a wave of the hand and another light laugh. Elizabeth felt a sudden conviction of the absurdity of her own behavior. The painful, scorching flush in her cheeks was beginning to cool. The burning, angry shame in her heart was dying away. The remembrance of Amanda's words grew fainter. Paul's handsome face, his air of triumphant health and life, were again in the ascendant. He saw the yielding in her eyes, and brought out his most effective argument. He took boldly the seat beside her on the log, and though she shrank away, it was not, he thought, entirely with aversion. "'My darling,' he said, "'don't let trifles come between us. I love you. You love me. Isn't that enough? Elizabeth, you are the most beautiful woman in the world. Elizabeth, dearest,' he put out his arm and drew her towards him. She still shrank away, fascinated yet trembling, frightened at this new delight, this thrill of pleasure in his touch. "'Don't!' she gasped out. "'Amanda!' He stopped her protest with a kiss. And it was not till later, when she reached home, that she thought again of Amanda's words. "'Remember, he kissed me first. End of chapter 7《チャプター8》《ディオ・エリザベス》《アナニマス》《ミス・コルニアとジョアナは座っていたご飯を食べていました》《エリザベスは彼らに知らなかったことを知っていました》《エリザベスは彼らに知らなかったことを知っていました》《エリザベスは彼らに知らなかったことを知っていました》《エリザベスは彼らに知らなかった Miss Cornelia was reminded forcibly, painfully, of a morning in that same room many years ago when Peter had announced his marriage. Now the shock was not so great, was not unexpected, perhaps, but it brought with it, if less horror, an even greater disappointment. Well, Elizabeth said after a moment, when her important announcement had produced no response, and she looked proudly, yet half wistfully, from one to the other. Well, she repeated, have you nothing to say? Can't you con congratulate me? Her voice faltered over the last words. My dear, Miss Cornelia tried bravely to respond to the appeal in the girl's tone. Of course we, we wish you every happiness, she stammered out. She stopped for tears choked her voice. She looked despairingly at her sister. Was this the moment that they had so often talked of together, planning with delicious thrills of pleasure all they would say and do? This china must be Elizabeth's when, when she marries, you know. We must lay by a little for, for Elizabeth's trousseau. This, in demure whispers to each other, for they would not for the world have suggested such a possibility to the girl herself. Nice girls, of course, must not think of getting married till the time came, but— With Elizabeth's beauty, that time could not be long delayed, not even in the neighborhood. The fairy prince would appear some day. Though he had never come to them, they believed devoutly that he would come to Elizabeth. And now, and now the fairy prince had come, or Elizabeth thought so. But they were only conscious of an overwhelming sense of doubt. You know so little about him, my dear. Miss Cornelia could not help at last protesting. Elizabeth opened her eyes wide in genuine surprise. So little of him? she repeated. Why, I. I know everything, Aunt Cornelia. And she smiled to herself in silent amusement. Had she not seen him every day, and twice a day for a matter of four weeks? How long did they think, these older women, that it took to know a man? I know that he loves me. She said after a moment, descending to further particulars, and I love him, and that's enough. But you can't live on love, urged Miss Joanna practically. You must have some money, you know, and I shouldn't think he, poor young man, had anything, at least judging by his clothes. Those artists never have, they say, and meat and everything indeed never was so dear as it is now. 
"'I didn't know you were so worldly, Aunt Joanna,' said Elizabeth loftily. "'Do you want me to marry for money?' Miss Joanna was crushed. But, as she reflected in her own justification, one had to have something to eat. Let lovers say what they would." "'My dear,' said Miss Cornelia, coming to the rescue with a little air of dignity that she could sometimes assume, "'we certainly wouldn't want you, not for the world to marry for money, but one has to be, to be prudent. We have brought you up in a way, perhaps it was unwise, poor mother would have thought so, but at any rate you know nothing about economy, and you have only a little money, my dear, and he, I suppose, has nothing.' He, he expects to make a great deal of money soon, faltered Elizabeth, coming down a little from her heights of romance. All this prudence was like a dash of cold water in the face. She felt disconcerted, indignant, and yet conscious, through it all, of some reason in her aunt's objections. Yes, it was true. She had not been brought up to economy. She was fond of luxury and pretty things. In all her wishes for change, she had never thought that it would be amusing to miss any of these. Miss Cornelia saw that she had produced some effect. I think, she went on, still speaking with unusual decision, that the most important thing is to find out something about him. You can't marry a man whom we know nothing about, except that he was born at the mills. We must investigate his character. Miss Cornelia felt, as she brought out this last sentence, that it sounded eminently practical and it received from Miss Joanna, indeed, its full meed of respectful admiration. Elizabeth only smiled superior. "'You can investigate as much as you like, Aunt Cornelia,' she said. "'I know all about him.' And so the matter rested. But how could two elderly and innocent spinsters, who had never in their lives stirred two hundred miles from home, investigate the character of a young man who had lived in Chicago and Paris and Vienna, and all the four quarters of the world, apparently. They had no idea how to set about it. In this perplexity Miss Cornelia again rose to the occasion, and suggested that the rector might be a fit substitute for that invaluable possession, a man in the family, who was always supposed to accomplish so much. And the rector, when consulted, proved unexpectedly resourceful. He had made Paul's acquaintance, and learned the name of the church in Chicago where he had sung for so many years. He had discovered, too, that the rector of this church was an old college friend of his, and he wrote to him at once, requesting full and confidential information as to the young man's character, antecedents, and prospects. The answer seemed to the poor ladies a long time in coming. As a matter of fact, it arrived very promptly. The rector of St. Anne's at Chicago regretted to inform his old friend and colleague, the rector of St. Mary's at Bassett Mills, that he had no good account to give of Paul Halleck, who had not long ago been dismissed from the choir of his church, and had left behind him in Chicago many debts and a bad reputation. The young man was believed to have, as the rector added, genuine musical talent, but like many artists and musicians, he was morally irresponsible, dissipated, and reckless. The rector of St. Mary's repeated the verdict as gently as he could to the older ladies at the homestead. They bore it better than he expected. There were compensations indeed in the very extent of its severity. Had Halleck been less evidently and irredeemably a black sheep, there might have been some doubts as to their own duty. But as it was, they felt that they must break off the dreadful match at once, and at any cost. Yet the heart of each sister misgave her as they sat in a solemn conclave, and summoned Elizabeth before it. She came rosy, bright-eyed, fresh from talks with her lover, and happy dreams of a brilliant future which they were to share together. She stood listening in apparent indifference, while Miss Cornelia faltered out the painful result of their inquiries and when the worst was told, she had turned perhaps a trifle pale, but otherwise she seemed unmoved. "'I don't know why you tell me all this, Auntie,' she said slowly. "'I—I I am sorry to hear it, but it can make no difference.' "'No difference?' Miss Cornelia repeated, stupefied. "'No difference, Elizabeth?' 
No, it can't change my love for him, she said defiantly. He told me that he has enemies at Chicago, and that you would probably unearth a lot of old scandals, and I promised that it should make no difference. Perhaps some of them are true. I don't care, Auntie. I can't. I can't give him up, she went on with a sudden change of tone and clasping her hands appealingly. I tried to once before, and I, I couldn't. If he were to go away now and leave me, I should die. I couldn't bear to go on living without him. The girl's face was flushed, her voice tremulous with feeling. It was evident that she fully meant, or thought she meant, what she said. Her aunts looked at her in helpless perplexity. "'My darling,' Miss Cornelia faltered out at last, "'think how much better it is to give him up now than to marry him and be unhappy. You don't know. Men are very bad. One reads such things in the newspapers. If he were to ill-treat you, desert you—' "'Ah, but he won't,' said Elizabeth, smiling incredulously. "'You needn't worry, Aunt Cornelia. We shall be very happy. But even if we were not,' she concluded with a sudden burst of defiance, "'if I thought that he would beat me, treat me like a dog, I don't care. I should marry him to-morrow.' And she thrust out her full under lip, and stood facing them, with a look of obstinacy on her fair, girlish face, that for the moment bore a strong resemblance to her father. To Miss Cornelia's mind there rose again, with startling vividness, the events of twenty years before. The recollection seemed to endow her with an unwanted and unnatural strength. She went over to where Elizabeth stood, and took both the girl's hot hands in hers. "'Elizabeth,' she said desperately, "'you don't know what you're saying. You will be miserable if you marry that man. You don't know what it is to live with a person who is beneath you, who—who who drags you down. We know, my darling, we've seen it. Be warned by us, and give him up." Miss Cornelia had never in all her gentle life spoken with so much vehemence. Elizabeth, in her astonishment, stood for a moment absolutely passive. She stole a glance at Miss Joanna. She was weeping quietly. Elizabeth's own face worked, her lip quivered. "'I know whom you mean,' she broke out suddenly in a quick, hard voice. "'You're thinking of my mother.' and then, in the dismayed pause that followed, she dragged her hands away from Miss Cornelia's grasp, and fled from the room. The two older women looked at one another in silence. "'I didn't know,' Miss Joanna said at last in a low, awestruck tone, "'that the child knew anything about—about about poor Malvina.'" End of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And so you let all this nonsense influence you? Halleck asked this bitterly, staring up with moody eyes into Elizabeth's face. They were sitting under a wide spreading tree in a field not far from the homestead. It was late afternoon, and the shadows were long and peaceful. A ray from the sinking sun shot through the foliage overhead, lighting up the red tints of Elizabeth's hair. Halleck's artistic eye rested upon them, fascinated. He had never, as he told himself, been so much in love before. "'You give me up because of a little opposition?' he went on bitterly, roused to increased irritation by the thought of losing her. "'Why, what can I do?' The girl's voice was weary and she threw out her hands with a helpless gesture. "'They will give in to me, I suppose, if I insist. But it makes them too unhappy. I believe it would kill them. If they were unkind, I shouldn't care. But they only cry, and are so wretched, and I can't stand it. It makes me feel so ungrateful.' "'And yet,' said Halleck anxiously, "'you think they will give in in the end?' "'Oh, yes, they'll give in,' said Elizabeth wearily. "'They'll give in if I insist. And that's the very reason why I—well, what makes it so hard, you see?' "'No, I don't see,' said Paul bluntly, 
"'If you think they will give in, why are you so unhappy?' "'But I understand how it is,' he went on harshly. "'You don't love me. I'm too far beneath you. A bohemian, an outcast. You're glad of an excuse to throw me over.' "'Paul!' the indignant color flushed into Elizabeth's face. "'How can you say such things?' she asked reproachfully. "'You know they are not true. I told my aunts that I would never give you up. I told them that, that I would marry you to-morrow if I could.' "'You told them that?' Paul exclaimed exultantly. He put his arm around her and drew her toward him. "'Then keep your word, darling,' he said. "'Marry me to Elizabeth shrank away, startled. "'Marry you?' she repeated. "'Tomorrow? How could I?' "'Why not?' said Paul quietly. "'Come up to Cranston, and we'll be married. Then let them say what they please.' Elizabeth was very pale. "'I couldn't do that,' she said in a low voice. "'I don't want to be married so soon, and besides, it would kill my aunts.' He laughed. "'Nonsense!' People soon resign themselves to what they can't help. And then they needn't know yet a while. Listen, darling, this is my plan. You know that I want to go abroad. Well, I've had a letter offering me a position in an opera company in Munich. If I accept it, I start this week. He stopped as Elizabeth gave a little cry and stared up at him with reproachful eyes. This week, she said. You go away this week? Why— "'I can't stay here forever, you know,' Paul said. "'I've idled away my time unconscionably already. "'But that is your fault, Elizabeth. "'Now it is time I went to work, "'and that is why I say, "'Marry me before I go. "'Then, while I'm away, "'nothing can separate us.' "'Elizabeth, pale and thoughtful, "'seemed to ponder the suggestion. "'Marry you,' she repeated slowly. "'Marry you.' "'Now, at once?' "'Yes, to-morrow,' said Paul boldly. "'And—and keep it secret?' she went on with a troubled look. "'Yes, for a little while,' said Paul. "'For a few months, till I come back. "'I shall have made my name and my fortune, darling, I hope, by that time, "'and your aunts will be quite reconciled to me.' "'Then wouldn't it be better,' said Elizabeth, with much reason, "'to wait till then?' "'Are you willing to wait in uncertainty all this time?' he asked reproachfully. "'Oh, Elizabeth, it's evident that you don't love me as I love you. Such an absence would be unbearable to me if I felt that some lover was likely to come along at any time and take you from me.' Elizabeth could not help reflecting that the danger of such a catastrophe did not seem imminent in the present condition of the neighborhood, but she did not put the thought into words. She only said— with some dignity. I don't think that I am the sort of girl to change so easily. Oh, you can't tell, said Paul. Women are fickle beings. I don't trust you, Elizabeth. I have a feeling that if you don't marry me now, you never will. And why should you hesitate? He went on eagerly. It isn't so much that I ask. I don't even say come abroad with me now. Only give me the certainty that when I come back I shall be able to claim you. "'You would have that certainty now,' she still insisted. "'I promise that I will marry you when you come back.' "'Then why not marry me now?' he asked triumphantly. Elizabeth could give no reason to the contrary. The idea was vaguely alarming, yet it held for her a certain fascination. She sat listening in troubled uncertainty, while Paul discoursed with enthusiasm over the many advantages of his plan. He was exceedingly anxious, as he had said, to make sure of this beautiful girl, who was, he vaguely felt, a little above him, of a grade superior to that of the other girls whom he had known and made love to, for the space of a fortnight, perhaps. He had been true to Elizabeth now for more than double that time. He really believed that he should be true to her always. There were other things that attracted him besides her beauty. The thought that Elizabeth was Miss Van Vorst of the homestead was not unpleasant to him, the old house, the family silver, the family traditions appealed to his artistic sense of fitness. And then, though he was no fortune hunter, and certainly would have made love to no girl whom he did not for the moment at least sincerely admire, he admitted to himself frankly that it was by no means inconvenient 
that Elizabeth should have a little money of her own, and the prospect of more in the future. The Van Voorst property, while it was insignificant enough when measured by the standard of the Van Antwerps and other rich people in the neighborhood, seemed by no means contemptible to Paul, who measured it by the standard of poverty-stricken Bohemia. Elizabeth's feelings were more complex, less frankly selfish, much more anxious and uncertain. The money question did not enter into them to any great extent, though she had an instinctive dread of poverty, and she was convinced that once married to Paul she would not be able to have the pretty gowns and other luxurious trifles which had hitherto seemed a necessity of life. But she was young and romantic, and this thought did not weigh with her very much. What most distressed her and made her feel in some way vaguely in the wrong was the trouble this her first love affair seemed to bring to others, to her aunts, to Amanda. She loved her aunts, and hated to run counter to their wishes. She did not love Amanda, and yet the thought of having injured her, though unconsciously, brought with it an uncomfortable sense of guilt. She had not seen her since that terrible interview, which she could still not recall without a feeling of humiliation. But she had seen her aunt, who told her that Amanda was ill with some low fever, typhoid malaria, probably. There was always a good deal of that at the mills. It was not considered wise that Elizabeth should see her, and besides, Amanda was delirious, and did not recognize any one. Elizabeth was more relieved than sorry to hear it. No doubt, she told herself, Amanda was already out of her head when she uttered that extraordinary outburst, and it was foolish to attach any importance to what she said in her feverish excitement. Still, Elizabeth did not like to think of it, much less of the promise she herself had given, voluntarily, in such forcible words. She had been so absolutely sincere in making it, and she had broken it so completely within the hour. The whole affair was unpleasant, and weighed upon her more than those more serious charges against Paul, which had fallen vaguely upon her ear, not seeming to make any deep impression. His conduct to Amanda was at its worst, a mere trifle in comparison. Still she could not give him up. That broken promise to Amanda only proved this the more strongly. She could not face the prospect of life without him, and yet she could not face, without terrible misgivings, the prospect of further tears and remonstrances from her aunts. The two claims struggled for the mastery. On the one hand, the claims of the women who had brought her up, whose every thought for twenty years had centered in her. On the other, the claims of the man who had loved her in his light way some five weeks. Under these circumstances it was inevitable that the claims of the man should predominate, and yet Elizabeth longed to satisfy them both. Paul's plan seemed to suggest a compromise and Elizabeth had not yet learned that compromise is never satisfactory to either side. Listen, she said, looking at him intently, with eyes that seemed to hold, even in the moment of yielding, a certain defiance of his power. If I do as you wish, if I—I I marry you to-morrow, I am free to—to to come home at once, to go on with my life as if nothing were changed, not to tell my aunts— not to tell any one till you come back? Do you promise this on your word of honor?" For a moment Paul hesitated. He had hardly expected her to yield so easily. Perhaps if he pressed the matter she might be persuaded even to go abroad with him at once. But there were financial reasons which made that inexpedient just then. On the whole Paul decided not to test his power too far. Upon my word of honor! he said, looking her steadily in the face. I promise that you shall be free as air, to go on with your life as you please, till I come back to claim you. And so the thing was settled. Paul was to go to Cranston early the next morning to make all necessary arrangements. Elizabeth was to follow him a little later. They were to be married at once. Then Paul was to take an afternoon train for New York, and Elizabeth was to return home, the whole affair should remain a secret. Then Paul, radiantly triumphant, clasped Elizabeth in his arms and pressed his lips to hers. "'Tomorrow,' he whispered, 
"'To-morrow, my darling, at this time, though the world won't know it, still you will be my wife.' A strange feeling thrilled Elizabeth. She could not have told if it were pleasure or some involuntary presentiment. But aloud she repeated mechanically, "'Yes, I shall be your wife.' "'You won't fail me, dearest,' he said, scanning her face eagerly. "'You won't break your word. You've promised. You won't fail me.' "'No,' Elizabeth answered. "'I have promised. I won't fail you.' And yet the thought crossed her mind irrelevantly that she had broken a promise once already. She left him and went home through the stillness and the fast-gathering shadows of the evening. The days were already growing shorter. She noted the fact mechanically, noted, too, that the deep-glowing crimson of the sunset foretold a hot day for the morrow. She entered the house and looked in at the dining-room. The table was set out for tea with all the wonted care. Her aunts sat each at one end. They were neither of them eating, and both had red eyes. In the center of the table stood Elizabeth's favorite cake, the kind with the raisins in it, which she used to beg for as a child and which was reserved either as a reward for virtue or for consolation in some childish trouble. Now in this trouble that was so far from childish, poor Miss Joanna had bethought herself of the old attention, and brought out the favorite cake as the only means of comfort within her power. Elizabeth could not see it without a lump in her throat. She smoothed her ruffled hair before the glass, and came in quietly to her usual place at the table. They looked up nervously at her entrance, but neither spoke. They did not reproach her with being late, or ask where she had been. Miss Joanna pressed upon her the various dainties, reminding her that she had eaten no dinner. Otherwise the meal was a silent one. It was not till near the end of it that Elizabeth spoke, in a strained, harsh voice unlike her own. "'Paul is going away,' that was what she said. He has an engagement to go abroad. He goes to New York to-morrow. I—I I hope you're satisfied." And then she stopped, for the look of tremulous relief on both their faces was almost more than she could bear. The raisins in her favorite cake seemed suddenly to choke her. She began to doubt, after all, whether she would go to Cranston the next day. End of chapter 9 Chapter Ten of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This was Elizabeth's last thought that night. It was her first in the morning. She dressed herself carefully, putting on white according to the custom which had aroused Aunt Rebecca's criticism, and all the while she asked of the reflection that stared back at her with perplexed eyes out of the mirror. Shall I go, or shall I not?" She put the question to a rose when she got downstairs, repeating as she ruthlessly destroyed each petal, yes, no, yes, no. But the flower answered with a no, and she threw away the last petal in disgust. I think I shall drive over to the mills this morning, she announced quietly at breakfast. There is some ribbon I want to match. Her aunts looked up startled. They wondered simultaneously at what hour Halleck was to leave for New York. Yet what if, after all, the child wished for one last meeting? "'You don't think it's—it's it's too hot to go over there to-day, my dear?' Miss Cornelia ventured at last, uncertainly. "'No, I don't mind the heat,' Elizabeth answered indifferently, as she sat playing with her knife and fork. She was very pale, and had no appetite. This seemed to them only natural. They hoped that when the young man was out of the way, their darling would be herself again. "'We must take her to the seashore for a little while,' Miss Cornelia observed when Elizabeth had left the room. "'She needs a change of air.' Miss Joanna cheerfully assented. The idea and the sacrifice which it involved, since to go away from home even for a few weeks seemed a terrible undertaking, consoled them both greatly and meanwhile Elizabeth went her own way. It was not till she was seated in the carriage about to start on her drive that she observed, 
as if by an afterthought. Oh, by the way, if I can't match the ribbon at the mills, I may go to Cranston for it by the trolley, so don't be worried if I don't come back till late, and don't wait dinner. Her aunts looked at one another questioningly, but she drove off at once before they could offer any objections. And so Elizabeth drove toward Bassett Mills. The day was dry and hot, as were most days that summer. The sun beat down out of a brazen sky, the roads were white with dust, the grass in the fields was sere and brown. The locusts all along the way kept up a loud exultant song, the burden of which was heat. To Elizabeth, as she drove on, there began to be something ominous in it all, in the heat and the dust and the dazzling sunshine and the locusts with their eternal noise. They seemed all part, and she with them, of some horrible nightmare. She was under some spell which benumbed her, deprived her of the capacity for thought, of all but the power to keep doggedly on the way to Bassett Mills. What she should do when she got there she did not know. Her brain was torpid. There was a strange ringing in her ears. It was the sun, no doubt, that was affecting her head. Or she might be ill. It would be wise to turn back. But still she kept on. It was not far from noon when she reached Bassett Mills. There was little life about the place this hot morning. The mill stream even seemed to dash less tumultuously, and showed signs of running dry. A group of men stood outside the drug store, which was a great meeting place, and discussed the drought. It was decided that if it continued, the crops would be ruined. But hopes were founded on the fact that prayers for rain were to be offered in all the churches on Sunday. But there's no much use praying for rain, said one skeptic, when the winds do west. Elizabeth heard the words as she drove up, and alighting tied the white pony to a post, and bribed a small boy to keep an eye on him. Then she joined the group in front of the shop, who were some waiting for the trolley, others merely passing the time of day. She did not go into the dry goods shop to try and match her ribbon. She knew that such ribbon as she wanted was not to be had at Bassett Mills. She stood idly listening to the men's conversation, and wondering if it were indeed true, as the skeptic had declared, that it was useless to pray for an event already determined by natural causes. She had been brought up to believe implicitly in the efficacy of prayer, and had added to her usual formula that morning a petition of unwanted fervor, that she might be enabled in this perplexing situation to decide for the best. But perhaps there was no use in praying. Perhaps one was not a free agent. Fate, she thought, had evidently determined that she should go to Cranston that morning to be married, since it was a thing that might so easily have been prevented by an objection from her aunts, an offer of company on the expedition, even by the white pony going lame. She would have yielded, or so she thought, to the merest trifle, glad to have the decision taken out of her hands. But everything had been made easy. It evidently was to be. And an implicit believer in heredity might have observed that the matter had been decided for her by events and influences which had molded her character even before she was born. It was in just such clandestine fashion as this that her parents had once gone up to Cranston to be married. And it might be that some mysterious hereditary instinct, some force over which she had no control, was now constraining their daughter, under the same circumstances, to act in the same way. Elizabeth, fortunately or otherwise, did not think of this. She only knew that she was standing outside the drug store with the other loiterers, straining her eyes along the dusty white road for a sign of the trolley, and that even while she doubted the wisdom of waiting, some fascination held her rooted to the spot. When the trolley came, she took her seat at once. After all, a trip to Cranston meant nothing. She might simply buy her ribbon and come back. The trolley started off fast and jerkily, creating a teasing wind that seemed to blow from some fiery furnace. Elizabeth clutched her hat with one hand, while with the other she tried to shield her eyes from the flying dust and glare. Soon they were past the cemetery, and the straggling outskirts of Bassett Mills, out in the open country with rolling meadow and upland on either side, all withered, 
scorching under the sun's fierce rays. An occasional wagon met them, wrapped in a cloud of dust. The trolley was hailed now and then from some solitary farmhouse, and came to a sudden stop. The ride seemed endless. But that they were approaching Cranston was at last made evident by unmistakable signs, by the advertisements staring at them from trunks of trees and the expanse of stone walls, by the asphalt pavement that succeeded the rough country road, the increasing quantity of bicycles, carriages, and dust, and finally by the neat rows of Queen Anne villas, with their gabled fronts and terraced gardens sloping to the road. Then the car, with a last triumphant jerk, turned a corner and landed its passenger squarely in the high street of Cranston. Elizabeth alighted rather limply, and stood looking about her in a dazed sort of way. A countrywoman laden with parcels addressed her timidly. "'Excuse me, miss,' she said, "'but would you tell me the best place to go for stockings?' Elizabeth started and stared at her, as if the simple question had been put in Hebrew. Then, in a moment, she recovered herself and directed the woman very civilly. She watched her bustle off upon her round of errands, then turned and slowly walked into the confectioner's shop. It was there that she had promised to meet Paul. There was no one, as it happened, in the front part of the shop where candy and cake were sold, no one in the little restaurant at the back. Elizabeth sat down at one of the small marble-topped tables. Her head was aching, her eyes bloodshot. She was conscious of nothing but a feeling of pleasure in the coolness and darkness, of relief from the outside glare. Mechanically she glanced at the small mirror that hung at an unbecoming angle opposite on the wall, and felt a slight shock at the sight of herself. Pale, worn, with bloodshot eyes, her white gown dusty and bedraggled. No, she did not look well. She had never looked worse in her life. Her lips curled in an unmirthful smile, and she thought irrelevantly of Aunt Rebecca, and of how she might have held forth on the folly of wearing white for such a dusty ride. And thereupon, with a sudden pang, came the thought of Amanda. Amanda! Tossing, no doubt, just then in the delirium of fever. The unpleasant idea struck Elizabeth of a resemblance between her own white face in the mirror and her cousin's face as she had last seen it with those staring, red-rimmed eyes. Certainly there was a latent family likeness, but it took unbecoming conditions such as these to bring it out. She wondered languidly if anyone else had ever noticed it. Poor Amanda! Was she still in her delirium fretting over Paul? Or was she perhaps secure in Elizabeth's promise, and the pleasure of having separated them? What would she think if she knew that Elizabeth was even now waiting for him here in Cranston, waiting to be married to him? But with this thought the spell of indifference which had rested upon Elizabeth seemed suddenly to fall away, and there swept over her a sudden sense of revolt, of shame and repulsion. She started impulsively to her feet. No, she could not be married, not in that way. It was clandestine, disgraceful. There was still time to escape if only she could reach home without seeing Paul. She made one quick, blinded rush for the door, and then a tall figure stood in her way, and her hands were seized in a man's eager grasp. His handsome, exultant face looked into hers. "'My brave girl,' he said, "'so you have not failed me.'" End of chapter 10 Chapter Eleven of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, with a great effort, wrenched her hands away from Paul's grasp and fell against one of the marble topped tables. Her face was white, her dull eyes looked up at him with a sort of terror. I, I have failed you, she said, speaking slowly and thickly with parched lips. I have come, but I cannot stay. I was going when you came in. Elizabeth! The look of exultant joy faded slowly and reluctantly from Paul's face. Elizabeth, what do you mean? Why did you come if you 
don't mean to stay. Because I, I, I was crazy. She was trembling now, and she clung to the table for support. But still she was firm. I, I didn't think what I did. Now I, I know. It would be wrong to marry like this, so secretly. I must go home. Let me pass. She spoke the last words quickly, imperiously, and made a motion as if to brush past him. But he stood motionless in the door and blocked her way. He was very angry. She had never seen him so before. The emotion lent a curious brute strength to his fair, sensuous beauty. His face was as white as hers. His full red lips were set in a curve of unwanted determination. "'Listen to me, Elizabeth,' he had never spoken to her in such a tone before. "'I won't be trifled with like this. I have made all the arrangements. I won't have you jilt me now. You must come with me, or, or I'll know the reason why.' She met his gaze defiantly. "'You can't compel me to come with you,' she said. And again she would have passed him, and again he stopped her. She did not try a third time, but sank into a chair and put up her hands to her face. A sudden faintness came over her. It might have been the heat, or the sharp, conflicting play of emotion. He followed her and gently took her hands from her face and looked into her eyes. "'Don't be foolish, darling,' he said persuasively. "'You know that you love me, that you are only playing with me. You wouldn't really throw me over now.' She looked up reluctantly, fascinated as she had often been before by the mere physical attraction of his beauty. "'I—I I don't know,' she began slowly, and then stopped, frightened at the sound of the voices in the shop. A dread flashed over her all at once of a scene in a place like this. The trifling, frivolous consideration turned the scale in Paul's favor. She rose, shook off his grasp, and gave a hasty glance in the glass. "'No, I won't throw you over,' she said. "'It's all wrong. But, as you say, it's too late now. "'Take care. Someone is coming.' She gave a warning look at the door as Paul pressed her hand. So the threatened scene was averted, and Elizabeth's fate was sealed. The people, who, after buying candy in the shop, came into the little back room for some ice cream, saw a young woman arranging her hair before the glass, and a young man waiting for her, a not unusual sight. What followed seemed in after life a dream to Elizabeth. There were times when she tried to think that it had never happened, that the whole thing was a mere figment of the imagination, but on that day she was quite conscious that it was she herself, in very flesh and blood, Elizabeth Van Vorst, who walked by Paul Halleck's side through the glaring sunny streets of Cranston, went with him into a dimly lighted church, let him place a ring upon her finger spoke her share in the marriage service, and wrote her maiden name for what should have been the last time in the parish register. The clergyman was very old and mumbled over the service. The witnesses, two servants of his, were old and feeble also, and took but small interest. The church was damp like a tomb after the heat without. Elizabeth found herself shivering as from a chill. It was a relief to come out again into the heat which had been so oppressive before. But, on the church steps, Elizabeth gave a little cry. A funeral was slowly filing past, its black trappings standing out in incongruous gloom against the noonday brilliance. Elizabeth looked at Paul. He had turned very white, and he too was shivering. It is a bad omen he said in a low voice, as if to himself. He said no more, but led the way carefully in the opposite direction from that which the funeral had taken. They found themselves in a part of Cranston unknown to Elizabeth. The road was bordered on either side by flowering hedges, and led apparently into the open country. There were no houses in sight, for the moment even no people, 
Halleck suddenly turned and clasped Elizabeth almost roughly in his arms, while he pressed passionate kisses upon her brow, her lips, her hair. "'My darling!' he cried. "'I can't, I can't give you up. I was mad to promise it. Let everything go and come with me to New York.' "'No, no, I can't,' she murmured faintly. "'I can't!' His vehemence stunned, bewildered her, but instinctively she struggled against it. "'You promised!' she cried out indignantly. "'You promised that I should be free till you came back. I've kept my word. You must keep yours.' He let her go, and for a moment they eyed each other steadily. This time the victory remained with her. "'Did I really make that promise?' he said at last with a sigh. "'Well, if I did, I must keep it, I suppose. "'But, Elizabeth, you must be made of ice. "'You can't love me, or you wouldn't hold me to it.' Elizabeth was chiefly conscious of an overpowering sense of relief. "'I do love you,' she said soothingly. "'But indeed it is better, much better, to let things be as we arranged them. "'I can't go to New York in this dress.' She gave a little tremulous laugh, as she glanced at her fluffy muslin skirts. Only a man could suggest such a thing. And then, my aunts! They would be distracted. No, no, I must go home at once. You will be back in six months, she went on, trying to console him. They will pass very quickly. Six months, he sighed. It is an endless time. He was the picture of gloom as they turned and walked steadily back to the busy part of Cranston. And she, too, had her regrets. The compromise was satisfactory to neither. At the corner of the high street they parted. There was no opportunity for more than a hand-clasp, a few hurried words of farewell. Then he went his way to the railroad station, and she hurried to the trolley. The countrywoman with the many parcels was there before her, and told where she got the stockings and how much she paid for them. Back again went the trolley, along the asphalted road, past the Queen Anne villas with their terraced gardens, past bicycles, carriages, wagons, and always clouds of dust, out into the open country, with rolling meadow and upland on either side simmering in the heat of the summer afternoon, to which the morning heat was as nothing. Elizabeth, sitting upright, shading her eyes from the glare, with aching head and burning eyes, and throbbing brain that refused to take in the reality of what she had done. This was her wedding journey. An hour later the white pony brought her home. "'Did you—did you match your ribbon, dear?' Miss Joanna inquired anxiously. Elizabeth stared blankly for a moment. "'I—I I never thought of the ribbon!' she cried at last, and burst into hysterical laughter. End of chapter 11this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was that time of year when the neighborhood and the whole riverside are in their glory. Day after day dawned clear and frosty, to warm at noonday into a mellow brilliance. On every side stretched wooded meadow and upland all aglow, resplendent in varied tints of crimson and russet, magenta and scarlet, blending in a glorious scheme of color till they melted at last into the soft gray haze which rested, like a touch of regretful melancholy, on the tops of the distant hills. Over the fields the goldenrod was still scattered profusely, amidst the sober browns and purples of the bay, and the pale lavender of the Michaelmas daisies. Red berries glistened on the bushes. The ground was covered, every day deeper, with a carpeting of fallen leaves and chestnut burrs. On one of these autumn days, 
when the light was fading into dusk. Mrs. Bobby Van Antwerp came to call at the homestead, and found no one at home but Elizabeth, who was kneeling on the hearthrug, staring into the fire. Elizabeth's thoughts were not pleasant ones. She had refused to go to Cranston with her aunts that afternoon, for she had never been near the place since that hot July day, nearly three months before, when she had forgotten to match her ribbon. What construction her aunts placed upon the episode she never knew. They did not allude to it in words, but treated her with added care and solicitude, as if she were recovering from some illness. In pursuance of this theory, they took her to a highly recommended and very dull seaside place, where she was extremely bored. She returned in better health, though hardly better spirits. She had now a new trouble, which increased as the autumn advanced. Paul's letters, at first many and ardent, grew fewer and colder, till they ceased altogether. Elizabeth's last letter remained unanswered and she was too proud to write again. No doubt, she told herself, his thoughts were occupied by some new attraction. With a sudden flash of intuition, she realized that for Paul there would always be an attraction of some kind, and generally a new one. This unpleasant perception had one good result, at least. It lightened her sense of remorse towards Amanda. She had long ago got over the ordeal of seeing her cousin again, and the strange scene between them had been relegated to a curious phase of unreality, covered up and almost obliterated, as such scenes not infrequently are among relations and intimate friends, by the thousand commonplace incidents of everyday life. And yet some sort of apology had been preferred by Amanda, as she sat up in her white wrapper, very pale and hollow-eyed, with her red hair cut short, and just beginning to come in in soft waves like Elizabeth's, a thing she had always desired. "'You know,' she said in a weak voice, "'I was real sick the last time you saw me. I was just coming down with the fever.' "'I know you were,' Elizabeth said gently, conquering the thrill of anger which swept over her at the recollection. "'I guess I said some queer things,' Amanda ventured next, and gave an odd furtive look from her light eyes. "'You certainly did,' said Elizabeth coldly. Not all the pity she felt for Amanda's weakness could avail to make her speak in any other way. "'Well, I guess,' Amanda said after a moment, and closing her eyes as if wearied out, "'people aren't accountable for what they say when they're sick.' "'No,' said Elizabeth. "'I suppose not.' And with this tacit apology and its acceptance, this episode between the cousins, might be considered closed. Certainly on Elizabeth's side it was not only closed, but forgotten, in the pressure of far more serious troubles. As she knelt that afternoon looking into the fire, a vision of her future life, colorless, empty, without joy or love, seemed to stare back at her from its glowing depths. The years stretched out before her, a dreary waste, without Paul. She was sure that he would never come back. The bond between them seemed the merest shadow. He had forgotten her in three short months, while she was more in love than ever, since she had never fully realized at the time the void that he would leave behind him. For a short time her life had bloomed like the summer, and now nothing was left to her but the fast-approaching, gray monotony of the November days and the bleak cold of the winter. Upon these cheerful reflections entered Mrs. Bobby Van Antwerp, in a short skirt somewhat the worse for wear, with dark eyes that shone brilliantly beneath her battered hat, and her small piquant face glowing with health and exercise. "'Don't get up,' she said. "'What a beautiful blaze!' She sat down to it at once and held out her small gloveless hands to its pleasant warmth. "'I walked all the way.' she announced triumphantly, and I thought I would just drop in, and perhaps you'd give me a cup of tea. One must have lived in the neighborhood to appreciate the informality of all this. People paid calls in their carriages, with their card cases and their best Sunday gowns. It was not good form to come on foot, even had the distance permitted. 
but the young woman always spoken of as Mrs. Bobby, though her claims to a more formal designation had long since been established, was a law unto herself, and cared little what the neighborhood's laws might be. Elizabeth had already noticed that this great lady, the greatest lady in the neighborhood, treated her with more friendliness than other people of less assured position, with whom she was theoretically on more intimate terms. This curious fact, and the cause of it, occupied her thoughts while she rang the bell and ordered tea. A little flustered inwardly, but outwardly calm, and comfortably conscious of the becoming neatness of her serge skirt and velveteen blouse. Whatever her troubles might be, she had not yet reached so great a pitch of desperation as to neglect her appearance. "'Aren't these autumn days beautiful?' said Mrs. Bobby, making herself at home by unfastening her coat and tossing aside her hat, whereby she disclosed to view a somewhat tousled halo of curly dark hair. "'I tell Bobby that just these few days in the autumn make up to us for the bother of keeping the place, though in summer it is fearfully hot and unspeakably dull all the year round. It must be very dull for you,' said Mrs. Bobby, coming to a sudden pause. "'Oh, yes, it's dull,' Elizabeth admitted with a little sigh. Mrs. Bobby laughed. "'Why don't you say, "'Oh, but I'm so fond of the place,' or— but I'm not at all dependent on society as the other girls in the neighborhood do. I don't know, said Elizabeth reflectively. I don't think, for one thing, that I'm so awfully fond of the place. And as for society, I've never had any, so naturally I get on without it. But you would enjoy it if you had it. A curious brightness shone for an instant in Elizabeth's eyes. Ah, yes, I should enjoy it she said quickly. I'm sure I should. I'm sure you would, too, said Mrs. Bobby. She seemed to reflect a moment. Don't you go away in August? she asked at last. Yes, this year we did, said Elizabeth. We went to Borehaven. It, it wasn't very amusing. She stopped short, blushing as if the last words had been wrung from her unawares but Mrs. Bobby's smile seemed to invite confidence. "'Tell me about it,' she said. "'Was it very terrible?' "'Yes, very,' said Elizabeth frankly. "'There were a good many girls who used to promenade up and down, and a number of old ladies who sat in rows on the piazza and criticized the people and grumbled about the table, and they one and all treated us as if we had committed some crime. We were quite distressed till we found out that it was nothing personal, only the way they always treat new arrivals. "'Ah, uh, I know the type of place,' said Mrs. Bobby, "'and the people. Were there any men?' "'A few who were called men, about sixteen, I should think, most of them, but they didn't interest me particularly.' And Elizabeth blushed as she remembered the reason which had made her indifferent, at least to such men as Borehaven could boast of. Mrs. Bobby noticed the blush. "'What?' she said to herself, another attraction in this wilderness? Not that stupid Frank Courtenay, I hope. Yet there isn't and never has been another man in the place that I ever heard of. While she pondered this problem, the tea-things were brought in, and Elizabeth seated herself at the small table, behind the old silver urn, in the full glow of the firelight, which played on her hair, and brought out the warm creamy tones of her skin. Mrs. Bobby watched her silently with her bright dark eyes, her small pointed chin supported on her hand. "'You ought to go to town for the winter,' she announced at last abruptly. This seemed to be the upshot of her reflections. Elizabeth looked up with a little start, and a momentary brightening of the eyes, which faded, however, instantly. "'Oh, my aunts could never bear to leave here,' she said. "'They have so taken root in this place. Besides, she went on, constrained to greater frankness by the consciousness of that quality in Mrs. Bobby herself. What would be the use if we did go? We know so few people. It would be horrid to be in New York and not know anyone or go anywhere. Yes, that wouldn't be pleasant, admitted Mrs. Bobby, to whom indeed such a state of things was inconceivable. But you would know people, she went on after a moment. Everyone does somehow. There are your cousins, 
the Schuler Van Borsts, for instance. "'Who would probably never notice us?' said Elizabeth, "'or if they did, would ask us to a family dinner.' "'Well, that certainly would be worse than nothing,' Mrs. Bobby admitted. "'But how about your old school friends? "'You ought to have known some nice girls at Madame Verlet's. "'You would see, no doubt, a great deal of them.' Elizabeth shook her head. "'I doubt it,' she said. "'They spoke, some of them, of asking me to stop with them. "'But they have none of them done so. "'They don't even write to me any more. "'It doesn't take long for people to forget one, Mrs. Van Antwerp,' said poor Elizabeth, "'putting into words the melancholy philosophy which experience had lately taught her. "'My dear child!' cried Mrs. Van Antwerp. "'You're too young to realize that yet.' She put out her hand in her warm, impulsive way and touched Elizabeth's. "'I can promise you one thing,' she said. "'If you come to New York, I'll do what I can to make it pleasant for you.' Elizabeth looked up with glistening eyes. "'You're—you're you're awfully kind,' she began, stammering. In another moment she would have burst into tears, and perhaps in the sudden expansion confided everything to this new friend in which case her life's history would have been different. But just then she heard the sound of wheels, and immediately she stiffened, and the habit of reserve, which had been growing upon her during the last three months, reasserted itself. When her aunts entered, in a little glow of excitement after their day at Cranston, Elizabeth was sitting quite cool and placid behind the tea-things, absorbed in the problems of milk and sugar. The rest of Mrs. Bobby's visit seemed to her rather dull. They sat around the fire, and Mrs. Bobby drank her tea and ate a great many of the little round cakes which accompanied it, and which she praised warmly, to the gratification of Miss Joanna, who had made them. She told them all about her domestic affairs, and Bobby's affairs, and the family affairs generally, and was altogether very charming, and as the Mrs. Van Vorst expressed it, neighborly. But still she said not a word further of their going to town, or of that pleasant, if rather vague, promise she had made in a moment of impulse, which perhaps she already regretted. It was not till she held Elizabeth's hand at parting that she invited her, as if by a sudden thought, to dinner on the following Friday. "'It will be dull, I'm afraid,' she said. "'Only the rector and his wife, and the Harringtons, and Julian Gerard, who is coming over on Sunday.' You will be the only young girl, and I want you to amuse Julian. We dine at eight. Do come early, so we can have a talk beforehand. Elizabeth, entirely taken by surprise, had only time to murmur an acceptance. When Mrs. Bobby hurried off, being hastened by the arrival of her husband, who had called for her and was waiting outside in the dog-cart. Friday, remember, she called out from the yawning darkness beyond the door, and come early. Then Bobby Van Antwerp's restless horse bore her off. The Mrs. Van Vorst returned to the drawing-room in a state of considerable excitement. "'Think of my dining at the Van Antwerps!' Elizabeth exclaimed, still rosy from the unexpected honour. "'I was so taken aback that I could hardly answer properly. But how on earth am I to amuse Julian, whoever he may be? And what have I got to wear?' "'It's a—' "'A very nice attention,' said Miss Cornelia complacently. "'She's never asked the Courtenay girls, I know, from what their mother told me. "'She said they thought it a pity she was so unsociable. "'I think, sister, when we see them we might mention that we don't find her unsociable. "'Just casually, you know. "'As for what you can wear, my dear, either your white crepe or white organdy is quite pretty enough.' and much nicer than anything the Courtenay girls would have. "'To think of dinner at eight o'clock,' said Miss Joanna, who was only just recovering her powers of speech. "'So very fashionable! I wish, dear, if you can, you would notice what they have. Mrs. Bobby says her cook is very good at croquettes. I wish you could tell me, dear, if they are better than ours.' "'I am afraid I shan't be able to think of croquettes.' said Elizabeth, what with the burden of being on my best behavior and entertaining Mr. Gerard. I think, by the way, that he must be that dark man I have seen sometimes in their pew on Sundays. 
Which would he like me best in, do you suppose, the white crepe or the organdy? I must get them both out and decide which to wear. Elizabeth's spirits were as easily exhilarated as they were depressed. She ran upstairs humming a gay little tune which had not come into her head for many a day. This dinner at the Van Antwerps, with the prospect of meeting a few of her neighbors and apparently one unmarried man, might have seemed to many people a commonplace affair enough, but to Elizabeth it was a great occasion, and for the rest of the evening bright visions of future pleasure danced before her eyes. That night, for the first time in many weeks, she did not cry herself to sleep, thinking of Paul. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And you really think I look nicely? Elizabeth asked this question in tremulous excitement, as she stood before the long pier glass in her room on the night of her first dinner party. The maid was on her knees behind her, arranging the folds of her train. Miss Joanna stood ready with her cloak and Miss Cornelia hovered a little way off, admiring the scene. Elizabeth held her head high. There was a brilliant color in her cheeks. Her eyes shone like stars. You would hardly have known her for the same girl who had struggled with sad thoughts and disappointed hopes in the twilight only a few days before. This seemed some young princess, to whom the good things of life came naturally, unsought by the royal prerogative of beauty. You, you look lovely, faltered Miss Cornelia, forgetting her principles in the excitement of the occasion, and your dress is sweet. It is fortunate I had it cut low, isn't it? said Elizabeth, as she clasped a string of pearls, which had once belonged to her grandmother, around her white throat. There, do I look all right? You're sure my skirt hangs well? I wanted a white rose, but we have no pretty ones left. A slight cloud of discontent crossed her face but vanished instantly, since really, as she said to herself, she looked very nice, even without flowers. "'Don't be late,' entreated Miss Joanna. "'Just think if the dinner should be spoiled.' "'Yes, it would be very bad manners,' added Miss Cornelia, "'not to be punctual.' "'I don't know,' said Elizabeth doubtfully. "'It's rather countrified to be too early.' But still she drew on her gloves and put on her cloak, and started a good half-hour before the appointed time, in deference to Miss Joanna's fears for the dinner and Miss Cornelia's sense of value of punctuality. The clock was striking eight as she entered the wide hall of the Van Antwerp's house, and read, or fancied that she did, in the solemn butler's immobile countenance, an assurance that she was unfashionably prompt. The demure little maid who followed him and took Elizabeth's cloak regretted to inform her that Mrs. Van Antwerp was not quite ready, but would be down directly, and hoped that Miss Van Vorst would excuse her unpunctuality. Elizabeth's heart sank, but the maid was ushering her into a drawing-room, and there was no retreat. Yet she shrank back involuntarily, as the long room yawned before her, empty, except for one person whom she did not know. And thus she stood for a moment hesitating, her warm Titian coloring, framed against the dark plush of the portier, and her white gown falling about her in graceful folds, of a statuesque simplicity almost severe, but from which her youth and rounded curves emerged all the more triumphant. Her heart beat fast, and there was a deep burning color in her cheeks, but she held herself erect, with the proud little turn of the head that seemed to come to her by nature. The tall, dark man, who was turning over the leaves of a magazine at the end of the room, looked up as she entered and gazed at her for a moment in silence. Their eyes met. For an instant he seemed to hesitate. Then he rose and walked slowly toward her. "'You must let me introduce myself, Miss Van Borst,' he said, and his voice was like his movements, very deliberate, yet it was clear-cut and pleasant in tone. "'My name is Gerard.' Mrs. Van Antwerp told me I should have the pleasure of taking you in to dinner. He spoke so quietly and naturally, and seemed to accept the situation with such absolute indifference, that whatever awkwardness it might have contained for a young girl, nervous over her first dinner, 
was instantly removed. Elizabeth felt grateful, and yet perversely a little piqued that this grave dark man should place her at a disadvantage, that he should be perfectly at home and know exactly what to do, when she was nervous and flustered. But that kind providence which had endowed Elizabeth with so many good gifts had given her, among others, a power to cover inward perturbation with a brave show of self-possession. "'I'm terribly early,' she was able to say now quite lightly and easily, though still with that uncomfortable beating of the heart. "'My aunts are very old-fashioned, and insist on punctuality as one of the cardinal virtues.' "'In which they are quite right, I think,' said Mr. Gerard, smiling. "'But when you know Mrs. Van Antwerp, well, you will have learned that it is one virtue in which she is utterly lacking.' "'I—I I don't know her very well.' Elizabeth admitted, regretting somewhat that she could not assert the contrary. "'I have never even been here before,' she added, glancing about the room, whose stateliness was a little overpowering. "'Really? Then wouldn't you, um, like to come into the conservatory and look at the flowers?' suggested Mr. Gerard, who seemed to have charged himself with the duties of host. "'Oh, you needn't wait for Mrs. Van Antwerp,' he added, smiling, as Elizabeth hesitated. I know the time when she went to dress, and can assert with confidence that she won't be down for another half an hour." So Elizabeth found herself led, somewhat against her will, into the famous conservatory, of whose beauty she had often heard, but with which, it must be confessed, she was less occupied than with the man by her side, at whom she cast furtive glances from beneath her long lashes. He was tall, decidedly taller than herself, though she was a tall woman and rather broadly built than otherwise. His dark, smooth-shaven face, which had lighted up pleasantly when he smiled, was in repose, rather heavy and impassive, with an ugly square chin that seemed to indicate an indomitable will, of a kind to pursue tenaciously whatever he might desire. In contradiction to this, his eyes, except when a passing gleam of interest or amusement brightened their sombre depths, had a weary, indifferent look as if there were nothing in the world, on the whole, worth desiring. "'And this is the man,' thought Elizabeth, "'whom I am expected to amuse. He doesn't look as if it would be an easy task. But no doubt Mrs. Bobby has given him the same charge about me, and he is trying conscientiously to obey. That's why he's taking me in here to show me the sights, the way they do to country visitors.' Her heart leapt rebelliously at the thought even while she was saying aloud mechanically, "'What a fine azalea! I wonder if I look like a countrified production. My gown isn't, at least, but then he wouldn't appreciate that fact. It probably would be the same to him if it came out of the ark. He isn't the sort of man to notice one way or the other. I don't believe he cares for women. No, nor they for him. He's not at all good-looking, and he must be thirty-five? She ventured another glance. Oh, that at least. His hair is quite gray on the temples. Yes, those orchids are beautiful. I never saw anything like them. I must do my duty and admire properly. He thinks me very unsophisticated, no doubt. I don't think I like him. Did Mrs. Bobby think it would amuse me to amuse him? But perhaps he is thinking the same thing about me. And she stole another glance at his face but could not read, in his half-closed eyes, an unmoved expression, any indication of his real feelings. They had made the round of the conservatory, when suddenly he stopped. "'Don't you want a flower for your gown?' he asked. He looked about him reflectively. "'Let me see,' he said. "'You would like it to be white.' Elizabeth wondered how he knew that. After a moment's hesitation, he chose a white rose and gave it to her. She fastened it carefully in her gown, where its green leaves formed the only touch of color. "'How does it look?' she asked innocently, and raised her eyes to his, where unexpectedly they encountered an odd gleam of something that seemed neither wholly interest nor yet amusement, and that made her look down again quickly, while the warm color mantled in her cheeks. It was a moment before he answered her. "'It looks well,' he said then, quietly, "'and suits your gown.' and they sauntered back slowly to the drawing-room. Mrs. Bobby came hurrying in by the opposite door, 
fastening as she went the diamond star in her black lace. "'My dear child,' she said, kissing Elizabeth, "'what must you think of me? It is all Bobby's fault for taking us such a long drive, and I see he is not down yet either, the wretch. But Julian has been entertaining you, so it's all right. I'm afraid, though, that he has been talking away my character unmercifully, telling you that I am always late and other pleasing things of the kind.' Gerard's smile again softened his face. "'Do me justice, Eleanor,' he said. "'You know I don't say worse things of my friends behind their backs than I do to their faces.' She laughed. "'Oh, I should be sorry for them if you did,' she returned. "'But here,' she went on, as the voices were heard in the hall, "'here in good time are the rector and his wife. What a blessing they didn't arrive sooner!' The words had hardly left her lips before the rector and his wife were ushered in. The latter— uttering voluble apologies for being late, and laying all the blame on the erratic behavior of the village hackman, who, feeling an utter contempt for people who did not keep their own carriages, reserved the privilege of calling for them at what hour he pleased. The theme of his unpunctuality was so engrossing that the rector's wife would have enlarged on it for some time, had she not caught sight of Elizabeth, and in her surprise subsided into a chair and momentary silence and then strolled in Bobby Van Antwerp, fair, well-groomed, amiable, and mildly bored at the prospect of entertaining his neighbors, and immediately afterwards followed the Hartingtons, still more bored at the prospect of being entertained, after which they all went in to dinner, and Elizabeth found herself seated between the rector and Gerard. "'You live here all the year round, don't you?' the latter said to her, somewhere about the third course when he had given utterance to several other conventional remarks, and she had grown accustomed to the multiplicity of forks at her plate, and had decided that the light of wax candles beaming softly under rose-colored shades was eminently becoming to every one. She looked at him now with an odd little challenge in her eyes, called forth in spite of herself by the wearied civility of his conversational efforts. "'Yes, I live here all the year round,' she said in her clear, flute-like voice. "'I—' I'm a country girl, you see." He smiled. "'You are to be congratulated, I think.' "'Do you think so?' asked Elizabeth, in genuine surprise. "'Why, yes. I love the country, don't you?' he said tranquilly. She was silent for a moment, her eyes resting absently on the graceful erection of ferns in the centre of the table, which rose like a fairy island from a lake of glass. "'It's not a conventional thing to say,' she answered at last slowly. "'But if you want the truth—' "'I always want the truth,' said Gerard. "'Well, then, I don't think I do care for the country,' she said. "'I've had too much of it. I—there are times when I detest it.' She spoke with sudden vehemence, and she met his wondering gaze with eyes that were curiously hard. Gerard's face clouded. "'You don't care for the country?' he said slowly, and yet you live here all the year round? Ah, uh, that's the very reason, she said lightly. People always tell you that you don't appreciate your blessings, but how can you reasonably be expected to, when you don't have any voice in choosing them? If you did, you probably wouldn't like them any better, he retorted, and it would be more annoying to think that you had a voice in the matter, and had chosen wrong. Perhaps, said Elizabeth, but I should like to make the experiment." And she stared again thoughtfully at the feathery forms of the ferns. "'Well, if you had your choice,' said Gerard, lazily, "'what would you choose as an improvement on the present state of things?' She turned toward him with a slight start. "'What should I choose?' she said slowly. "'As an improvement on my life just now?' "'Yes, if you had a fairy godmother,' suggested Gerard. "'With unlimited power?' questioned Elizabeth. He laughed. "'Well, not quite that, perhaps,' he said. "'But a fairy godmother who could give you a good deal. A very charming one, too,' he added, in a low voice. Elizabeth knit her brows and pouted out her full lips in apparent deep reflection. "'If I had a fairy godmother,' she said musingly, "'and she were to give me three wishes—three, you know, is the magic number in the fairy tales. Why, I should choose first of all, I think, a season in town. Which you might tire of in a month, suggested Gerard. Not at all, said Elizabeth decidedly. 
because my second wish would be for the capacity to be always amused. "'And do you really think,' said Gerard, "'that you would like that, to go through life as if it were a sort of opera bouffe? "'Why not?' said Elizabeth. "'I'm a frivolous person. I confess. I like opera bouffe.' "'For an evening, perhaps,' said Gerard. "'But after a time you'd get tired of it. "'Oh, yes, I'm sure you would. "'And you'd begin to think. "'Ah, no, I shouldn't,' she interrupted him eagerly. "'For that's what my third wish should be. "'I should ask for the power never to think. "'Thought. Thought is horrible.' "'She spoke the last words very low, "'more to herself than him, "'and broke off suddenly, "'as an odd, frightened look crept into her eyes.' Gerard watched her in some perplexity. "'This girl,' he said to himself, "'who must be, I suppose, somewhat about twenty, "'and has seen, according to Eleanor, nothing of the world, "'talks sometimes like a thoughtless child, "'and sometimes like a woman of thirty, "'and an unhappy one at that. "'I can't quite make her out.' "'Aloud,' he said, in an odd, dry voice, "'that he had not hitherto used toward her, now that you have pretty well, in theory at least, reduced yourself to the level of a brainless doll, why not ask, now that you are about it, for the power not to feel? Then you would really be a complete automaton, and nothing on earth could have the power to hurt you. Elizabeth had grown very pale, and her hands were tightly locked together under the table. Ah, oh, she said wearily, I've exhausted my three wishes, and besides, it's too much to ask. No fairy godmother, I'm afraid, could give one the power not to feel. Be thankful for that, he said quickly. A woman who has no capacity for suffering is, is, would be unspeakably repellent. Would she? said Elizabeth dreamily. I should think for my part that she would be rather enviable. She sat staring absently before her, and Gerard did not try to break the silence. In a moment Mrs. Hartington on the other side claimed his attention and Elizabeth was not sorry. She felt vaguely resentful toward him for having made her think of unpleasant things, which she had resolved not to do that evening. The dinner went on, and she helped herself mechanically to dish after dish, which was pressed upon her. The rector turned to her and made a few labored remarks, adapted, as he thought, to her youthful intelligence, and she answered them absently. Bobby Van Antwerp told in a languid way a funny story for the benefit of the table, and the conversation grew general for a while. Dinner was nearly over when Gerard said, turning to her with a pleasant smile, "'I'm not a prophet, and yet I'm going to venture on a prediction. In a little while, I think, you'll find your fairy godmother, and have your season in town, though I don't know if the other things will be thrown in. And then, some time in the course of it, I'll ask you if you are satisfied, and you'll tell me, perhaps, that you are sick of it all, and are pining for the country.' the green fields, and—and and a view of the river. He stopped as Elizabeth interrupted him flippantly. "'Oh, no, never!' she cried. "'I'd prefer city streets to green fields any day, and as for the river, I've looked at it all my life, and I'm afraid I've exhausted its possibilities.' She was quite herself again. Her cheeks were pink. She looked up at him with laughing eyes. "'Confess that you think me terribly frivolous,' she said. "'Confess that you disapprove of me entirely.' "'On the contrary,' said Gerard, with a rather cold smile, "'I think there is a good deal to be said for your point of view. "'And as for disapproval, that's a priggish sensation "'that I hope I don't allow myself to feel toward any one. "'Wait till I see you in town,' he went on more genially, "'and then perhaps we'll agree better.' "'Ah, but you never will see me in town,' she said sadly. "'Never?' he returned, slightly raising his eyebrows. "'That's rather a rash prediction. I think I may have the pleasure of meeting you there before very long. You see, I believe in fairy godmothers,' he added lightly, as Mrs. Bobby gave the signal, and rising he pushed back Elizabeth's chair. She paused for a moment, as she gathered up in one hand the soft white folds of her gown. "'I wish your faith could perform miracles,' she said and then she followed dreamily in the wake of the well-worn black satin gown, which had been seen on many another festive occasion on the broad back of the rector's wife. "'He does disapprove of me,' the girl thought to herself. "'He would have liked me better if I were a little bread-and-butter miss, in white muslin and blue ribbons, 
who babbled of green fields and taught a class in Sunday school. That's the kind of woman he admires. He thinks me hard and flippant, but I don't care. At least he dropped that weary society manner. It is something to have inspired him with an emotion of some sort, even if it happens to be disapproval. End of chapter 13《Chapter Fourteen of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The rector's wife, after the first surprise, was very glad to see Elizabeth. It made her feel more at home, and she drew her down now eagerly beside her on the sofa by the fire, whose warmth on that autumn evening modified the somewhat chill atmosphere of the state drawing room. My dear Elizabeth. I never expected to see you here. Increased respect mingled with the surprise in her tone. Elizabeth had certainly gone up several degrees in her estimation. It's quite an honor to be asked. The Courtenays never are, I know, though don't repeat that I said so. Of course, we are asked every year, as is only due, you know, to the rector's position, my dear. But almost always the children are ill, or something goes wrong, and it's three years now since we've been able to come. It was unfortunate our being late this time. Do you think Mrs. Bobby was much annoyed? The rector's wife lowered her voice anxiously, as she for the first time waited for a response. Oh, no, Elizabeth was able truthfully to assure her. I'm sure she wasn't annoyed. Well, to be sure, the Hartingtons were later, in a tone of relief. But these great swells can do as they please. You look very nice, Elizabeth, very nice indeed. I never saw that dress before. It must be pleasant to have something new occasionally. And the rector's wife gave a gentle sigh. You see, I have had the color changed on this dress. Red, I think, makes it look quite different, and it is warm and pretty for the autumn. Don't repeat this, Elizabeth, but I wore the same dress here the last time I came to dinner four years ago. Only then it was trimmed with a pale blue. It was summer, you see, so it looked cool. Do you suppose Mrs. Bobby would remember? Oh, I don't suppose Mrs. Bobby cares, Elizabeth began absently, much about dress, she added hastily. She was looking vaguely about her, wondering, as the familiar voice meandered on, if she were really at dinner at the Van Antwerps, or prosaically seated, as she had so often been before, in the rectory parlor. Mrs. Hartington, a large, fair woman, very splendidly dressed, had seized upon Mrs. Bobby, and was talking to her on the sofa at the other end of the room. "'So you've taken up the Van Vorst girl,' she was saying, as she surveyed Elizabeth through her lorgnette. "'She is really quite pretty, and, uh, not bad form. That gown of hers is effective. It's so simple. I wonder how she learned to dress herself here in the country.' "'Oh, she's learned more than that, Sybil, I imagine,' said Mrs. Bobby, in level tones. "'I think her very good form, and extremely pretty. Her colouring is very picturesque and quite natural.' this very innocently, without a glass at the conspicuously blonde hair which her friends said had not been bestowed on Sybil Hartington by nature. "'She inherits it from her mother, I suppose. A red-haired barmaid, wasn't she?' said Mrs. Hartington again, subjecting Elizabeth to a prolonged scrutiny. "'After all, she lacks distinction,' she announced, dropping her lorgnette and returning to more important subjects. Mrs. Bobby did not enjoy that half-hour after dinner— Neither, perhaps, did Elizabeth, who had heard several times already the account of the attack of measles from which the rectory children had lately recovered, and was glad when the men appeared in the midst of it. But if she had expected Mr. Gerard to come up to her to resume their conversation, as perhaps she had, in spite of her consciousness of his disapproval, she was destined to be disappointed. Gerard did give her one long look, as she sat in the full glow of the firelight but he turned almost immediately and spoke to Mrs. Hartington, who had indeed the air of confidently expecting him to do so. It was Bobby Van Antwerp who sauntered up to Elizabeth, hospitably intent on making her feel at home. "'It was awfully good of you to come to-night, Miss Van Borst. These dinner-parties in the country are stupid things, but, after all, it's a way of seeing something of one's neighbors. I think you're too unsociable here as a rule.' It's a bore, of course, to take one's horses out at night, 
but if one always thought of that, one would never go anywhere. I'm sure, Elizabeth said sincerely, I was very glad to come. A dinner party is a great event to me. Ah, well, it is dull here for a young girl, said Bobby kindly. My wife finds it very dull, but she knows I'm fond of the place, and she comes to please me. You and she must try to amuse each other. You know, between ourselves, lowering his voice, Eleanor doesn't always take to people. It has made some of our neighbors around here feel rather sore, I'm afraid. But she does take to you, and so I hope we shall see a great deal of you. Elizabeth smiled and murmured her thanks, wondering greatly to find herself thus singled out from the rest of the neighborhood. And just then Mrs. Bobby came up and took her hand. Come, she said, I want you to play for me. I'm so fond of music, and I've heard that you play beautifully. Ah, but I don't, Elizabeth protested, but still she allowed herself to be led to the piano without undue reluctance, and then that grand piano, with the name of the maker, had been tempting her to try it ever since dinner time. After all, it is doubtful if Mrs. Bobby cared so very much for music, but it is possible she knew of some one else who did. Elizabeth had a gift which had come to her, heaven knows how, a gift in which far greater pianists are sometimes lacking, the power to throw herself into what she played, and to infuse into it something of her own personality. Her playing seemed no mere mechanical repetition of what she had been taught, but the unstudied, spontaneous expression of her own thoughts and feelings. As she passed, at Mrs. Bobby's request, from one thing to another, mingling more set compositions with fragments from operas and songs of the day, the conversation between Mrs. Hartington and Gerard slackened, and he glanced more and more frequently toward the piano. "'Music is rather a bore, isn't it, after dinner this way?' drawled Mrs. Hartington, noticing this fact. "'I don't think I agree with you. I'm fond of music,' said Gerard. And after a while he found an opportunity to saunter over to the piano, where Elizabeth sat playing, a little absently now, bits from Wagner. She started and looked up, blushing slightly, as Gerard asked her if she could play the fire music. "'It's a long time since I've tried it,' she began, impelled by some vague instinct to refuse, and then she stopped, and almost unconsciously her fingers touched the keys, as she caught a look that seemed to compel obedience. He smiled. "'Please play it,' he said. And though the tone was caressing, there lurked in it a half-perceptible note of command. She felt it as she began to play, and he stood listening, his grave eyes fixed upon her face. A severe judge, she thought to herself with a proud little thrill of rebellion. And then, as she played on, she forgot this thought and the fear of his criticism, forgot the strange room and the strange people, and the fact that she was dining at the Van Antwerps, forgot everything but the eyes fixed upon her, and played as she had never played before. Elizabeth had always put the best of herself into her music, her finest qualities of brain and soul. But now she put into it something of which she before was hardly conscious, a force and depth and fire which stirred inarticulately within her and found expression in the throbbing Wagnerian chords. All the magic of the fairy spell thrilled beneath her touch as it rose and fell and wove itself in and out amidst the clash of conflicting motives while Brunhilde sank ever deeper into slumber, and the flames leaped and danced and played about her sleeping form, and there lurked no premonition in her maiden dreams of that fatal, all-engrossing love which was yet to awaken her from the serenity of oblivion. Then, as the rippling cadence died away, Elizabeth hesitated for a moment, striking furtive harmonies, till she passed at length into the poignant sweetness the passionate self-surrender of the second act of Tristan, and so on to the Liebstad, with its swan-song of triumphant anguish, of love supreme even in death. With the last sobbing chord, Elizabeth's hands fell from the keys, and she sat staring straight before her, with eyes that were unusually large and dark. "'Upon my word, she can play!' said Bobby Van Antwerp, and looked for him slightly stirred. "'She has temperament,' Mrs. Hartington coldly responded, and again honoured Elizabeth with a prolonged stare. 
"'My dear child!' exclaimed Elizabeth's hostess. "'I had no idea you could play like that.' The only person who said nothing was the man for whom she had played. He stood motionless by the piano, and his face was white and set. When the applause of the others had ceased, and Elizabeth, blushing now and smiling, looked up at him in involuntary surprise at his silence, as if from a dream, he started, and then recovering himself, he spoke mechanically a few conventional words of thanks, and without comment on her performance, turned abruptly away. Elizabeth still sat, a trifle dazed at the piano, her hands tightly clasped in her lap, her cheeks were burning painfully, and she bit her lip to keep back the tears that sprang unbidden to her eyes. She seemed to have fallen suddenly from the clouds back to earth. After a moment she rose, and went over to her hostess to say farewell. "'Don't go,' Mrs. Bobby entreated, holding her hand. "'I really haven't seen anything of you.' "'I must go.' "'Thank you,' Elizabeth said quietly. "'William?' this was the gardener, who on state occasions officiated as coachman, will be furious if he is kept waiting. She felt a sudden eagerness to be gone, and Mrs. Bobby admitted the force of her excuse and parted with her reluctantly. Both Bobby and Gerard escorted her into the hall, but it was Gerard who placed her in the carriage, and yet, as he did so, said not a word further of seeing her again. "'He probably doesn't wish to,' thought Elizabeth now that he has done his duty to the last. The reflection was the only unpleasant one that she brought away from an otherwise successful evening. Gerard sauntered back into the drawing-room, and stood leaning against the mantelpiece, gazing with thoughtful eyes into the fire, while, as it leaped and flickered, and sent out glowing tongues of flame, a woman's face looked up at him, framed in her shimmering hair, and the magic of the fire-music still rang in his ear, mingled with the more passionate strains of Tristan, the deeper tragedy of Liebstad. He had been standing thus a long time when Mrs. Bobby came and stood beside him. The other guests had left, and Bobby had gone off to his den. "'Well,' she said tentatively, glancing up smiling into his face, "'Well, Julian, what did you think of her?' He started and looked at her blankly for a moment. "'Think of whom, Eleanor?' he asked. "'You know whom I mean. Elizabeth Van Vorst.' Gerard's eyes wandered back to the fire, where they rested for a moment absently. "'I think,' he said at last slowly, as if weighing his words with more than his wonted deliberation, "'I think there's too much red in her hair.' "'Too much red in her hair?' Mrs. Bobby repeated blankly, then recovering herself. "'But there isn't any, Julian, or very little. I call her hair golden, not red. Look at it in the firelight.' Gerard insisted imperturbably, and you will see that it's a deep red. Well, and if it is, said Mrs. Bobby, not that I admit for a moment that you're right, but if it is, red hair is all the fashion nowadays. No doubt, said Gerard, it's a matter of taste, but for myself, I never see a red-haired woman. He stopped, but went on presently with an effort. I never see a red-haired woman that I don't instinctively avoid her. "'Yes, it's a superstition, if you will. "'I feel that she will be dangerous somehow or another, "'perhaps to herself and certainly to others.' "'A note of unwanted feeling thrilled his voice. "'He broke off suddenly and stared again into the fire. "'Mrs. Bobby sat and watched him in silence. "'And so,' she said to herself, "'that woman's hair was red.' "'You see,' said Gerard presently, looking at her with a smile, I've shown the confidence I repose in you by confessing my pet superstition. Miss Van Vorst's hair is not very red, I admit, except in some lights, but still it's, it's red enough to be dangerous, and that fact and certain other things I've noticed about her incline me to, to avoid her. She puzzles me. I can't quite make her out. Still, she is certainly a girl whom a great many men would, well, they would admire. I'm no criterion, I believe. "'I hope not, I'm sure,' said Mrs. Bobby, ruefully, "'for the sake of most of the women I know. "'My dear Julian, I despair of ever getting you married. "'My dear Eleanor, if you would only stop trying, "'your efforts are, if you will excuse my saying so, "'a little too transparent. 
Do you suppose that I imagined this evening that your unpunctuality was entirely accidental? Imagine what you will, you marvel of astuteness, said Eleanor composedly. I certainly did not intend to hurry down while I knew Elizabeth to be in such good hands as I admit yours to be, in spite of certain faults which I hope marriage will improve. And that's why I don't relax my efforts, as you call them, while there is such a superfluity of nice girls in the world, and such an insufficiency of nice men to deserve them. But I'm disappointed about—about about Elizabeth Van Vorst, she went on musingly. I thought—I don't know why, Julian, but I thought that you would like her. Gerard started. "'I never said that I didn't like her,' he observed. "'No, but your remarks seem to point in that direction. Now I like her very much. Indeed, to return your confidence with another, Julian,' she looked up with a smile, "'I was thinking, if Bobby approves, of asking her to spend the winter with me.' "'I knew that,' he returned calmly, "'and I approve of the plan highly. It will be a pleasant change for her, as she doesn't seem exactly satisfied with her surroundings. And for you it will be a—he paused, apparently in search of an appropriate word. An interesting study, he concluded. She looked up in surprise. A study? she repeated. Yes, a study. To see what a girl like that, with the somewhat odd antecedents that you told me about once, and some contradictory characteristics that I think she has— to see how she develops in the storm and stress of a New York season. I think you will find it quite interesting, Eleanor. I'm glad you think so, she returned softly. But how about yourself, Julian? Couldn't you, just on general psychological principles, condescend to take an interest in it, too? A shadow fell on Gerard's face. Oh, for myself, he said carelessly, I'm not easily interested in things nowadays and above all not, thank heaven, not in women. He paused. All the same, he added, you have the best wishes for the success of your protégé. And with this he bade her good night and left her. She sat for a long time without moving, and watched the fire flicker and die away. On the whole, I'm rather glad her hair is red, in certain lights at least, she observed at last, apparently to the smoldering embers. It it makes the study still more interesting. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Eleanor Van Antwerp had uttered the words, If Bobby Approves, she had given voice to a purely conventional formula. For when, in the eight years of their married life, had Bobby not approved of anything that she might chance to desire? She did not suppose for a moment that he would object to her asking Elizabeth Van Borst, or any one under the sun, to spend the winter. And when, the next morning, she paid him a visit in his den, where he was supposed to be transacting important business, and proved to be enjoying a novel and a cigar, she was still— as she asked his permission to carry out her new plan, merely paying a graceful concession to the perfunctory and outworn theory of his supremacy. Bobby listened placidly, puffing at his cigar, his clear-cut, clean-shaven profile outlined against the window-pane, seeming absolutely impassive in the gray light of the autumn day. But when she concluded, and was waiting, all aglow with her own enthusiasm for his answer, he turned his blue eyes toward her, with an unusually thoughtful look. "'Well,' she said impatiently, as he still declined to commit himself, "'what do you think?' "'What do I think?' he repeated slowly. "'Of your asking Elizabeth Van Vorst to spend the winter?' "'Why, yes. I don't want to do it, dear, of course, unless you approve.' "'Well, then,' said Bobby calmly, "'if you ask my candid opinion, I think it would be a mistake.' I, I'd rather you didn't, Eleanor. Really, I would. Bobby! Eleanor Van Antwerp stared at her husband in incredulous amazement. Bobby, you don't mean to say that you don't want me to ask her. That's about it. Bobby paused and reflectively knocked the ashes from his cigar. You see, he went on argumentatively, this is the way I look at it. The girl is good-looking and all that, and it's very nice for you to see something of her up here. "'and I'm only too glad, for it's awfully sweet of you, darling, 
to come here on my account, and have always been sorry that there wasn't some woman whom you could be friends with. But to ask a girl to spend the winter, and introduce her to people, is— is a responsibility. And if you want to ask anyone, why, I'd rather it were some girl whom I know all about. That's all. It was not often that Bobby made such a long speech. His wife could hardly hear him to the end of it. But my dear Bobby, she exclaimed, breaking in upon his last words, you know all about Elizabeth Van Voorst. Do I? said Bobby quietly. I know that her father was a fool, and that her mother was worse. Perhaps it would be better if I didn't know quite so much, Eleanor. For heaven's sake, don't harp on what happened centuries ago, cried Mrs. Bobby, who had not been born in the neighborhood. I've always thought it a shame the way people here snub that poor girl. People can't help what their fathers and mothers were like. If mine were fairly respectable, I'm sure it's no credit to me. None at all, Bobby assented. But still you'd feel rather badly if they were not. It's a natural feeling, Eleanor. I'm not a crank about family, but on general principles I think a girl whose mother was a lady is more apt to behave herself than one whose mother was, well, quite the reverse. And on general principles, said Eleanor quickly, I agree with you. But I think Elizabeth Van Voorst the exception that proves the rule. Then I would rather, said Bobby tranquilly, that it were proved under someone else's auspices than yours. But that doesn't seem likely under the circumstances, exclaimed his wife impatiently. Really, Bobby, you disappoint me. I never supposed you had such narrow-minded ideas. The girl has been very well brought up by those dear old aunts, and she is perfectly well-bred, and I'm sure there is plenty of good blood in the family as well as bad. The Schuler Van Voorsts are their cousins, and lots of old Dutch families. I dare say if we went back far enough we'd find ourselves related to them, too. I dare say, said Bobby resignedly, if we went back far enough we'd find ourselves related to a lot of queer people, but we don't, thank heaven, have to ask them to visit us. Ah, well, I see you are hopelessly opposed to my plan, said Mrs. Bobby, changing her tactics. And, of course, dear, as I told you before, I wouldn't think of asking anyone unless you approve. Oh, I don't really care, said Bobby, somewhat taken aback by this sudden surrender. Ask any one you please. You know I never interfere with your plans. Only don't blame me if they turn out badly, that's all. Ah, uh, but they never do, cried Mrs. Bobby. At least this one won't, I'm sure. I really have set my heart on it, Bobby, she went on pleadingly. The truth is, though I don't often speak of it, going out has been a weariness, and that big house in town seems horribly empty since—since the baby died. Her lip trembled, and she paused for a moment, while Bobby turned and stared fixedly out of a window at the brilliantly tinted leaves that a chill east wind was whirling inexorably to the ground. I thought— she went on presently, in a voice that was not quite steady, that if I had someone with me to make the house seem a little brighter, some young girl whom I could take with me on the same old round that I'm so sick of, why, I could look at life through her eyes, and it would seem more worth while. But of course, Bobby, she concluded earnestly, I wouldn't for the world do anything to which you really object. My dear Eleanor, said Bobby, turning round at this and speaking for him quite solemnly. You know I don't object to anything in the world that could make you happy. And so Mrs. Bobby had her own way. It was on Saturday that this conversation took place, and on Sunday afternoon they all walked over to the homestead, Mrs. Bobby, her husband, and Gerard. Elizabeth had been prepared for their coming by a whisper from Mrs. Bobby after church, and tea was all ready for them with Miss Joanna's cakes, and a fire that was welcome after the cold outdoors, where the bleak east wind was still robbing the trees of their glory, and ushering in prematurely the dull grayness of November. Mrs. Bobby was not satisfied till she could draw Elizabeth to a distant sofa, and deliver the invitation, which she felt, in her impetuous fashion, she could not withhold for another day. But though the first of Elizabeth's wishes was thus fulfilled, with a promptness most unusual outside of fairy tales, she did not accept with the enthusiasm that might have been expected. For a moment, indeed, her eyes sparkled, her cheeks glowed with delight, 
and then of a sudden the color faded, her eyes fell, she shrank back as if frightened by the idea. "'I, I, it's, uh, it's awfully sweet of you, Mrs. Van Antwerp,' she said, low and hurriedly. "'But I, I can't go. I wish I could, but I can't. Don't ask me.' It was almost as if she had said, "'Don't tempt me.' Poor Mrs. Bobby, whose intentions were so good, was exceedingly puzzled, and not a little piqued. "'Oh, well, if you don't care to come,' she said coldly, in the great lady manner which she seldom assumed, "'of course I shall not urge you. I shouldn't have mentioned the subject if I had not thought from what you said the other day that you were really anxious to come to town.' "'So I was, so I am, for some reasons, but for others, dear Mrs. Van Antwerp,' the girl pleaded, "'don't think me ungrateful.' I should love to come beyond anything, but but I can't. It doesn't seem right, she added more firmly. Doesn't seem right, repeated Mrs. Bobby, wondering. You mean on your aunt's account? You think it wouldn't be right to leave them? Yes, Elizabeth assented, as if relieved at being furnished with an excuse of some sort, however feeble. I don't think it would be right to leave them. But that's nonsense cried Mrs. Bobby. They will miss you terribly, of course, but it will be no worse than when you were at school, and they would be the first to wish you to go, I'm sure. Elizabeth was quite sure of it, too. Mrs. Bobby, reading this conviction in her eyes, and all the more anxious for the success of her plan, now that it met with so many unexpected obstacles, went on to expatiate on the delights of a season in town, and all the possibilities that life can offer to one who has youth, talent, and beauty. Elizabeth listened eagerly with dilating eyes, which she only once withdrew from Mrs. Bobby's face to glance across to the other end of the room, where Gerard was leaning forward in an attitude of respectful interest, as he talked to Miss Cornelia. For a moment Elizabeth's eyes rested, half absently perhaps, on the strong lines of his face, while the irrelevant thought passed through her mind. I wonder what he would think. Then quick as lightning the answer followed. I don't care she said under her breath, and drew herself up with a little flash of defiance. She turned toward Mrs. Bobby. "'Do you really want me?' she asked caressingly. "'Should I have asked you if I didn't?' laughed Mrs. Bobby, triumphant, as she saw that victory was hers. Elizabeth told the news to her aunts as soon as the visitors had left. Their delight was what she had expected. They were eager in approving her decision, and in assuring her that she should have all the pretty gowns that the occasion required, sustained by the conviction, which occurred simultaneously to the minds of both, that their old black silks, which they had foolishly thought of as shabby, would do admirably another winter. It would be the height of extravagance, as Miss Cornelia afterwards observed, to replace them. "'It's just what we have always wished for you,' she cried, her little curls all aflutter with joyful excitement and so unexpected, quite like a fairy tale. Yes, Elizabeth assented, it's quite like a fairy tale. There's only one difference, she added to herself as she left the room. From every well-regulated fairy tale that I ever heard of, the fairy godmother, coach and four, are just a little too late. End of chapter 15 Chapter Sixteen of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My dear Elizabeth, said Mrs. Bobby, I regret to say it, but you really are growing terribly spoiled. The winter was far advanced when Mrs. Bobby made this remark. With Lent growing every day nearer, the whirl of gaiety grew even faster and more furious. It was not often that Mrs. Bobby and her guest had an opportunity for private conversation, but to-night, as it happened, they had merely been out to dinner, and having returned at an unusually early hour, Elizabeth came into Mrs. Bobby's boudoir in her long white dressing-gown, and sat brushing out her masses of wavy hair, while she and her hostess discussed the evening's entertainment and other recent events of interest. Mrs. Bobby's eyes rested upon Elizabeth with all the satisfaction with which a connoisseur regard some beautiful object of which he has been the discoverer. Elizabeth's beauty, Elizabeth's conquests, 
formed to Mrs. Bobby just then a theme of which she never tired, nor did she fail to make them the text for various sermons that she delivered to Bobby about this time on the subject of her own wisdom and his utter failure as a prophet. "'Confess, Bobby, that my plans turn out well,' she would say, "'and that I'm not such a fool as you thought me.' "'Why, I never thought you anything of the kind,' Bobby would protest. But she would go on unheeding. "'It would have been a shame for that girl to be buried in the country, "'and I do take some credit to myself for having rescued her from such a fate. "'But after that all the credit is due to Elizabeth. "'I did what I could, of course, to launch her successfully, "'but when all is said and done, a girl has to sink or swim on her own merits. "'Elizabeth takes to society as a duck does to water.' It's her natural element. And talk of heredity! There are not many girls with the most aristocratic mothers who can come into a room with the air that she has, as if she didn't care two straws whether any one spoke to her or not. And then, of course, every one does. Now explain to me, Bobby, if you can, where the girl gets that air. I suppose, said Bobby, if I believed implicitly in heredity, which I am not at all sure that I do, I'd account for it by your own remark that she has plenty of good blood as well as bad. Oh, yes, said Mrs. Bobby incredulously. You can always make a theory fit in somehow. But though Mrs. Bobby exulted in that air of indifference with which Elizabeth accepted, as if it were mere matter of course, all the devotion offered up at her feet, she was beginning to realize that the most admirable qualities can be carried too far and thus it was that she upbraided her this evening with being unreasonably spoiled, and not sufficiently appreciating the good things which had fallen to her lot. "'I don't know what you want me to do,' Elizabeth said quietly, when she had listened for some moments to this rather vague accusation. "'I'm sure I go everywhere that I'm asked, and that you must admit is saying a good deal. I talk to all the men who talk to me, and that again you must admit means a great deal of conversational effort. And and I make no distinctions between them, whatever, and do my duty on all occasions. I really don't know what more you can expect. But that, exclaimed her hostess, is exactly what I complain of. You go everywhere you are asked, yes, and you never express a preference for any particular place. You talk to the men who talk to you, and you make no distinctions. No, for apparently it's all the same to you, whether it's this man or the other. "'Not quite,' said Elizabeth placidly. "'For one man amuses me, and another doesn't. "'But beyond that I don't, thank heaven, I don't care.' "'She broke off suddenly and drew her comb with unwanted vehemence through her hair. "'I don't know why you should thank heaven,' said Mrs. Bobby, watching her narrowly. "'For a fact, that is quite abnormal in a girl of your age, "'who has some of the nicest men in town in love with her. "'There are times when I think you are quite heartless, and yet—' With that hair and those eyes and the way you throw yourself into your music, you seem to have an abundance of temperament. On the whole, Elizabeth, you are a puzzling combination. What was it Mr. Dalteville had said of you, that you reminded him of a lake of ice and a circle of fire? Mr. Dalteville, said Elizabeth, yawning, is fond of glittering similes. This one sounds well, but doesn't bear close consideration. The fire, I should think, under the circumstances, would dissolve the ice. Perhaps it will, said Mrs. Bobby, when the right time comes. Which will be never, said Elizabeth, with decision. Her hostess smiled as one who has heard such things said before. After all, she resumed, after a pause, returning to the grievance which had first started the conversation, I could forgive you everything else, but this indifference about your picture— one would think that when a great artist asks as a special favor to paint your portrait, you might at least have the decency to go to look at it, when it's on exhibition and all New York is talking about it. "'That's the very reason,' said Elizabeth, "'why it strikes me as rather bad taste for me to stand in rapt contemplation before it, while a lot of people are jostling me and making remarks about my eyes and hair and mouth, as if I were on exhibition, and not the picture.' "'Well, it is you whom they want to see,' said Mrs. Bobby. "'The New York public doesn't care much for art, "'but it does take an interest in the people whom it reads about in the papers, "'a weakness that we needn't quarrel with, "'since it has made the portrait show a success, "'and given us so many thousands for our hospital.' "'Well, at least,' said Elizabeth, 
I've done my duty in contributing my portrait to the good cause, so don't ask me to be present in actual flesh and blood, and above all not to face such a crowd as there was the other day, when we tried to look at it, and my gown was nearly torn off my back in the process. You could go early, suggested Mrs. Bobby, as I did the other day. You have no idea how much better it looks in that light than it did at the studio. I am very tired of it in any light, said Elizabeth. People have talked to me so much about it. But if you insist upon it, I will go, and I will go early. There are some of the other portraits, too, that I should like to look at, if I can do so in peace. And with this concession the conversation was allowed to drop for a moment. It was Elizabeth who resumed it, speaking slowly and tentatively, with many lapses and eyes carefully turned away from her friend. "'You talk,' she said, "'a great deal of my successes, and I suppose in a way I ought to be satisfied. And of course I am,' she added hastily. "'People have been very nice to me. I couldn't ask for anything more, and yet there is one person—I don't know if you have noticed it, one person with whom I am a distinct failure, who I think almost dislikes me, and that is your friend, Mr. Gerard. What, Julian? said Mrs. Bobby in a tone that was absolutely devoid of expression. You think he doesn't like you? I am quite sure of it, said Elizabeth. But why? questioned Mrs. Bobby in apparent bewilderment. What reason have you for thinking so? A great many but any one of them would be enough. To begin with, he never speaks to me if he can possibly help himself. His avoidance of me is quite pointed. You surely must have noticed it. She fixed her eyes anxiously upon Mrs. Bobby. I, Mrs. Bobby checked the impulsive words that rose to her lips. Julian is, is very peculiar, she said in a noncommittal tone. I don't think he cares for women. Perhaps not, but still I have seen him talk to them. In a bored sort of way, it's true. But to me he never talks, in any way, whatsoever. He never has a chance. You're always surrounded. He would have the same chance as the others. No, it isn't that. He disapproves of me. I can feel it. As he looks at me through those dark, half-shut eyes of his, and it gives me an uncomfortable sense of wickedness, he thinks me flippant and vain and frivolous, and I am when he is there, or it seems so. When he is listening, I say all the horrid, cynical, heartless things I can think of. I have to say them somehow. It's fate. It began the first night that I met him. It was in the country. Do you remember? She paused and again looked questioningly at Mrs. Bobby. Yes, the latter answered softly. I remember. I was rather excited that night. It was the first time I had ever been out to dinner. I talked in a flippant sort of way about hating the country and longing to go out and wanting to be always amused. It was very young, I suppose. Elizabeth spoke with all the superiority of a girl halfway through her first season toward her more unsophisticated self of a few months before. He didn't like it. The sort of woman whom he admires knows her catechism and is satisfied with that situation in life where it has pleased Providence to place her. I shocked him. He has never got over it. He showed me that very evening how he disliked me. It was so pointed that it was almost rude. You ask me, do you remember, to play? She stopped. I remember, said Mrs. Bobby again softly. I never heard you play so well. I never have, since. I seem to have, just for the moment, some strange power over the keys. Such feelings come to one, you know, sometimes. And then, when I stopped, he had asked me for the fire music. I felt somehow that he was fond of music. He is fond of it, passionately fond. But when I stopped, he looked at me blankly for a moment, till he suddenly remembered what was expected of him, and thanked me in a cold sort of way, and walked off. And I shouldn't think so much of that. But since then he has never, never once, asked me to play, though he has often heard other people ask me. I have noticed, said Mrs. Bobby, quietly, that you will never play when he is in the room. I couldn't, said Elizabeth. It would have such a dampening effect to feel that there was one person in the room who disliked it, who no matter how well I played would always preserve his critical attitude. 
you see that I am reduced to the unflattering alternative that it is myself that he objects to, or my playing. But it is the same with everything. There is my picture, for instance. He is the only person I know who has said nothing to me about it, has probably not even seen it. That must be rather a relief, said Mrs. Bobby placidly, since you are so tired of the subject. If I am, said Elizabeth, that is no reason why he shouldn't go through the conversational formula of telling me that he has seen the picture, and adding something civil about it, as the most ordinary acquaintances never fail to do. No, of course, Mrs. Bobby agreed softly, the most ordinary acquaintances never would, but perhaps he doesn't consider himself exactly that. Whatever he considers himself, said Elizabeth with some heat, he is not exempt from the common rules of civility, but I suppose he doesn't really admire the picture, and is too painfully truthful to pretend on the contrary. And then she stopped and laughed a little at her own vehemence, but without much spirit. It really is very illogical, she admitted. I don't care for Mr. Gerard's admiration. It would probably bore me extremely to have it, and yet it's not pleasant to be so absolutely ignored." Mrs. Bobby was watching her with an odd little gleam in the dark eyes that were almost hidden by her long curling lashes. "'I will tell you,' she said, "'what it is that he doesn't like. It isn't you, or your playing, or your conversation. It's your hair.' "'My hair!' Elizabeth took up mechanically one of her long shining locks and passed it through her fingers. "'I may have been inordinately vain,' she remarked after a pause but I never supposed that there was much the matter with my hair. Nor would most people, I imagine. But he has some odd ideas, and among them, it seems, is a prejudice, a superstition, as he calls it, against red hair. But mine isn't red, said Elizabeth quickly. Of course not, said Mrs. Bobby. He's color-blind, as I told him. But there's no use in arguing the point with him. He insists that your hair is red enough to—to to be dangerous those are his words, and he avoids you in consequence. He has had some unfortunate experience in the past, I should imagine, which has given him this prejudice. There, my dear, I shouldn't have told you, Mrs. Bobby went on, leaning back in her chair, and still watching Elizabeth narrowly through her half-closed lids, if I didn't know, of course, that it can make no real difference to you what Julian thinks. Of course not, Elizabeth made answer mechanically with dry lips as she still drew her comb absently through the offending hair. "'You have so many admirers,' Mrs. Bobby continued serenely. "'It can't matter very much that one person should hold aloof. And then I shouldn't care about Julian's opinion, for he never admires any woman. Ever since that unfortunate experience, which happened, I think, when he was very young, he has been a confirmed cynic, avoiding all young girls, and horribly afraid of being married for his money.' I really despair now of his ever falling in love. I have talked up almost every girl in town to him, and all in vain. No, even you, Elizabeth, spoiled as you are, couldn't expect to make a conquest of Julian. I don't know what I should expect, said Elizabeth rather coldly, but I certainly don't wish to. It would hardly be worth while. She rose with one long look in the glass and moved wearily toward the door. I am so very tired, dear, she said. I think I will say good-night. Good-night, said Mrs. Bobby cheerfully. Sleep well. You need to. And don't waste another thought on that tiresome creature, Julian. Oh, I'm not likely to, Elizabeth responded with a rather pale smile. I'm much too tired. And yet she did think of him more than once, as she stood before her mirror, arranging her hair into two heavy braids, which reached below her waist and repeating to herself that, as Mrs. Bobby had said, it could matter little about the one dissenting voice in the general chorus of admiration which had attended her triumphant career. In spite of which assurance, her last thoughts as she fell asleep might have been somewhat surprising to those who, having watched that career entirely from the outside, regarded her as the most fortunate being in the world. Elizabeth's aunts were, on the whole, more to be envied than the girl herself that winter, there was no alloy in their happiness, no undercurrent of dissatisfaction, even though they wore their old black silks, and Miss Joanna's friend, the butcher, was heard to complain somewhat bitterly of her sudden parsimony in regards to joints of meat, 
What did it matter? They would have dressed cheerfully in sackcloth and lived on bread and water for the sake of such glowing accounts of Elizabeth's triumphs as Mrs. Bobby constantly transmitted, or of the girl's own brilliant letters which seemed to breathe the radiant satisfaction of a mind without a care. Elizabeth's aunt at Bassett Mills also watched her career, which was chronicled at the time in the papers. Poor Aunt Rebecca, after a hard day's work reading her niece's name and possibly a description of her costume in the list of guests at some smart festivity, would look up awestruck at Amanda. "'Only to think,' she would say, with the old contradictory note, half pride, half jealousy, "'to think that it should be Malvina's girl.' But Amanda, still pale and wasted from the fever, with her hair quite long and very soft and wavy, would give an odd furtive look from her light eyes, and say nothing. End of chapter 16chapter 17 of the ordeal of elizabeth by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain it was early at the portrait show it was so early that what few people were already there had the place practically to themselves there were only 3 or 4 in the large room at the head of the stairs which at a later hour of the afternoon was invariably crowded and where was hung that picture which had attracted so much attention partly from the great fame of the artist, still more, perhaps, from the beauty of the subject. A young girl in a long white gown of some soft clinging stuff stood against the background of a dark green velvet curtain. There was no relief to the dead whiteness of the gown, and the roses that she held were white. All that brilliancy of color for which this great artist is famous he had expended upon the deep red-gold tints of the hair the vivid scarlet of the lips, the warm, creamy tones of the skin, as they were thrown into full relief by the dark background. The painter had lingered, with all the skill at his command, on the rounded, dimpled curves of the neck and arms, nor had he forgotten the haughty little turn of the head, which gave a characteristic touch to the picture. Seen at a glance, it was aglow with life and color, very human, very mundane, the embodiment of health and bloom. A study in flesh tints, one critic had carelessly pronounced it, and nothing more. It was only when you looked at the eyes that you caught a discordant note, which, if you dwelt upon it, contradicted the joyous effect of the rest. A look, a latent shadow which the great artist had either surprised or imagined, and transferred, perhaps unconsciously, to his canvas, where, if you saw it at all, it held you with a haunting sense of mystery, the fascination of an unsolved problem. "'What does it mean?' a man said to himself that afternoon, and did—did did he really put it in, or do I, with my usual superstition, imagine it? Am I the only person who sees it, or do others?' Two young girls who jostled up against him just then evidently did not. "'Portrait of Miss Van Vorst.' said one, reading from her catalogue. She passed the artist's name without recognition, as she delightedly pressed her companion's arm. "'Say, Mamie, that's Elizabeth von Borst, you know, the beauty. I've seen lots about her in the papers.' "'You don't say so,' returned the other, who was apparently less up to date. "'I thought she must be one of the swells, but I didn't know the name. She's pretty, isn't she? But doesn't her nose turn up too much? And I don't think much of her dress. It's so kind of simple." The man who had been standing when they came up in front of the picture turned, frowning, aside, and found himself face to face with the original. For an instant each stared at the other in silence, and it might have been noticed by a careful observer that the man was at once the more disconcerted and the less surprised of the two. "'So, I see you have achieved fame,' he said, recovering himself almost immediately and smiling as he glanced at the two girls who were still criticizing Elizabeth's features, all unconscious that the subject of their remarks was within hearing. "'Yes, fame,' she returned lightly, "'of a kind that you despise.' She, too, was quite herself again, that flippant, frivolous self, at least, which he had always the power to awaken. "'I suppose I'm a crank,' he admitted. 
I really don't like to hear my friends talked about by their first name, by people who have read about them in the papers. Oh, that, she said carelessly, is a necessary penalty of fame. Which you share with a variety actress, he returned. I realized more and more that I'm hopelessly behind the age. Look at those two girls, he went on, glancing at them with some animosity. They have spent, I should imagine, their little all on the admission fee and the catalogue. They don't care two strongs for the portraits as portraits, and they have never spoken to the originals. But they are wildly interested in them because they represent to them the magic word society, and they will go away and talk about them as if they knew them intimately. Elizabeth laughed softly. Ah, she said, let them be. They're getting their money's worth. Don't grudge it to them. So far as I'm concerned, they may pull my face to pieces as much as they please. I know how it is. I've stood on the outside, too, of a thing, and tried to imagine that I was in it. Do you think they'd be happier, asked Gerard, if they were? Ah, that depends, she returned, oracularly, stroking down the long fur of her muff. Tell me how you find it yourself, said Gerard. He looked about the room. The place is comfortably empty, he said. Have you been around yet, or would you like to sit down a while? She hesitated. I have been in several of the rooms, she said. I came early on purpose. Eleanor is lunching somewhere, but she's to meet me here at three. Then suppose you rest till she comes, he suggested, as he led the way to a sofa which had been placed for the accommodation of weary sightseers in the center of the room. It's a long while since I've had a talk with you. And whose fault is that? thought Elizabeth. This isn't a bad place to talk in, and if you've been around once, you've had enough of it for the time being. I am glad to rest for a few moments, Elizabeth admitted. She threw open the rubbers of her coat, and sank back in her seat as if physically tired. Gerard looked at her. She was exquisitely dressed. Her dark green velvet and furs set off the fairness of her skin. Her large feathered hat suited her picturesque style. The subtle atmosphere of fashion, of distinction, lurked in every fold of her gown, in every movement and gesture. Three months had sufficed to endow her with it. They had also sufficed, or was this again the result of his imagination, to take away the first freshness of her beauty? She looked brilliant, but a trifle worn. Her color had faded. There were lines of weariness about the mouth, and deep black rings under the eyes. "'You don't look well,' he said abruptly. She smiled. "'I might have known he would say that,' she said to herself. "'I know it,' she returned quietly. The maid woke me up, as she generally does, with strong coffee. I refused at first to be waked. I haven't been to bed a reasonable hour for weeks, and I'm so countrified that I show the ill effects of it. "'You shouldn't go out so much,' said Gerard. "'What is Eleanor thinking of that she allows it? "'You will be ill if this keeps up.' He spoke almost angrily. "'Yet what difference would it make to him?' thought Elizabeth. "'He is very unaccountable. "'Why should he look at my picture, "'thinking, no doubt, all the time how ugly my hair is? "'I don't want his advice. "'I won't have it.' "'Oh, it's all in a good cause,' she said lightly, aloud. I complain sometimes, but I wouldn't stay at home really for the world. It's all too delightful. I may be tired, but at least I'm not bored. It has all come up to your expectations, then, said Gerard. You like it better than, than a river view? Ah, if you had looked at that view as many years as I have, you wouldn't need to ask the question. And you are always amused, he went on. That was the next wish, wasn't it? You see, I'm putting you through the category, as I threatened to do once, and I expect only the truth for an answer. Are you always, every day, and all day long, thoroughly amused? She met his gaze unflinchingly. Don't I seem to be? she asked. I don't know, he said. I've wondered, sometimes. You certainly ought to be, he declared. Then, she said, you may take it for granted that I am. And the third wish, he said musingly, follows naturally on the other. You never, in this whirl of gaiety, never, I suppose, get a chance to think? Not a moment, she returned triumphantly. 
All my time is occupied, I'm glad to say, in being amused. That's hard work, too, sometimes, but then the game is worth the candle. Well, he said, you are, I admit, a very fortunate young woman, and you have my congratulations. There are not many people whose wishes are fulfilled as quickly and absolutely as yours have been. No, she said with sudden thoughtfulness, that is very true. She sat for a moment, staring straight before her, with the look in her eyes which had puzzled and haunted him in the pictured eyes at which he looked a while before. "'Do you know,' she said at last, speaking very low and hesitatingly, "'it's very absurd, but it sometimes, it, sometimes it frightens me a little. Do you remember in Greek history, or was it mythology, there was a king who had every wish fulfilled, till he grew at last to feel that it was dangerous. He offered up sacrifices to the gods. He tried to escape, but it was all of no use. Everything went well with him, till at last his fate overtook him. And so I think sometimes mine will. Your fate? Gerard repeated, utterly taken aback and puzzled. Yes, the penalty, she said quickly, of having too much. I have an odd idea sometimes that there is— there must be some misfortune in store for me, that I shall pay for all this yet in some terrible way which no one expects. Oh, it's perfectly absurd, I know, but still, I can't help it. She had turned of a sudden very white, and she stared up at Gerard with a frightened, mute appeal in her eyes, like that of some dumb animal or child. To him she seemed all at once very young and helpless, a being to be soothed and protected, very different from the gay, self-possessed young woman of a few moments before. "'My dear child,' he said, very gently, yet with a note of authority, and laying his hand ever so lightly on the delicately gloved hand that rested on her muff. "'You're nervous and overwrought. You couldn't otherwise have such a morbid idea. This eternal going out has got on your nerves. I wish you would promise me to stay at home for a day or two. You will, won't you?' he asked persuasively. "'Yes, I—I I will,' she said mechanically, and still looking very white. "'I'm overtired, as you say.' "'And now don't talk,' he went on peremptorily. "'I'll get you a glass of water, and then I want you to sit quietly here and not say a word, till you are better.' She shook her head. "'I'm quite well, and I don't want anything,' she protested. But he brought the glass of water and made her drink it and then watched her anxiously while the color slowly came back to her face, and her eyes lost their strained, appealing look. They sat in silence. He would not let her speak, and as time passed a great calm insensibly stole over her, a feeling of peace, of security, such as she had not known in all those weeks of fevered gaiety. She was conscious vaguely of a wish that she might sit thus always, saying nothing, alone with him, all the more alone as it seemed for the crowd that was beginning to surge into the room with a murmur that broke faintly upon her ear, like the sound of the sea a long way off. The wish was, perhaps, the result of fatigue. She was no sooner fully conscious of it than she rose to her feet. "'Shall we walk through the rooms now?' she said. "'It's more than time for Eleanor to be here. Oh, I'm all right now, thank you,' she met his question smilingly. I don't know what was the matter. It was very silly. You see, I boasted unwisely about never thinking, since I have such foolish thoughts. But I won't again. Look, there's a picture of Gertrude Trevor. A good likeness, isn't it? But you've seen it before, perhaps. No, said Gerard absently. I haven't seen any of them before. They walked on slowly through the rooms, and she did the honors, pointing out the pictures as it was apparently his first visit. They did not seem to interest him greatly. "'Have you really never been here before?' she asked at length. She could not have explained what induced her to put the question. He answered it absently. "'Why, yes, every day,' and then suddenly stopped and turned his eyes full upon her, while that strange light gleamed in their sombre depths which she had surprised once or twice before, and had interpreted many different ways." which now set her heart beating wildly, and made her wish her question unspoken. "'Every day,' he repeated quietly, 
about this time or earlier since since the thing began then why why the words died away on her lips they had reached the head of the great staircase and the crowd came streaming up a confused mass to which she paid no heed she had again the feeling of being alone quite alone in the midst of it all while involuntarily their eyes met and his were all aglow with a fire which she had never before seen in them or imagined a fire that dazzled and bewildered and filled her with a strange unreasoning joy as it burned away the barriers of doubt and indifference till for one short breathless moment which she could have counted with her heartbeats she read his inmost soul i only looked at one picture he said and then with the words the spell which had held her seemed broken and the crowd closed in about her with a sound like a roar of the sea very near at hand and she looked down the great staircase and saw mrs bobby coming toward them end of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My dear, said Mrs. Bobby, I'm so sorry to be late. Luncheon was interminable. Why, Julian, who would have expected to see you here? She gave him her hand demurely, with softly shining eyes. Neither her surprise nor her contrition seemed to ring quite true. Gerard's dark eyes were again half-closed beneath their heavy lids. He looked, if a trifle pale, more impassive than usual. "'I don't know why my presence here should cause so much surprise,' he said. "'Most people come here, don't they, some time or another? It's a meeting-place, isn't it?' "'It seems to have been on this occasion,' Mrs. Bobby murmured under her breath. A young man had just stopped and spoken to Elizabeth, and the words might have referred to him— Gerard smiled. "'Won't you come and look at some of these pictures?' he asked. "'I want to talk to you. You awaken my curiosity.' They walked slowly along the gallery which skirted the hall, too deep in conversation to pay much heed to the pictures which hung along their way. Elizabeth's eyes followed them, while she was repeating mechanically, "'Yes, the portraits are extremely fine.' "'But not one,' the young man declared with blunt gallantry. To compare with yours, it's by all odds the most beautiful picture here. Do you really think so? said Elizabeth gently. I'm very glad. She had heard the sentiment rather differently put, perhaps a hundred times, yet it seemed now to have all the charm of novelty. The young man, a very slight acquaintance, charmed to have called up that glow of pleasure to her face, redoubled his efforts to entertain her. He was sorry when Mrs. Bobby returned with Gerard and bore her off. She was delighted when I said that about her picture, he thought. There's nothing like flattering a girl if you know how to do it delicately. We really must be going, Elizabeth, said Mrs. Bobby, consulting her engagement book. We have at least a dozen visits, and we promised, you know, to go to Mr. Dauteville's musicale. That reminds me that I did, too, said Gerard. I'm glad you spoke of it. "'We shall see you there, then,' said Mrs. Bobby, as he placed them in the carriage, and they drove off. "'I am feeling utterly crushed,' she continued, turning to Elizabeth, and looking under the circumstances very cheerful. "'Julian has been giving me a terrible lecture. He thinks me, I see very clearly, quite unfit to have the care of you. He says that you are not as strong as you seem, that I have been dragging you around, entirely for my own pleasure, apparently.' from one thing to another till you're quite worn out, and that you will be ill if I don't take care. He has quite frightened me. But there, Elizabeth, you don't look very tired, after all. She certainly did not. There was color in her cheeks, a light in her eyes that was at once brilliant and soft. All the lines drawn by sleepless nights had, for the moment at least, disappeared. You don't look badly, Mrs. Bobby repeated. You look, in fact, infinitely better than when I saw you this morning. I feel better, Elizabeth admitted. Just for a moment at the portrait show, I did feel tired and depressed, and he, Mr. Gerard, got alarmed about me. But it was nothing. 
I'm quite well now, and the portraits are really very interesting. I'm glad you persuaded me to look at them again, Eleanor. I thought you might be repaid, said Mrs. Bobby serenely. What did you think of your own picture? Doesn't it look better in that light? Elizabeth's face was turned away, so that Mrs. Bobby could only see the rounded outline of her cheek and one small shell-like ear. "'Yes, I, I thought it looked better,' she said in a low voice. "'Perhaps you are right. It must have been the light of the studio that made me feel disappointed in it somehow.' "'Oh, there is everything in the light in which you look at things,' assented Mrs. Bobby cheerfully. And with this profound remark the two women sank into silence while the carriage rolled swiftly up the avenue, stopping occasionally as the footman left cards. To Elizabeth, as she sat gazing out of the window, the prosaic brownstone houses and the more pretentious ones of marble which broke the monotony here and there, and the brilliant shops which had intruded themselves like parvenus among the quieter and more aristocratic neighbors. All these familiar objects stood out in a softened perspective, which endowed them with lines almost of romance. The wide, commonplace streets had an unwanted charm. The people who walked on them wore an air of curious happiness, merely, no doubt, at finding themselves alive in this beautiful world. Yes, as Mrs. Bobby had so wisely observed, there is everything in the light in which you look at things. "'I wonder if Mr. Dauteville's musicale will be pleasant,' Elizabeth observed dreamily, as they neared Carnegie Hall. The remark was purely perfunctory. Pleasant? Of course it would be pleasant. She hadn't a doubt of it. There will be a lot of queer people there, musical, literary, and that sort of thing, said Mrs. Bobby vaguely. Some men with long hair will play, and the women, no doubt, will wear wonderful aesthetic gowns. If Julian were not to be there, I should not dream of going. My prophetic instinct tells me that we shall not know a soul. But won't that be rather amusing? suggested Elizabeth. Well, theoretically, yes, said Mrs. Bobby in a rather doubtful tone. But practically, I'm afraid I prefer people whom I know, and who have the conventional amount of hair and lack of brains. Let me confess the truth to you, Elizabeth. I'm not really bohemian. I only pretend to be so at odd moments, when I want to tease Bobby or shock the neighborhood. There isn't at heart, I believe, a more conventional little society wretch than I. However, as you say, that sort of thing is amusing, for one afternoon— and Julian will be there and protect us from the celebrities and tell us who they all are. Julian was fortunately on hand when they arrived, but the room was filled for the most part with people who looked very much like anyone else, and only a few were sufficiently long-haired and eccentric to justify Mrs. Bobby's prediction of their being celebrities of some sort. The host who came forward to meet them was a well-known musician, a man with an intellectual face and dreamy eyes which lighted up as he welcomed them with eager cordiality. But he could do no more for the present than seat them and give them programs, for the music was about to begin. It was a charming studio, well up near the top of Carnegie Hall, and like most studios it was artistically furnished. The polished floor was strewn with rich rugs, the walls were covered in every nook and cranny with plaques and pictures and rare tapestries and strange eastern weapons. A grand piano took up the whole of one corner, and in another a toy staircase seemed to have been placed entirely for ornament, till it was utilized as a seat by some picturesque-looking girls in large hats. From the broad, casemented window near which Elizabeth sat, she could see an expanse of roofs and chimneys, far down from the dizzy height, and beyond them the river, and further still the winter sunset, fading in cold blues and greens and violets on a still colder sky. Her eyes rested there with dreamy satisfaction. She had no wish to look back into the room, to where Gerard was standing close to them, on the other side of Mrs. Bobby. She was still living on the memory of that moment. Was it an hour, or was it years ago? That long look of which the reflected light was still glowing on her face, and in her dreamy eyes. She had no wish to renew it. The recollection was sufficient, for a while at least, yet she was glad to know that he was there. Mrs. Bobby, meanwhile, having embarked on her trip to Bohemia, was disappointed to find it comparatively tame. "'I don't see anyone I know,' she said to Gerard. 
as the piano solo came to an end. They look, most of them, depressingly commonplace, but they must be extraordinary in some way, or they wouldn't be here. Tell us who they are, Julian, and introduce them to us if you think we would like them. Why, there are some musical lights, he answered rather absently, who I hope are going to perform for our benefit, and there are a few ordinary music lovers like myself, and some literary people, whom I don't know that you would care about. "'You think us too frivolous, I see,' said Mrs. Bobby. "'But you don't realize how clever I can be if I try. "'And as for Elizabeth, she knows a lot more than she seems to know.' "'Does she?' asked Gerard with a smile. "'And he glanced across at Elizabeth, who still would not meet his eyes. "'She looks very innocent,' he said musingly after a pause. "'I should be sorry to think of her as concealing anything.' "'A little pang.' A thought sharp like a stone struck Elizabeth for an instant. It was the first rift in the lute. She put it resolutely away from her. "'You think me too stupid, I see,' she said, to have any knowledge to conceal. He had no time to answer before some woman began to sing. She had a beautiful voice, and Elizabeth listened, yet chiefly conscious all the while of the fact that Gerard had managed to shift his position, and was standing directly behind her. I never thought you stupid, he said under cover of the applause, in a low voice that no one but she could hear. No, nor ignorant, but I have sometimes thought you frivolous and flippant, and, and a little hard. You seem, I sometimes think, to take pleasure in showing these qualities to me. Why is it, I wonder? I, I don't know, she murmured in the same low voice, and gazing straight before her. You? "'Somehow you seem to compel it. "'You ought to be grateful, I think. "'At least you know the worst of me.' "'She spoke these words with an absolute unconsciousness of their falseness, "'and even as they died away on her lips, "'she glanced across the room "'and saw Paul Halleck standing in the doorway. "'That old mythological king whom some vague reminiscence "'of her school days had conjured up in Elizabeth's mind, "'he who had every wish fulfilled, till he grew at last to dread his own prosperity. Was it, I wonder, in some such moment of foreboding, that the final crash came, or was it when his fears were lulled and his senses stilled, by some delicious overpowering sense of happiness that shut out for the moment all unpleasant thoughts? This, at all events, was the way in which fate overtook Elizabeth. Paul Halleck stood in the doorway, having apparently just arrived. His blue eyes were wandering about the room. They did not fall as yet upon Elizabeth. She did not faint, or cry out, or make herself in any way conspicuous. She turned deathly white, and her heart, which had been beating faster for Gerard's presence, seemed suddenly to stop entirely, as though a piece of ice had been laid on it. And then, in a moment, her heart began to beat again, though faintly. She drew a long breath. Gerard, who was standing directly behind her, could not see her face beneath the shadow of her large hat, yet he felt instinctively that something was wrong. "'Do you feel faint again?' he asked anxiously, thinking to himself that she was really far from well. "'Can I get you anything?' "'No, thank you,' said Elizabeth. I felt faint for a moment, but it's over. It took all the strength that she possessed to speak these words so clearly and distinctly. In making the effort she was not conscious of any plan of deception. She was merely bearing up instinctively to the end. She never doubted that it was the end. It had fallen at last, that sword of Damocles which she had learned to dread as the winter wore on of which she had always been vaguely conscious even in her gayest moments, and had only forgotten, quite forgotten, in that short, delicious hour when she had allowed herself to float off in a dream of happiness never to be realized, from which she was awakened so soon and so rudely. And yet, though it was over, she was not sorry that she had dreamed it. It had been very sweet, worth even the thought, the bitterness of the awakening.' 
Meanwhile, the musicale progressed. A man with long floating hair and fingers of steel thundered out a piano solo. Elizabeth shut her eyes and leaned back in her chair. How fortunate that there was so much music to prevent conversation. But at the first pause she opened her eyes and looked up at Gerard. "'I was wrong when I told you that you knew the worst of me,' she said faintly. "'You'll know it soon.' "'What a terrible prospect!' said Gerard, bending over her, and the jesting words had a soft intonation, which thrilled her like a caress. "'I really don't think I can stand it, quite.' Had she intended to tell him the truth? The moment was not propitious. The music had stopped, and there was a murmur of conversation all over the room. People began to move about, and in the general shifting of position, Paul Halleck, for the first time, caught sight of Elizabeth. She had had some vague, childish idea of what would happen when he saw her. She had pictured him in her unreasoning terror as stepping forward before them all and claiming her as his wife, like a scene in a play. Nothing of the kind took place. She saw at once how absurd her expectations had been. Paul merely started and looked at her, recognition and it seemed pleasure sparkling in his eyes, but with a sudden uncontrollable impulse she turned her own eyes away, as if she did not know him. "'Do you see that man in the doorway?' said Gerard, who, standing as he was behind her, could not note the changes in her face. "'That handsome fellow with the light curls. He has a very fine voice.' and has just been engaged as a soloist at St. Chrysostom's. Indeed, is he to sing this afternoon? She brought out the question with difficulty. I hope so, said Gerard. I'd like you to hear him. But perhaps you know him, he went on. He's looking at you as if he expected you to bow. No, said Elizabeth, I don't know him. She told him this, her second lie that afternoon, without deliberate intention, and sheer lack of presence of mind. It was a piteous, involuntary staving off of the inevitable. The next moment that fascination which leads us to our own undoing made her look in Paul's direction, and this time she could not avoid his eager gaze, and bent her head mechanically. "'After all, I believe I must have met him somewhere,' she said hastily. "'Mrs. Bobby,' who, for the last quarter of an hour, had been determinedly ignoring them both, apparently giving her whole attention to the music and the people, now turned toward them. "'Who is that handsome man who bowed to you, Elizabeth?' she asked. "'I never saw him before.' "'His name is Halleck. I—I I knew him in the country,' said Elizabeth, who had no natural talent for deception, and entangled herself at once in contradictory statements. Gerard's face darkened, and he glanced across at Halleck, whose eyes were fixed on Elizabeth, with a look that seemed to the jealous, fastidious man by her side an intolerable presumption, a look that was not only one of admiration, but, or Gerard imagined so, held in it a curious touch of proprietorship. "'Confound the fellow!' chafed Gerard. He, who would fain have kept the woman he loved, as he certainly would have kept her picture, shut out from all profane eyes, even admiring ones. He looks at her as if he has discovered her, and she belonged to him. Where can she have met him, and why did she say she hadn't? Mrs. Bobby, too, looked across at Paul. "'He is certainly very good-looking,' she said. "'And do you mean to tell me, my dear, that such an Adonis flourished in our neighborhood, and I never saw him? Pray, where did you keep him hidden?' Before Elizabeth could reply, and to her great relief, D'Auteville came up with the long-haired musician whom he introduced to them, and who proved to be, at last, one of the celebrities upon whom Mrs. Bobby had counted. In the diversion that ensued, Halleck seemed forgotten, but a few minutes later he sat at the piano and sang songs by Schubert and Franz, which she had heard him sing before, at the time when she had thought his voice the most beautiful voice in the world. Now, as she listened, it left her cold. She had changed so much, and he—no, he had not changed. His voice was not so wonderful as she had thought it, but still it was a fine baritone voice. His art no longer seemed to her remarkable, 
but it had, if anything, improved, and he was as handsome as ever, in his fair, effeminate style. It was not the voice nor the art that was lacking. It was the answering thrill in herself. It was not his beauty which had failed him. It was she who no longer cared for it. His success with the audience was instantaneous. Even Mrs. Bobby was impressed. "'Your friend sings well,' she whispered to Elizabeth, "'and yet his hair is short. You may introduce him to me if you get a chance.' And this chance immediately presented itself as Paul, amid the applause that followed his song, walked over to Elizabeth and quietly shook hands with her. It was the moment that she had dreaded all the time that he was singing. Yet now that it had come, she met it in apparent unconcern and smiling, though with white lips. "'I thought at first, Paul said, that you had quite forgotten me.' "'Oh, no,' she said. "'My memory is not so short.' Then she turned and introduced him to Mrs. Bobby, and went on herself quietly talking to Mr. Dauteville. Nothing could have been more simple. Not even Julian Gerard, who from a distance watched their meeting, could have imagined any secret understanding between them. The handsome young singer made a very favorable impression upon Mrs. Bobby, who went so far as to ask him to call, in that impulsive way of hers, which sometimes led to consequences that she regretted. In this case she realized almost as soon as the words had left her lips that she had done a rash thing, or what Bobby would consider rash. Still the invitation was given and eagerly accepted, even though Elizabeth, standing cold and indifferent, said not a word to second it. By this time the music was over. They were about to leave when someone claimed Mrs. Bobby's attention, and she turned aside for a moment. Paul seized the opportunity for which he had been anxiously waiting to whisper in Elizabeth's ear. "'Darling, don't go. I must see you for a moment.' "'You can't speak to me here,' she said impatiently, trying to escape from him. "'But I must see you. Can't you see that I must?' "'You have done without it,' said Elizabeth, without turning her head, "'some time.' "'Because I couldn't help myself. There is such a thing as writing,' she said in the same low, bitter tone, yet even as she spoke her conscious misgave her. It was not his neglect that she resented so bitterly, it was his return. But Paul, not understanding this, was rather flattered than otherwise by the reproach. "'Darling, I will explain when I see you,' he said hurriedly. "'There's no time now. Meet me to-morrow morning, at the Fifty-Ninth Street entrance to the park, at eleven o'clock.' "'Tomorrow? Impossible!' I have a hundred things to do. Ah, but you must, he pleaded. I must see you, darling. You look so beautiful, fifty times more beautiful than before. Hush, said Elizabeth. How dare you? Someone will hear you. Give me a chance of seeing you, then, he said. It is necessary. You will meet me, will you not, tomorrow morning? If you insist upon it, yes. At the west entrance of the park, you understand? Oh, yes said Elizabeth impatiently, and hastened to rejoin Mrs. Bobby, who was waiting at the door. Julian Gerard came up gloomily. The whispered conference had not escaped his notice. "'We shall see you to-night at the Landown's ball,' said Mrs. Bobby. "'It is the night for it, isn't it, Elizabeth? I never can keep track of these things.' Gerard looked reproachfully at Elizabeth. "'You promised me,' he said, "'that you would stay at home for a night or two. She smiled back at him with the old touch of willfulness. "'Did I really make such a rash promise?' she said lightly. "'Ah, uh, I'm afraid I can't keep it. Not to-night. I must be amused. A quiet evening would be unendurable.' Her cheeks were flushed, her eyes glittered with feverish gaiety. There was an odd, strained note in her voice. Mrs. Bobby looked at her in some perplexity. Then she glanced up deprecatingly at Gerard. "'It is her first season, you see, Julian,' she said, as if in apology. "'You can't expect her to give up things.' "'No,' he repeated mechanically. "'I can't expect her to give up things.' He fell back silently in increased gloom. Elizabeth glanced toward him involuntarily as she left the room. "'Now,' she said to herself, "'I have disappointed him again, and he won't come near me this evening.' 
But it is better so, far, far better, she repeated to herself with a little sob, as she followed her hostess to the carriage. End of chapter 18《ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッシュ・ユー・ハッピーバースデー・ウィッ Yet the warm sunlight falling incongruously on sere brown grass and bare branches seemed but to emphasize their dreariness, and the fact that winter had not really surrendered, and was only biding his time and the advent of the March winds to make his power felt all the more strongly. Pedestrians, realizing this, refused to be inveigled out, even by the spring like air. And there was no one to notice the young man and the young woman who sat on a bench in one of the secluded walks near Eighth Avenue. The young woman, simply dressed in a dark tailor made gown, with a small black hat pushed well over her face, which showed beneath it very pale and set, with hard lines about the mouth. The young man staring at her in bewilderment and a look of distress in his handsome blue eyes. And so, he said, You don't love me any longer? It had taken him some time to grasp this fact, which still seemed to him incomprehensible. No, she said in a low, determined voice, I don't love you any longer. I don't know if, if I ever did. I was so young. I had never seen any men. I didn't know what I was doing. You flattered me. It was interesting, romantic. But if I had loved you, really loved you, She stopped for an instant. If I had really loved you, she repeated, do you think I could have hesitated that day at Cranston? Do you think I could have let you go without me? Why, I should have followed you. Don't you see that I would to the end of the world? The color rushed into her face. There was a ring in her voice that he had never heard before. No, not even in those early days when she had sat at his feet and worshipped him as a genius. Then, as he looked at her, he realized for the first time that he had lost her. The discovery was, for many reasons, unwelcome. Well, if you didn't love me, he said hoarsely, you certainly made me believe that you did. Elizabeth, you have treated me abominably. I didn't wish to leave you. Do me the justice to admit that. It was your own doing entirely. I know it, she bent her head submissively. I don't blame you for anything, not even for forgetting me. I didn't forget you, he interrupted her, flushing hotly and repeating assertions which she had heard already, and interpreted by that knowledge of his character, which she had acquired too late to be of value. She put them aside now with a gesture of weariness. What's the use, she said, of going over that again? I have said already I don't reproach you. We can't either of us, can we, afford to throw stones? And yet, if you had not stopped writing, she paused for a moment with knitted brows, and she seemed to weigh one possibility against another, in a sort of inward trial of her own conduct. An instinctive mental honesty, however, carried the day. I don't know that that would have made any difference, she said. I was very unhappy because you, you had forgotten me. And that made me want to come to town all the more. But if I had been happy and sure that you loved me, I should have come, I think, all the same. And no matter how I had felt or what I had done, I should have known, sooner or later. Oh, I couldn't but realize it. What a, what a terrible mistake we had made! She put out her hands in a sudden despairing gesture, which hurt his vanity. Elizabeth, do you really mean that? Yes, she said in a low, monotonous voice, and staring straight before her with hard, hopeless eyes. Yes, I mean it. I have been realizing it little by little all the months, and yet I put it away. I, I wouldn't think of it till one day it forced itself upon me. 
I knew all at once that I—I I dreaded your coming back. I hoped you never would. It was when I was enjoying myself, when I was thinking how delightful life was, and then after that the fear of your coming was always there. I could never get rid of it for any length of time. Till just for a while, yesterday, her voice faltered, and for the first time the softening tears sprang to her eyes. Oh, I can't help it if I'm hard, she cried out. When I think how happy I was, wildly, absurdly happy, just for a little while, and then to think how, how miserable I am now. She stopped, half strangled with her sobs, and Paul sat staring at her in moody silence. He was clear-sighted enough now to grasp the truth. Such violent grief, he told himself, could have but one explanation. There was, there must be, some other man. Yet the conviction made him only the more determined not to give her up. True, there had been a time not long before when he would have done so only too gladly, when he would have welcomed an opportunity to free himself from an irksome bond, which he regretted quite as much as she did. But now, since his return, when he heard her spoken of everywhere as one of the beauties of the season, when he saw her in Dauteville's studio in her velvet and furs, her whole appearance redolent of grace and charm, and that nameless distinction which Gerard had noticed, and which impressed the young musician even more deeply, when he saw her thus a hundred times more desirable, his fickle heart succumbed anew with a sudden throb of joy at the thought of the secret tie between them. She was his, this young princess, whom he had chosen when she was a mere Cinderella. He had but to hold out his hand and she would come to him, for he never doubted that she would come. Her first coldness he had looked upon as mere girlish pique at his neglect, a proof of her affection. Now, a sadder and a wiser being, he had learned that the privilege of forgetfulness is not confined to men alone. Yet the situation, unflattering though it was, had its advantages, which dawned upon him gradually, while Elizabeth still sobbed. He rose and paced up and down in front of her, thinking the matter over. After all, a wife was the last thing he wanted just then, when his career was opening out before him in unexpectedly brilliant colors. He realized perfectly the value of his own good looks, and the loss of prestige that marriage would involve. Matrimony is a mistake for an artist, he had told himself this many times in the last few months. And yet, having once made the mistake, having won this beautiful girl for his wife, how could he give her up? There was the chance that she might change her mind again, and return to her first love. Then it was sweet to feel that she was in his power, that he could at any time bring her to terms by threatening to publish the fact that she had concealed all this time. True, the marriage might be dissolved. He had not much doubt himself that it could be. But either this plan did not occur to Elizabeth, or she dreaded the inevitable gossip and publicity. At all events, it was not his place, he thought, to suggest it to her. He held the mastery of the situation, and he was determined to improve it to the uttermost. And having arrived at this conclusion, he suddenly stopped before her, and spoke in a tone of unwanted resolution. "'Listen to me, Elizabeth,' he said. I don't know why you are making this scene. And what has the situation changed since, let us say, last week? I don't ask you to acknowledge our marriage at once. Indeed, it is impossible for me to do so, as I am not, worse luck, in a position just now to support a wife. Elizabeth, in her surprise, stopped crying, and stared up at him blankly. You don't want the marriage acknowledged? she repeated, utterly taken aback. "'Not just now,' said Paul calmly. "'It would be as inconvenient for me as it seems to be for you. No, all I ask is for you to see me occasionally, to think of me more kindly, and in time—perhaps in time, dearest, you will care for me again as you used to.' He went on to dilate on this hope. Elizabeth's tears, as she listened, ceased. A feeling of relief stole over her the reaction which follows so often upon violent distress. 
"'In time,' Paul said. "'Ah, yes,' her heart answered. "'There is no knowing what wonders time may accomplish. "'It might even, who could tell, "'find a way for her out of this terrible perplexity.' "'Yet the thought was illogical. "'Of what use was it to put off the evil day? "'There was a side of her nature which was brave and straightforward, "'which detested false pretenses and evasions, "'and all the network of deception "'in which her secret had already involved her.' which called out upon her boldly to tell the truth, since every day that she kept it hidden only made the final disclosure more difficult. But there was another side which counseled compromise, which shrank from facing the inevitable, which lived only in the present and refused to take thought for the future. And finally, there was a side which did not reason, which simply remembered the look in a man's eyes when he had spoken to her the day before of her picture. How would it be if he knew the truth? Would he make allowances for her? Would he be magnanimous enough to forgive? Oh, no! He had judged her harshly for no apparent reason. Such a discovery would put an end entirely to all his faith in her, for she felt instinctively how it would strike him, this impulsive action of a thoughtless girl, who had rushed into a marriage as if it were a mere farce and taken upon herself lightly the most solemn vows, only to repent of them quite as readily. He would pronounce her hopelessly light and fickle. He would never believe that she was capable of any deeper feeling. His presentiment, distrust, whatever it was that had kept him from her, would be justified, and, and there would be an end of it. And the best thing that could happen, that stern inner voice called out. But she would not listen to it not yet at least. She must see him once or twice first, probe his feelings a little more surely, prepare him a little, perhaps, to judge her more gently. Some time, very soon, perhaps, she would tell him herself, but, but not now, not now. Her head ached, she was physically exhausted, and Paul was waiting impatiently for her decision. She had an engagement, too, for luncheon. She remembered that mechanically. In this matter-of-fact world of ours, the everyday and tragic incidences of life jostle one another so closely. I, I must go, she murmured confusedly. I've been here too long. We could talk about this another time. But you consent, he said eagerly. You wish to keep it secret a while longer. That is the agreement for the present? She hesitated for a moment. Yes, she said at last. That is the agreement, till, till I have time to think it over. And now I must go. She drew out the little jeweled watch that Mrs. Van Antwerp had given her, among other valuable things at Christmas. I am going out to luncheon, and I am supposed to be in my room at present, recovering from last night's ball. What a gay person you are, Paul said, regarding her complacently. Oh, Elizabeth, if you wanted to be nice, you could help me a great deal in my profession. "'Help you?' she repeated, staring at him blankly. "'Yes, in a social way,' he explained. "'It always helps an artist to be taken up by swell people. "'There's your friend, Mrs. Van Antwerp. "'Can't you—there's a good girl. "'Can't you persuade her to do something for me?' "'I heard her ask you to call,' she returned coldly. "'Yes, but she could do more than that,' he said. "'She could, for instance, have me sing and ask people to hear me. I need a start, I need patrons among society people, and that is exactly, my dear girl, what you can get for me." They were walking slowly by this time toward the entrance of the park, and suddenly she turned and faced him with one of those flashes of defiance, which he rather admired. "'Let me understand,' she said quickly, and a pale, cold gleam lighted up her white face like the glint of steel upon marble. "'You want me to get you invitations?' to persuade people to ask you to sing? This is the price of your silence?" He shrugged his shoulders, not much disturbed by the scorn in her voice. "'If you choose to put it so plainly, yes,' he said. "'After all, it's not much to ask, and you ought, one would think, to be glad if you can help me.' She walked on beside him in gloomy silence. "'It's not much to ask.' she said in a low, bitter voice, 
but it involves, have you thought of that, my seeing you constantly? And is that so terrible? he asked, reddening. It's not pleasant, she said shortly, but I suppose I must submit. I'm in your power. You can ask what you please. They had reached the entrance of the park, and she turned to him, as if to dismiss him. I promise, then, she said, I'll do what I can to help you, socially, and in return you must promise to treat me as you would any other acquaintance, not force me to meet you again, or let people suppose that there is anything between us. Do you agree to that? I suppose I must, he said disconsolately, though it's a harder condition by far than mine. Again that cold, scornful gleam flashed across her face. "'Oh, you'll resign yourself to it,' she said. "'It's much more to the point to get the invitations. "'I'll see that my side of the bargain is fulfilled.' She drew down her veil, glancing anxiously across the wide square, where street-cars, bicycles, and wagons all converge from different directions, and in inextricable confusion. "'Don't come any further with me,' she said. "'I don't wish people to see us together.' She left him abruptly as she spoke and he stood for a moment and watched her cross the square and take a car at the corner. He was not quite satisfied with the interview. She had been too independent, too scornful. It hurt his pride. But the situation was full of possibilities. He felt that his rash marriage had been a stroke of genius. Elizabeth, meanwhile, was making her way home, with a feeling of tremulous relief, much as if she had escaped unexpectedly from a shipwreck with at least a plank to cling to, and bear her perhaps to ultimate safety. Yet how slight that plank was she might have realized, had she known that Julian Gerard, as he entered the park on horseback, had seen her walk down one of the side paths, with the man who only a day before had aroused his jealous suspicions. And she said she didn't know him, he thought with a fierce throb of pain, and rode on, frowning into the park. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of the Ordeal of Elizabeth by Anonymous。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. My dear Julian, wrote Mrs. Bobby Van Antwerp to Mr. Gerard a week later, you are, I think, neglecting us shamefully. What has become of you? If you are inclined to perform a charitable action, do come in to tea to-morrow afternoon. You don't generally, I know, patronize such mild functions, but we are to have a little music." "'A little music?' mused Gerard, knitting his brows and thrusting out his under-lip, as the note dropped from his hand. "'That means, of course, that young Halleck. It's something new for Eleanor to go in for music but it's her doing, of course. I suppose she really cares for the fellow. And yet what a pity, what a pity that she should throw herself away like that!" He sat gazing absently before him, his pen in his hand, while the work upon which he had been engaged when Mrs. Bobby's note arrived, an article for a scientific magazine, remained without the finishing touches he had intended to bestow. He had not seen Elizabeth since that morning in the park. He had carefully refrained from going where he might see her. He had denied himself, once and for all, that unprofitable and mysterious pleasure of watching her across the ballroom, while he leaned inertly against the wall, or talked in his weary way to some woman to whom he felt himself indebted. No, thank heaven! He had been warned in time. There was no danger of his being made a fool of a second time. His mind wandered back across the gulf of years to that other woman whom he had loved so desperately once, whose shadow still stood between him and the happiness which seemed now and again within his grasp. He thought of the mad infatuation, the bitter disillusion, the restless traveling to and fro, the final settling down into cynical indifference. And then, long afterward, when the indifference had grown into a habit, and he dreaded nothing more than to have it disturbed. He had met this girl who had exercised upon him from that first a curious effect, half-repellent, half-attractive, and wholly baffling and alarming. 
whose hair he had objected to because it was too red, and who played the piano with a force and fire and passion which stirred his heart as he had resolved it should never be stirred again. Gerard had always intended to marry, but he proposed, in spite of the efforts of Eleanor Van Antwerp and other anxious friends, to take his time about it. He had his ideal of the sort of wife he wanted, a being as different as possible from his first love, and almost as tiresome a compound of all the domestic virtues as that mythical personage whom Hannah Moore's hero had once gone in search of. But, unlike that estimable individual, he had fallen in love with a woman far removed from his ideal, of doubtful antecedents, which he liked no better than Bobby Van Antwerp, of qualities the reverse of domestic, and the type of hair and coloring which he had long, illogically, but none the less strongly, associated with a certain lack of moral sense. Yet, though Gerard could not help his feelings, he could certainly control his actions, and he was determined to keep away from Elizabeth Van Vorst, more especially now since there seemed to be some unaccountable understanding between her and that young Halleck. Yet that very fact made him the more anxious to see her, and find out for himself how far his suspicions were justified. Good heavens, thought Gerard, getting up and pacing restlessly to and fro. How can she care for a fellow like that, so second-rate, so superficial, such a, such a cad? What is Eleanor thinking of having him at the house? Someone really ought to give her a hint, not I, but someone. The end of it all was that he strolled into Mrs. Van Antwerp's drawing-room that afternoon, his usual air of well-bred impassiveness, unmoved by the sight of Paul Halleck seated at the piano, and the sinecure of several pairs of admiring feminine eyes. Elizabeth's eyes were not among them. She was in a back room pouring tea, but Gerard had no sooner assured himself of her being thus harmlessly employed than his jealous heart suggested that there was something sinister in such apparent indifference. He wandered into the other room as soon as he decently could. She was seated at the tea-table, for the moment, entirely alone. Seen thus off guard, for she did not at first perceive Gerard, there was something indefinably weary and listless in her attitude. She was paler even than she had been that day at the portrait show, and the lines beneath her eyes were not black but purple. It would have gone ill with her reputation as a beauty had it been put to the vote that afternoon. But it was Gerard's peculiarity, his misfortune, perhaps, that she appealed to him most at times when to the world at large she was looking her worst. He stood watching her for a moment. Presently she looked up. She caught sight of him. Instantly the warm, lovely color rushed into her cheeks, only to retreat and leave her paler than before. But not till he had seen it. His manner was very gentle as he approached her and asked for a cup of tea. She poured it out mechanically, with a hand that trembled. "'We have not seen you lately,' she said, with eyes carefully riveted on the tea-things. Eleanor was wondering w what had become of you. "'Indeed! It was very kind of her to give me a thought.' Gerard stirred his tea absently. "'I was busy,' he said, with an article I had promised for a magazine. "'Ah, you write a great deal, don't you?' Elizabeth looked up, with some interest. "'I should like to see some of your articles, if I may.' He smiled. "'You don't know what you're asking. You'd find them very dull.' "'What, because I'm so dull myself?' she asked, with a flash of spirit. "'I told you once before,' he said, in the tone that he had used to her at the studio, "'that I didn't think you that.' "'Ah, but you think me other things.' that are worse. As what, for instance?" he asked, smiling. Oh, frivolous and vain and heartless, a lot of horrid things. I only said you seemed so. Ah, then you think I'm better than I seem? she asked flippantly, yet with a swift inward pang. He seemed to consider. I think you are very, 
incomprehensible, he said at last. She bent down over the tea things, so that he could not see her face. Oh, that's only, she said in a low voice, because you haven't the key to the enigma. If you had it, she paused. You might not like the things you understood, she concluded. Gerard put down his untasted cup. I'm willing to take the risk, he said deliberately. He waited, as if for an answer, but none came. She appeared to busy herself with the tea things. In the next room Paul Halleck began to sing the evening star song. It seemed to Gerard that Elizabeth turned a shade paler than she had even been before. "'He has a fine voice,' he said when the song was finished. "'Don't you think so?' She started. "'Yes, I, I think so,' she said mechanically. "'I was surprised a little at Eleanor's going in for music,' Gerard went on. "'It isn't her line, generally.' "'No, it isn't her line,' Elizabeth repeated in the same mechanical tones. Suddenly she met his eyes defiantly. "'I asked her to have him here,' she said. "'Ah, you asked her?' Gerard drew his breath quickly. "'I thought he was a—a a friend of yours.' "'You thought so?' she returned quickly, and then in a low voice as if she dreaded the answer. "'Why?' "'Why?' He repeated her question as if it surprised him. For a moment he seemed to hesitate, then, as if forming a sudden resolution. "'I thought so,' he said steadily, and looking her straight in the face. "'For one thing, because I saw you walking in the park with him one morning.' "'Ah, you—you—you you, you saw me?' She seemed to gasp for breath. Then, with a quick, impetuous movement, she pushed the tea-things away from her. "'And so—' she said, turning to him suddenly, her cheeks flushed, her eyes sparkling. "'You put the worst construction upon that. You think more ill of me than ever?' He had turned very pale, but still his voice was steady. "'I don't know why I should think ill of you for such a simple thing as that. But if there is any secret about it—' He fixed his eyes upon her coldly, haughtily. "'If the meeting was not intended to be known, why, I—I'm sorry I should have seen it. Of course, I should not mention it to any one else. She flushed a little, then grew pale, before the scorn in his eyes. There is, there is no secret, she said in a low voice. You can mention it to whomever you please. I confess I was a little surprised, he went on without heeding her, and this time a note of keen anxiety pierced through the studied quietness of his voice. His gaze softened as if imploring her to give him the explanation which he had no right to demand. "'I was a little taken aback,' he said, "'because I understood you to say, the day before, that you hardly knew him. Yes, I—I I remember.' She leaned back in her chair, staring before her with hard, bright eyes. "'When I told you that,' she said slowly, "'I lied.' It gave him a keen shock to hear her pronounce the word— he did not speak, and she looked up at him presently with a little deprecating smile. Now, she said softly, I've shocked you, haven't I? He was silent for a moment. No, he said at last, not that, but I'm sorry. I don't like to think of you as misstating anything, even if the matter is of no importance. She had taken up a teaspoon and was playing with it absently. "'I don't know why you should care,' she said slowly. "'Don't you?' He turned his eyes away. "'I wish to heaven I didn't,' he said low and fiercely. The words were not intended for her, but she heard them, and again the warm, beautiful color rushed into her cheeks. An answer trembled on her lips, but she struggled not to say it, struggled against the desire to bring that glow to his face, that light to his eyes which she knew so well lay dormant beneath the heavy lids. She knew, oh, she knew. While he stayed away, she had her misgivings, but now that she saw him again, she read his heart, even as she had done at the portrait show. She had only to be herself, her best self, and she held him captive. He could not escape. Yet, paradoxically, her better instincts urged upon her to show him her worst side, to say the things which hurt and shocked him. 
While she hesitated, people came crowding in from the next room. In the confusion that ensued, Gerard was forced away from the table. He fell back against the wall and watched Elizabeth, while, with instinctive self-command, she fulfilled the different demands made upon her. He saw Halleck go up to her gaily, flushed with his success, and bending over her murmur a few jesting words, which she heard without a smile. Gerard could have killed him for the air of proprietorship, which was even more pronounced than at the musicale. But she, how did she like it? He scanned her face eagerly. There was no softness there, no answering gleam of pleasure, rather a dull, dogged look of submission, which seemed to cover, or Gerard deceived himself, an instinctive shrinking, a powerless resentment. She doesn't care for him, he thought with a quick, sharp sense of relief, and yet she has to be civil to him. She has to do things to help him. Why, for heaven's sake, why? He wandered into the other room, tormenting himself with this question, and found his hostess there. "'What do you think of my new protégé?' she asked, detaining him as he took his leave. "'What, Halleck?' "'Oh, he sings very well,' he returned absently. "'I never before posed as a patron of rising musicians,' she went on. "'But Elizabeth knew him, it seems, in the country, and asked if I would mind helping him a little. She's so fond of music, you know. She spoke quite innocently. Gerard gave her a quick searching glance. Apparently she suspected nothing. Yet she was a woman of quick perceptions. Perhaps, after all, it was he who was mistaken. His jealous, suspicious nature had led him into unnecessary torture. No wonder she had met his doubt with defiance had not deigned to justify herself or to dispel a distrust which he had no right to display. In the sudden, glad, unreasoning reaction, he was ready to heap all manner of insulting epithets upon himself. "'I think your efforts will be repaid,' he said, inclined in his relief to be generous. Halleck has a fine voice. I shouldn't wonder if he were quite a success. "'It was very nice of you to come in,' she said. You have been such a recluse lately. What have you been doing? Oh, the whirl of excitement in which I have been living was too much for me, he declared, and so I have given up society for a while, and am going in for hard study by way of rest. Good gracious! That sounds very impressive, she said. I am almost afraid to suggest under the circumstances that you should take a seat in our box at the opera tonight, and yet I wish you would, Julian, just by way of doing me a favor— for some people I've asked are not coming, and Bobby is away, and, and Elizabeth and I will be quite alone. He smiled. I don't think there's much chance of your being alone very long, he said. Yet he promised at last to take one of the vacant seats, though he had refused several other invitations for that evening. Mrs. Bobby's eyes sparkled as if she had achieved a victory. Julian is coming tonight, she announced to Elizabeth, when the musicale was over and the last guest had departed. "'Is he?' Elizabeth spoke without apparent interest, as she sank with a weary look into a chair in front of the fire. "'You are tired. Would you rather not go to-night?' "'Oh, no,' with a languid gesture. "'Music doesn't tire me.' "'And yet,' said Mrs. Bobby, who had taken the seat opposite her and was watching her thoughtfully, "'you didn't seem to care enough about it to come in and listen to your friend this afternoon.' Elizabeth blushed. I could hear him in the other room, she said. Where, besides, you seem to be very well entertained, said Mrs. Bobby serenely. Still, I don't think it was nice of you. It is hard on the poor man, after flirting with him in the country, to treat him so indifferently in town. I didn't flirt with him, said Elizabeth, but her protest was faint, and seemed purely perfunctory. In fact, she was not sorry that Mrs. Bobby had adopted this theory— realizing that a half-truth may sometimes be the most effective barrier to a knowledge of the whole. "'Don't tell me anything so wildly improbable, my dear,' said Mrs. Bobby. "'My knowledge of human nature will not allow me to believe that a pretty girl and a handsome young singer, thrown together for weeks in the country as I believe you were, did not indulge in a tremendous flirtation. But seriously, Elizabeth, I am glad that it went no further, and that you have recovered so easily.' for I can imagine that you lost your heart to him a little. Confess, Elizabeth, didn't you?' "'Perhaps I did,' 
said Elizabeth, staring immovably into the fire. But one gets over such things, you know. Indeed one does, said Mrs. Bobby. I was desperately in love at seventeen, and cried my eyes out when they made me give the man up. And yet, had I married him, I should have been the most wretched being in the world, instead of a much happier woman than I deserve to be, thanks to a husband far too good for me. But that, dear, is between ourselves. I always try to make Bobby think it's the other way. But imagine how dreadful it would have been if I had had my own foolish way at seventeen. And so I'm glad, Elizabeth, that you've got over your penchant for this young artist, who is good-looking and sings well and all that, but who is, even if I knew anything about him, which I don't, quite the last man I should like for you to marry. Elizabeth's face was turned away. I don't know, she said in a low voice, why you think of that. Oh, I was only speculating on what might have been, said Mrs. Bobby, lightly. I know, she went on after a moment, stealing a furtive glance at the girl's averted face. I know the sort of man I should like you to marry, Elizabeth. He must be older than you, considerably older, of a serious disposition, with a strong will, stronger than yours, for you might be perhaps a little hard to manage. Fond of music, fond of books, rich, and with a good position, of course, and—and and I should like him to be every bit as nice as Bobby, if such a thing is possible. Elizabeth turned her white face toward her friend. "'And you think,' she said in a low, stifled voice, "'that I should come up to the standard of a paragon like that?' "'My dear,' said Mrs. Bobby wisely, "'paragons don't marry other paragons, "'or the world would be somewhat more dull than it is at present. "'A man who is very serious should marry a woman who is a trifle frivolous, "'and in that way they strike the happy medium.' "'I don't know,' said Elizabeth. "'They would be more likely, I should think, to strike a discordancy.' It would be fatiguing to try to please a man like that. One could never, do what one would, come up to his standard. You wouldn't have to, said Mrs. Bobby softly. He would think you perfect, if he loved you. Do you think so? said Elizabeth, with rather a dreary smile. I think, for my part, that he would be harder to satisfy. He would exact all the more because he loved you. She sat pondering the idea for a moment. Then, with a careless little gesture, she seemed to dismiss the subject as a thing of small consequence. "'It's much better not to try to satisfy people like that,' she declared. "'What a lot of time we are wasting! It must be time to dress!' She got up and moved toward the door. Mrs. Bobby followed her with her eyes. "'I'll send Celeste to you,' she said. "'Wear your most becoming gown. Look your best, and do your hair the way I like it. I assure you such trifles have their effect, even upon a paragon. End of chapter 20